highly important because sentiment is a strong driver in the dynamics of asset pricing. So what we have here are these interactive widgets that will be embedded into our platform that you kind of saw yesterday uh, to provide a user-driven insight where you can start fine-tuning and um, optimizing your portfolio based on what interests you. So for example, you can see here real time how positive or negative the sentiment is. If you're a little bit more advanced, you can say, okay, well, how well does this correlate over time? And you might say, oh, we only have 60 tweets. No, 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 no. What we're showing you here is a relative percentage of all tweets out there that are positive and negative. And what's really interesting is when you overlay with this price, you start seeing really, really interesting dynamics. And what we're doing for you, you, you end users is no matter if you're a first time trader or the, the, the most robust best trader in the world, giving you digestible insights to help optimize your trading strategies. In addition, we have real time data flowing in so that you can monitor from a traditional quantitative standpoint um, how correlated that the current price of crypto assets, in this case, we're just looking at Bitcoin, is with some of our major, major assets that we found that are highly correlated. So for example, you can monitor in real time the Bitcoin versus the volatility index, Bitcoin versus crude, Bitcoin versus gold, all of these indices that we do as a hybrid approach of deep analytics and qualitative trading that we do with Steve Kwan to develop these really interesting algorithms for you guys. So all of these feed into a set of data that you can use to really create really interesting algorithms for forecasting. And specifically what we're using is we're using bleeding edge technologies and computer vision using GANs or generative adversarial networks to come up with a real time forecaster for long-term asset trading that we're currently doing in R&D. So that's kind of the big scope of some of the stuff we're doing. If we dive into some of our analytics, we go down to the granular level where we start seeing, this is kind of a messy chart if you're not used to it. This is what we call a heat map. And all you have to do is take a look at Bitcoin and follow it down. And what we're doing is looking at how Bitcoin is correlated or how strongly Bitcoin moves with all of these other assets. So you can see here, we're really thinking about deeply, not only the prices, but all of these types of data we are using are dependent not only on the price index, but also Google News, news uh, web queries, all of these different bifurcating data sources, in addition to all of our market data that we can utilize to feed into these generative models so that you, the end user, no matter if you're a beginning trader and just want to see, okay, well, I think it follows um, gold very well. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. But based on your viewpoint, what you can do with that, and then giving you an entire, the entire spectrum of how deeply you want to go in personalized to you for these analytics and sentiment engines. Thanks, Russ. Thanks, Russ. That was really incredible. Um, obviously, we're uh, trying to analyze a lot, um, but yeah. sentiment is really important. Um, let's talk about why sentiment is important to us and why this is important to the industry for you know traders to understand. Mm -hmm. So, if you take a look at sentiment, there's there's let's let's first define what sentiment is. Sentiment is how positive or negative you believe a given article is, and that you is going to be important for a little bit down the line. But for example, a sentiment is, is really driven in crypto. Uh, you know, not to say that sentiment isn't driving in traditional markets. For example, if you see that, okay, maybe the CEO of JP Morgan Chase has been indicted on fraud charges. That did not happen. Just, just throwing that out there that I'm just using this as, as a thought ex of experiment, right? All of a sudden people are going to react to that and say, oh my God, this is bad. I'm getting out what's going to happen. That's going to drive the price down. So we're doing that with crypto. So we're scanning news articles. We're looking at that natural language processing. We're looking at sentiment data specifically regarding social media because that is the, what's the first thing something bad happens? Look at what, what's going on in today's world, right? What, what do you do? You tweet, right? So we're mining Twitter so we can start 
ahead of time, depending on user location. And we're actually developing some really, really interesting products that allow you to look at global sentiment for a particular region so that you can judge ahead of the curve what that pricing point might be. Now, to take that the next step, remember, right now we're saying that this is what we believe, right? Well, we might not, might, might not be right. By not saying not right, but we might have a different trading strategy than you. We, we might be looking at the relatively short-term or high-frequency trading, and you might be more interested in long-term. So what we're doing is we're taking this idea and going to allow you as a service to rank what you view as positive and negative news articles so that you get a perceived sentiment geared to your beliefs and your trading style, going back to that Bayesian sense that Christina talked about in the breakfast this morning, so that we can tailor to you how emotionally these articles pertain to your profile. And then taking that next step and feeding this novel data into these bleeding edge machine learning algorithms to give you insight in terms of pricing. Thanks, Russ. I'd like to piggyback on that and just um, kind of extend that uh, customized user experience that Russ is talking about uh, on the data and sentiment side is that customized user experience is something that's important to us at Coin Genius. We understand that having a lot of data doesn't necessarily mean that you have the information that you need. And so that's what we're taking all of our data science tools with um, to bubble that up into information. And the information is different for each person. So you can think of Coin Genius as a toolbox uh, filled with a whole bunch of different kind of tools, very much like a workshop. Um, we kind of have all of the tools of, uh, of blockchain here. And within the trading side of things, we're trying to allow you to customize your, your own experience. Um, that goes along to uh, the things that you're interested in, the things that you think are up and coming, uh, how you would rank projects might be different than how someone else would rank projects. So keep in mind that Coin Genius's opinion is, uh, is just one data set and one data vertical. And we're actually aggregating a ton of data verticals and allowing you guys to create your own data verticals. If you don't know what a data vertical is, I recommend you Google it. So I did notice we just had one quick question yes. here in the chat uh, where Rhonda asked how effective Bitcoin can be used to hedge against other assets. And that's exactly kind of what I was showing you with those correlation grams. So again, that's going to be dependent on your strategy. So I'm not going to comment on that, but rather we are providing you with the insights on these correlations at, if at first at a naive sense, so you can start utilizing this to make your own inferences. But that is a good, really good question because hedging is very important in the traditional marketplace. And the, here at CoinGenius, we are well-versed in traditional market dynamics, such as portfolio optimization using Markov chain Monte Carlo approaches or, or um, hedging approaches um, using uh, Monte Carlo pro pro uh, approaches as well. Um, I'm not going to dive into what a Monte Carlo approach is, but if you're in the finance space, you know what that term means. Um, and so what we're doing is we're building a platform starting from the ground up first to give you um, personalized information to make your own inferences for hedging. And then we're layering on what uh, Christina talked about in terms of utilizing that personal information so we can give you novel hedging algorithms and machine learning algorithms based on these data sources that are unique to you to best optimize your, your hedge with Bitcoin. But yes, it can be used um, and it can be very used robustly um, given all of the unique assets that we're looking at. Yeah. Can I you know, ask the, oh, go ahead? Sorry, I was just going to ask Russ really quick, uh, and maybe this can just be a quick response. Mm -hmm. uh, working with our head of market research, Steve Kwan, uh, and seeing him get excited about these analytics, uh, what can you tell me about that experience, Russ? So Steve Kwan is an amazing and amazing talented individual. He's one of those guys where you can go and show him a chart and he says, yes, this is going to happen. And I've learned nine times out of 10, you want to listen to Steve. This guy's brilliant. 
So what we're doing is, remember we talked about a little bit earlier, this idea of an ensemble model. Well, this is a human ensemble model, right? I'm, I'm a physicist by training. I'm good at math. I'm interested in markets, but I don't have the intuition that a market trader would. So what we're doing is we're blending this qualitative approach and kind of giving Steve a chart and automating that. So in real time, you can start to see what, depending on these type of investment strategies, a qualitative trader might suggest based on this algorithmically. Yeah, very cool. I, you know, I like to provide use cases and, and this is just, uh, I think this will tie it all together, right? So you look at things like, um, you're talking about news, right? So news articles drive emotion, uh, especially as it relates to sentiment and NLP and all the things we're doing there. So just from a basic level, so people understand how we look at this data and how the algorithms look at the data and how it evolves over time. So say like yesterday as an example, I think in the U.S. we had the uh, single most, uh, the, I guess, the largest spike in one-day COVID cases specifically, right? So that specifically translates into fear. And if you want to quantify the fear in which is associated with that, you might look at something like the VIX, right? Mm -hmm. The VIX tends to react based on fear a lot of times in the market. And then if you look at the correlations that Russ had put out earlier, I don't know, Russ, if you want to bring those back up. Yep. yep. Uh, Let's go. Two days ago, when Bitcoin and the rest of the cryptocurrency market went down, um, you saw there's actually an inverse relationship from a correlation standpoint. So Bitcoin versus the VIX is anti-correlated, if you will. Let me share um, my so screen. what that means is that it should move the opposite way of the VIX. Right. And that's exactly what you see here with our correlation. We specifically optimize for in, in our algorithms for specific windows. So we're not looking at over all time, but we're looking at relative optimized short-term windows so that you can see within that hour, again, this gets into this idea of contextual learning, um, that, that exactly what Jeremy's talking about. So you can see that this is strongly negatively correlated. So as you start seeing the VIX go, go down, you might start seeing Bitcoin go up. And in fact, that's exactly what Jeremy has seen. That's exactly what Steve Kwan has seen. So this is an example of how we're using data science and AI to automate these qualitative processes in real time. And that's the key. This is not historical data. Right now you're seeing hourly data, but we will be having in the next several months coming down to minute level transactions. We're at the minute in real time. You can see not only the sentiment, but how highly correlated or anti-correlated these assets are with whatever cryptocurrency you're interested in. Russ, yeah, no, absolutely. Can I ahead. ask you a question about... Um, why is Coin Genius interested in using synthetic data? So synthetic data is this idea of that you're going to try, you don't have enough data to make an observation. So a good example is say you're an alien, right? You've never been to Earth before, but you land in sunny California, right? And you make it, you land and it's a sunny day and you're asked, well, what's the weather going to be tomorrow? Well, it's going to be sunny because that's the only information you know. Well, what's the weather going to be the next day? That's the only information you know. And you can keep on going doing this. You have no other information until it starts to rain. You have no knowledge of rain. But if you go to, say, the Northeast in Boston, where I'm from, that's the totally different, different thing. So, you, so this is the idea. The amount of data going into the system is going to affect what type of inferences you can make. So as before, I said, we only are looking at a two-year window. So what we have to do is we have to find some way to recreate those dynamics that are representative of our system to create different sources of data so that our long-term inferences with these analytics are robust and accurate. So that's where synthetic data comes in, is that you're saying you just don't have enough information and somehow you have to take another system that you kind of understand, i.e. the traditional market, and use that data to make inferences on the system, i.e. cryptocurrency that you're trying to study. So let's talk about uh, regimes too, right? So we're talking about VIX uh, being, uh, you know, having an anti-correlation specifically to Bitcoin uh, at specific points, right? But that's based on the regime that we're in now, right? Mm -hmm. But the regimes tend to shift. And I know that's very hard to identify, but talk about some of the things that we're doing there in terms of identifying different uh, market regimes, number one, and then number two, getting into identifying things like black swans, which is much more difficult. Right. So um, as Jeremy talked about, there, there are certain regimes that 
that if you look at kind of these time series, you might see lots of little, little squiggles and you might see a long term, right? You can think of this almost as like seasonality if you're used to the weather, right? The weather in a given day in the summer might vary, right? Might be 70 degrees, might be 76, but it's still going to be substantially higher than in the winter. So you have this long term seasonality. And what we're trying to do is detect that quote unquote seasonality as regimes where you might see long term perturbations in the market, um, followed by a whole bunch of random volatility and then another long term. And then you might have these periods. So what we're using is we're using Bayesian inferences to be able to quantify what regime we are in so that we have the optimized model for that given regime. And that feeds directly into black swan. So black swan is a, an event that should not happen, or if it does, it happens very irregularly. Perfect example, COVID. So COVID, you see all of these types of assets, right? Such as gold, such as oil, such as, I don't know, the price of Apple, uh, the price of cow's feet and Bitcoin. All of these have their own dynamics. So if you plot these, they'll be going all in different directions. However, what happened with COVID? Every single thing started going down. And as, you, as soon as you see assets that are not correlated being highly correlated, you know something crazy is going on, and that's a black swan. So what we are doing is we're looking at specific, the news sources, the market data, the, the unemployment data, all of these different bifurcating data sources, so that we can be able to hopefully detect when these black swans or large scale perturbations might occur in real time so that you aren't able to be um, killed in the market for that. I love it. Russ, what can you tell folks around um, our CRM strategy? So we are going, we are building out an entirely individualized content research, um, content resource management strategy, a CRM, allowing you, the user, to have an individualized, personalized source of data. We started with that when you saw, saw our news platform, CoinGenius.pro, the other day, uh, where you can go in and see all of these different types of news articles. So the first types of news articles is, okay, what do you like? Right, you can think of this as how CVS and Walgreens nowadays are starting to personalize your healthcare. Well, what we want to do is personalize your information to the articles that are fine tuned to you that you like. And then using that, supply you with more information, get your engagement, not so that we collect data on you. And in fact, we don't, we are GDPR compliant. We are, we don't care about personal, personalized uh, information. We are, GD, we are GDPR compliant. We are working towards that. But that being said, we want to create the most robust experience for you so that in our CRM, you know what users are most associated with you. You can talk to them about trading strategies. You can talk about what the, what the hell is going on with your data as compared to mine. We have two different insights, but our strategy is the same. Down to the level of getting fed news data that is down to you. And then eventually, as we talked about to our sentiment as a service, get the sentiment associated with those types of news articles that you believe in. Thanks, Russ. And what can you tell folks around our API strategy? So we are building out a robust API ecosystem where we don't, we aren't serving API endpoints quite yet. We're ingesting and normalizing all of these different types of data sources. But in the coming months, what we will allow is have, for example, unique API endpoints for yourself. So for example, let's say that you are interested in the sentiment around your trading strategy and you are able to upload, say, 50,000 different articles with all of these different clicks or with within our system, we recognize which clicks you like or don't like. We can feed that and train a novel sentiment classifier just for you and provide you with an API endpoint so that you can use it within your ecosystem such that you can generate your own data for those that were taught on the, the morning call, Kraken talked about the, the power of data and that's the, you, the, the largest economic driver now today. So we are not only giving you access to your data, but really, really interesting insights based on your novel data sets so that you have control over your beliefs. Awesome. And uh, my final question. So Christina, I'm so sorry. We don't have time for a final question because we uh, have to get to Mr. Adam Bloomberg here in just 
two seconds. I know there's a lot to cover. Um, one of the things that uh, we wanted to go through as well before is just show people a little bit more about uh, what it is that Coin Genius has done and what we have released. Um, so I'm going to just show you guys a few things here. So if you can see our screen here, um, obviously on coingenius.ai, we've done a lot of rebranding. There's a lot here. Uh, I do want to highlight the events specifically um, for the folks today who are just joining us. There's some incredible speakers for day two. So just so you know what you're in for, uh, Adam Bloomberg is kicking it off next for DeFi Asset Management. We have Tron Black, Christian K. Meyer, uh, Jennifer Ziegel, uh, the Bad Crypto Podcast, talking about putting the fun in non-fungible tokens. We have Arnaud St. Paul once again, Josh Lawler, Mark Scarpa, Nick Sapinaro from Divi, Joff Paradise from our sponsor, Cryptomatic ATM. Thanks so much for joining us again. Elizabeth Doge talking about maintaining your wealth with crypto and taxes. Morgan Steckler, Warren Whitlock, Chris Wise, and ending it off with Brittany Kaiser uh, talking about owning your data. So this is going to be another incredible day. Wanted to highlight all the speakers there. Thank you guys for all the things that you're doing. Um, and then also CoinGenius.News. We just launched this. You can go. It's aggregating 144 different news sources specifically uh, about crypto. So you can now just go to one place and get Coindesk, Cointelegraph, all the most important news articles uh, of that particular day. And then I'm going to show one more thing here. Let's see. We also launched our Telegram channel. Um, so this is basically real-time insights into the market. I don't know if you guys can even see this. Can you guys see this? Yes, no, maybe yep. so? Yep, yep. Okay, okay cool. So this is real-time insights. Um, and as you can see here, some of the latest as an example, anytime there's a new listing, uh, all the BTC price changes 24 hours uh, you know, from uh, today. Um, some of the biggest whale moves, anything above and beyond $10 million that's moving. I mean, we've seen specifically anything, you know, there's specific wallets that tend to move, you know, $400 million in Bitcoin at a time. And it's a total of about a billion dollars. And any time that's moved, um, something traumatic happens to the industry, uh, a lot of time to the downside, but we've seen lately to the upside as well. Um, so we provide a lot of data there in terms of market cap dominance and all that as well. And then I wanted to show you, so this is Coin Genius Insights. Uh, if you want to subscribe, it's actually uh, at Coin Genius Stats. So you can uh, do that on Telegram. And then lastly, before we uh, pass it over here, where is it? This is our uh, new analytics platform. We debuted this a little bit yesterday as well. And let me try to find and navigate this one. A lot of tabs open here. Um, this is CoinGenius.pro. So you can go on here. This is uh, our open beta. Uh, pretty excited about this. Been working on this in conjunction uh, with Plato Technologies for quite a while now. Um, so this is all the things that you need to know about the market. Uh, the prices from the top 10, uh, top 100 exchanges and mining contracts. A lot of this stuff is not live, uh, but coming very, very soon, uh, especially on the analytics side. Um, but even if you want to learn really about, you know, some of the companies in the space and what they're doing and get links to the relevant content there, talking about even some of the people, if you want to look at who are the most prominent folks in the space as well and get access and, and look about some of the uh, posts that they've posted or um, just you're very interested in reaching out to them specifically, you can get their LinkedIn post. So there's a lot that we're bringing together in conjunction with the Genius Network. Really excited uh, about everything that Coin Genius is doing this year, especially our quarterly conferences, which is Collective Intelligence. Our next one, as I had mentioned earlier, is at the end of September. So join us there. That is our big one. That's the Crypto State of the Union. The top blockchain projects, the top exchanges telling us why they deserve to be in the top, what they're doing to remain in the top, and then also what they're doing to bring the, forward the uh, industry collectively uh, and how they're working with one another. So excited for that. With that said, thank you guys so much for uh, hearing us out and uh, being supporters of Coin Genius. I'm going to go ahead and pass it over now to Mr. Adam Bloomberg uh, for the first deep dive session. Thanks, guys. Hey everyone, you see me okay? Yes, sir. Absolutely. All right, I thought we'd do something a little different today because what we do at Interaxis is we talk about things on the whiteboard, we interact by the whiteboard, we explain things, and uh, I absolutely abhor uh, preparing presentations. 
Uh, so I thought uh, I would get up on the whiteboard. I hope that's okay. The only thing is I'm actually using my phone to do this. So someone's going to have to let me know when I'm getting close to time. Give me the light or something. But are we ready to get started? You're good to go. You bet. All right. We're going to talk about DeFi asset management. Now, we're qualified to talk about this because we're actually uh, financial advisors. I'm a certified financial planner. We have an RIA here in Texas. We're going to talk a little bit about asset management in the DeFi space. Uh, I want to go back a little bit to what Jeremy was just talking about with Coin Genius, with Coin Genius Pro, uh, and some of the, the analytics, and even going back and, and the, where he clicked on on one of those um, on one of the projects and it actually went into detail as to who the founders are and what they're doing. And a little bit of, of what Ron, my partner, and I were discussing this morning that just came up is when we look in inside the, for instance, the U.S. equity markets, and, and I'll get to how this pertains to DeFi asset management. When we look at the U.S. equities markets, for example, for the past 10, 11 years, they've all been moving in sync, you know, which for the most part has been up. And most of it has been based on what the Fed does. Um, and everything's just been moving up and up and up all together. The S&P goes up. Everything goes up. What we've seen after the huge drop in March and now the, the world changing due to COVID, people staying home, not staying home, going out, not going out, buying online is now you have real reasons to investigate certain companies and understand why they should go up in value or why they should go down in value, what is really driving it. And it's not all people have more money and they're going to spend it because I can spend money on certain things and I can't spend it on others. I can't really go to a restaurant right now, but I can buy food online, right? Am I going to see uh, Nike ads anymore? Am I going to see athletes endorsing Nike so much because I can't even watch my sports anymore because they're not on? So. We, we look into that, we're going to look into that more in, in terms of U.S. equities. We're starting to get to that point in crypto and DeFi, where crypto and DeFi and cryptocurrencies were driven so much by traders wanting to get in there and go 10x or 100x and Lambo and Moon and all that, and really watching the technical charts, which is a lot of what, uh, you know, honestly, a lot of what Coin Genius, a lot of what AI was doing was looking at technical charts, looking at sentiment, how do we think people are going to trade? But part of what you guys have now in Coin Genius Pro is the ability to look inside the companies, the tokens, the projects, and see, is there a way that they're generating revenue? What we're seeing in DeFi, which is really cool, is there's a way that some of these projects are actually generating money. They actually have transactions fees that are being charged and being utilized. And company, again, I'm not endorsing any of these. I'm not telling you to do this. But you have companies that, that, are, that are doing really well, like Chainlink. Okay, there is a real need and reason for Chainlink, it's an oracle. It's really important. And you need the token in order to, to make the whole system work. There's a good reason for it. Okay, so now when we start to look inside some of these cryptocurrencies that you might be holding, might be trading, um, you, you can really look and say, what, what kind of basket do I want now? And that's where we get into DeFi asset management and how it pertains and, and how it reflects on and how it relates to traditional asset management. Okay, and, and I come from a background of traditional asset management. And in that, we, we look at, at things like allocation, right? We look at risk and how are we going to allocate in, in relation to our risk? What kind of risk am I willing to take on and how am I going to allocate? How am I going to create a portfolio and rebalance? Okay, if I think again that oracles are really important in the decentralized finance world, but I'm not sure which oracles, can I buy a basket of oracle tokens, right? And, and watch those and rebalance those. So those might be some like uh, Link, uh, Teller, and Band. So is there a way that I can actually buy a basket of these and I, maybe I want 33% each of these in this little basket and I'm going to rebalance them as they get out of balance? Well, the answer is you can do that, right? Because we have something called Set protocol, right? Set protocol is really cool in the DeFi asset management space because I can say, I'm going to create my Oracle set. I want 33% each of these. And as they move up and down, I'm going to tell this, I want it to auto rebalance because I think Oracles are going to be really important. Now, the other thing I can do is I can say, Oracles are really important. I want them to occupy 25% of my crypto or DeFi portfolio. I'm going to hold them. And therefore, I might create a set on top of a set that says this is always going to be 25%. Maybe I'm going to have like ETH at 25% and 
and maybe I'm going to have some, you know, some other like stable point at 25%, and and my my set on top of a set is always going to rebalance that. So what we're seeing is the ability within the DeFi space to create the this asset management, this auto, this robo advisor type scenario that I can hyper customize. Okay, and hyper customization is one of the greatest parts of decentralized finance because what what we take with with sorry what we do with the ability to enact this hyper customization is again I can either take my particular uh, my particular risk profile along with my uh, particular scenario what is it about me what is my life like okay well it, here's how much money I make here's the family I have here's what I want to save for okay I can take all those aspects and combine them into into a very customized portfolio that says maybe I want um, you know 25 percent uh, just holding crypto right and I get to decide what those are and I want that rebalanced and maybe I want 25 percent the new thing right is farm yield farming right so tokens that are actually generating me some income some uh, liquidity pools and I want to keep some cash or something like cash like a stable coin uh, for various purposes, one might be because if all of this falls, I still have a stable coin. And two, because if there's some other opportunity that pops up, I want to have 25% cash or stable coin hanging around that I can take advantage of that opportunity, right? There's nothing as good as cash when you need cash, right? Cash is king almost all the time. All right, so maybe I want to have that. Well, in the DeFi world, I can create that I can wrap it all up in some robo-advisor to where I can go about the rest of my day and the rest of my work and not have to worry about this all the time. Because when I got into crypto, which was a couple of years ago, and I was trading it, it was 24-7. My story, and, and I've told this many times, is my wife at one point accused me of having an affair because I stared at my phone so much and she didn't know what I was doing, right? So now with, with some of these uh, applications, some of these protocols that are created, I can do this in, in DeFi. I can decide what, what my portfolio is going to look like and, and fit it exactly to my life. Now, within this, I might say, um, based on my life, or remember, I live in Houston, Texas. We're uh, very centered on oil, right? Oil is, is everything in Houston. So based on my life, I might say, I want to have a hedge, right? I want to hedge uh, gas or oil and gas, right? Well, now be, with synthetics, with uh, UMA protocol, I can now either create or, or find some sort of negative synthetic oil and gas hedge that says if the price of oil goes down, then I make some money. And it hedges my life essentially, because maybe my income or maybe the value of my home or something like that is, is really tied to oil and gas. And therefore, if the value of oil goes down and the value of my overall net worth maybe goes down, at least something goes up a little bit. And if this goes up a little bit, I remember I rebalance my portfolio, I might sell some of this hedge that goes up in value and now buy some of these that have gone down. Okay, and that is the essence of, of DeFi asset management. We have that ability now, whereas years in the years past, crypto was all about either huddle and, and you know hope that everything goes up and moons at 100x and lambo and all that or it was very much about trading right and trying to to watch the technical indicators and get in and out at exactly the right times now i can be i can be very uh, specific about it i can have a plan i can have asset management behind it i can hedge i can have options i can protect myself okay but i have to evaluate my own risk and part of evaluating my risk is not only what am I willing to lose, what in here am I willing to lose, uh, but, but also I have to evaluate the technical risks. What is my risk of smart contracts being hacked? What is my risk of losing my private keys or having my private key stolen or having my daughter grab my phone and accidentally trade something, okay, which, by the way, has happened. So what, what risks do I have and, and what am I willing to take on? Can I offload some of that risk? I can offload smart contract risk potentially to something like Nexus Mutual, 
right, where I can buy some smart contract coverage. Am I going to do that within this portfolio? In years past, a lot of the crypto traders and everything else, it was always like, I'm not hedging anything because if I hedge, if I, if I insure, whatever it might be, I take away some of my gains. But now we're seeing DeFi as this, as this um, tool, as this real asset management tool that, that is mirroring a lot of what I have in traditional finance and even making it better. It's even better than we have in traditional finance because it can happen instantly. I can look at the value of my portfolio instantly. I can rebalance anytime I want 24 seven and it can be done automatically, right? With very low fees, very low friction. And by the way, most of these are completely liquid 24 seven. So if there's any time I say, I'm taking all my money out, I can go take all my money out. And now we even have the ability to move this into some sort of debit card where I can just go spend it sometimes. I can just go spend some of this cash. I can set up an account that says, okay, from this farming that's giving me some sort of yield, that's paying me a transaction fee over time for, for participating in a liquidity pool or, um, or participating in, in compound or something, this is gonna go to cash, right? And that cash is gonna be used to maybe fund my life. Maybe it's gonna fund a vacation, something like that. So this is what we're seeing. And, and, and the rise of this has been seen in, in the traditional world in like betterment, wealth front, personal capital, that's given us the ability to create these robo advisors, this ability to, for uh, goals based, um, financial plan. Okay. And, and the goals based financial planning, uh, somewhat said it, it, we, we've used it in the, in the past in years past for, for goals like retirement, right. And, and uh, and college. Okay. But now we're seeing, we can do goals. Like I want a vacation in uh, two years, right. I want to take my family to Greece. Hopefully everything opens back up. It's going to cost you know ten thousand dollars to take my whole family to Greece. I have six thousand now. How do I get there? Okay, and Betterment and Wealthfront and everything gave us the ability to manage this six thousand to hopefully get to ten to the point that if it grows really quickly, they'll take some off the table automatically. If it goes down, they'll put some of that cash back in. Well, we have that in DeFi. We have the ability to create goals-based planning, highly, highly customizable. And what we're seeing is what, what we call the advent of the, and someone please stop me if I'm going too fast, I've had a lot of coffee in preparation for these. But what we call is the financial architects, okay? This is the next generation of investment managers. And they're the people who can look just like the coin genius team. They can look at the, at the data, they can look at the technicals, uh, but they can also look inside how, how yield farming works, how liquidity protocol, how liquidity pools work. And they can create these highly customized uh, portfolios, or they can create protocols that allow me to do it. They can create highly customized funds. They can create funds that, that have growth plus income, income plus growth, growth plus hedge, negatives, whatever they want to do. And they can be 20-year-old kids who are really good programmers who understand the, the data and how the yields work and, and how the fees work and create these unbelievable um, protocols and, and programs and algorithms that are going to be able to manage money. And they could literally be a, a kid sitting in front of a, a few computers anywhere in the world, and they're going to be the next generation of investment managers because they're going to man digitally help you manage your money. All right. And, and you might think, OK, this is all happening within the DeFi world or within the crypto world. And, and it requires people, people completely trusting DeFi and crypto. But what we're going to see and as Interax is actually going to talk about all next week, now we're seeing more and more real world assets being tokenized. OK, so now what you have on top of that and again, tell me if I'm going too fast. Right now, what you have is when, once you have real world assets tokenized. So real world could be real estate, right? It could be NFTs, uh, like we talked about yesterday uh, in, in the summit. It could be invoices, right? Companies that are shipping things that you can factor those invoices, and now those are online, and I can invest in that. It's certain, you know, private companies. So now I can have a customized portfolio, some of which can be based in real real estate, not online real estate, but real real estate. Or I can, 
I, I can create a program that I invest in certain invoices and I make a higher return where I'm willing to take on some extra risk. I can invest potentially in some private companies and have that all be part of my incredibly customized portfolio. Now, the asset management, the, the personal, the financial planners that are coming up are going to have to understand all this and they're going to have to understand how you can create customized portfolios for people based on 24 seven liquidity assets and be able to still offer advice. How can I still offer advice if algorithms and some 20 year old kid programmer uh, in, in India is actually creating this? How am I going to be able to offer advice as, as a financial advisor? I'm gonna to have to figure it out. Everyone else is going to have to figure out how you still offer advice to people. But this is what we're seeing in the future of the world of DeFi asset management. The current state of DeFi asset management, we have some, some really good um, protocols like set protocol again that, that gives me the ability to create kind of a robo advisor. I can create my own set or I can buy one of their sets, which is really great, right? It, it, it's a re, either rebalancing sets or the social trader sets, which says here's a person that's done really well investing in different DeFi protocols or, or DeFi tokens. I'm just going to get to follow what they do. I'm going to own a token in my wallet. The token is going to follow exactly what this other trader does. And it's my way of buying into a fund. It's I'm buying into a, essentially a mutual fund by virtue of the fact that I have this token. That's exactly what it is. Uh, we have another one where we really like called Zapper, Zapper.fi. Again, I'm not endorsing any of these. These are just some that we've seen that we really like. And Zapper.fi gives you the ability um, to, they, they were actually a uh, Kyber Network um, hackathon winner. Uh, and they've now, it was DeFi Zap, they, they merged with DeFi Snap. So now they have an unbelievable dashboard and ability to connect my wallet and put me in and out of all sorts of different investments like uh, liquidity pools. But they do it all in one transaction. So if I have ETH in my wallet and I want to go into the ETH maker liquidity pool on Uniswap and earn fees, I can do that in, in one, as they call it, a zap. It's one transaction. That's really important now, especially because gas fees have gone through the roof. And I, of course, want to do it in one transaction and, and not take that much time. And if I don't really know what I'm doing and I don't really know how to do it right, but I know that I like the, these tokens, I like the risk profile of them, and I want to earn a little bit of money as long as I'm holding them, the Zapper will take care of that for me. And, and it's pretty awesome. And I can go to their website and see how it's performed. And I can get out, of, I can roll out of that very quickly. So if it hits a certain point where I go, okay, I'm good, I've made my money, I want to roll out, I can do that. We also have Melon Protocol, which is out of Switzerland, and they've created the, the ability for someone to create essentially a hedge fund or an investment fund, and they put together all the, the essentially all the paperwork, but it's all done on chain. So you can go check it on chain, of course, because all of this is so transparent, you can see the performance, you can see the, the relative value, you can see who's buying, who's selling, you can see what I can set up a fund, which I'm trying to do right now on, on Mellon's protocol and launch it and get anyone in the world, essentially, ideally, right, to invest. And they, they connect their wallet, they get to invest whatever small or large amount of money they want to, and they can transparently see what I invest in. And if I perform well, then I should get more investment. It's not subject to going through and, and waiting for quarterly reports and seeing what I do on a monthly or quarterly basis and then deciding to put your money in and you can't get your money out for a year. This is, you can put your money in today and stay in for a week and get your money out. You can see exactly what my fees are gonna be because I can set it up like a hedge fund where I get my two and 20, I'm getting 2% management, 20% performance. I can do all that because Mellon has set this up and, and made it really easy. And the latest one we've seen is uh, PyDAO, which essentially takes the ability to create some sort of fund, like an ETF uh, type fund and, and brings in DAO properties. It says those that are a part, those that have bought into this DAP, into the DO token, actually get the ability to propose changes to the fund and then we vote on them. And you vote based on, on how much of the, the tokens you own. So there's actually a, a discussion and a vote. And it allows, it, it allows for the uh, preponderance of, of tokens of funds that people actually want to invest in. So wouldn't it be great if 
if the research is, okay, everyone come, come into the Slack group or the Discord group, let's talk about what we want to invest in, we'll create the fund, we'll invest in it, and then let's watch and see what happens, and if we don't like it, we'll propose changes. And there's rules around how we make changes. Okay, so I hope that all makes sense. Now, we've actually bridged with the latest uh, Hack Money Hackathon, uh, a guy who, who was one of the big winners bridged everything, right? Which was pretty awesome. And he created something, and, and I'm not quite sure uh, how much he's launched of it, but he called it My DeFi Pie. And I hope you all can read that. And what he did, which was brilliant, is he took the ability to use Yuma, which, is, uh, which allows you to create synthetic assets using their oracles online. And he gives you the ability to create essentially a traditional market portfolio in DeFi. And the way he does it is you can create, for instance, an S&P 500 uh, synthetic token. And it's not on synthetics. It's, on, it's using the Yuma uh, protocol. But I can create an S&P 500 synthetic token that moves up and down with the S&P 500. Right, so now I can have a DeFi portfolio using my wallet that I connect um, and, and have tokens in there that are mine that I can probably trade to someone else. And I can hold S&P 500, I can hold crypto, I can hold Link, you know, Chainlink, I can hold uh, Teller, I can hold Synthetics, I can hold ETH, DAI, whatever I want there. I can. Um, I can earn money using liquidity pools and using other yield farming techniques. I can do all that within my wallet. Of course, it's non-custodial. I'm not giving up my, my rights to anybody. I'm holding on to it. Now the key is I have to just monitor my risk. Um, the, they're reporting their dashboard engines out there. Zerion is a, is a great uh, dashboard. Uh, of course, Zapper has, has a dashboard where I can look across all of my portfolio and see what's happening, see how much I've in there, see what I've lost, what I've gained, how much I'm earning in income, because I need to know that for my life. I wanna know how much income I'm earning, how much I've lost in value, how much I've gained in value. When I put money in, I can look at all my transactions. It's actually, it's phenomenal that what took the traditional finance world probably a hundred years to get to in DeFi, we've gotten to in like a year and a half. Okay, so uh, I'm talking really fast. Let me ask, are there any questions? Are we even taking questions today? Anyone, how am I doing on time? You have uh, just right about maybe two or three minutes left. No okay. questions are thus there, far. Are You're there great. any questions? Nope, no questions. Yeah. You're good. No questions. I adequately explained everything in DeFi asset management up to this point. That is awesome. Okay, so uh, what I wanted to, to end on is is we also have these smart wallets, right? The ability to now have uh, smart wallets like uh, Argent, for instance, there's a new one called Digifox that I know of, and there are just so many of them. Uh, Dharma has one, where now I can connect, you know, my, my bank account potentially Apple Pay, and I can start getting involved in DeFi. What I wanna warn everyone, of course, is be careful. There's smart contract risk. There's always, uh, I don't say always, we have several issues of hacks, um, there's issues of gamification of the system. So be careful, dip your toes in, but really keep an eye on what's happening in the DeFi really asset management space. Because in DeFi, what we're seeing is, that, again, it's not so much the, the moon, crypto trading, all of that. It's more into how can I grow my wealth? And it doesn't always have to be super quickly, but how can I grow it in a safe, efficient way? And how can I really understand what I'm investing in why I'm investing in it and make it a real part of my portfolio. And it's why I get up here and get so excited talking about it. And that I believe is all I have to say. Anything else? All right. Well, thank you, Adam, so much. This was extremely informative. Really sure. appreciate it. Um, if anybody has any questions for Adam, uh, what's the best place they can reach you? Uh, our Twitter handle is at interaxis8, the number eight. And of course, you can check out our YouTube channel, uh, YouTube slash C slash Interaxis uh, or Interaxis.io. Perfect. Thanks, Adam, so much. Really appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Enjoy. Thanks for putting this on. Absolutely. Have a good one. Sure. 
Okay, coming up next, uh, pretty exciting, Mr. Tron Black. So stay tuned and he will come on in just about two minutes. Okay, Tron, I think you are good to go, if you're ready. We're living in a crypto world on fire. And I got my raven con. I know we can fly so high. Raven, we got our feet on the ground and we're burning it down. Ooh, raven, we got our head in the clouds and we're not coming down. This corn is on fire. Baby corn is on fire. This corn is on fire. Baby corn is on fire. Looks like the earth is going to play. So bright it can burn your eyes. Get ready to talk tonight. We can try, we can never forget it's late. They want the nicotine. Everybody sing with me, say ready. Hello, everyone. My name's Tron Black. That song, if you could hear it through the microphone, uh, was by Raven Coin Girl. There's a whole series of songs she's created, uh, part of the Raven Coin community. My name's Tron Black. Uh, I am a principal developer for Medici Ventures, uh, which is division of overstock.com. And then I'm also the lead dev for Raven Coin. So today, I'm gonna to be talking about uh, communications using a branded asset. So call is the name of the, the presentation. So what this is, is basically linking a token, a unique token name to communication, digital communication of any type and what you can do with that. 
So for this, we need just a little bit of background on trust, anchoring, communication, and uh, then uh, three features of Ravencoin, uh, some messaging features, and then I'll jump into a few uh, use cases. Some are real, some made up, uh, and some that are just uh, meant to inspire ideas. Let me start with the trust anchor. So anchoring for Bitcoin is the genesis block. So this is the first block in Bitcoin and everything is linked to that. So it start, started with uh, on uh, January 9th uh, or January 3rd of 2009. And, and from there, every block's been built on that. For Litecoin and Raven, uh, same thing. There's a genesis block, different chains, different, uh, different genesis block, but that's the, the trust anchor. Everything uh, goes back to that. For Ravencoin assets, it's slightly different. So you create the trust anchor, and this is a unique token that you create. Uh, the token name has to be unique, and Ravencoin will make sure that that's happened. Uh, just, just kind of by the way of background, none of this is actually Raven specific in the sense that you couldn't do this on, let's say, a smart contract. It's just that all the facilities have kind of been built into Ravencoin. So it'll have some Ravencoin specifics in it. But you create a token, you make up your own token name, you burn 500 Raven, which is somewhere about around $11 right now, and you get your own token. This token moves uh, just like Bitcoin. You can transfer it, you have a private key, you sign transactions, et cetera. So this is the trust anchor for what we're talking about today is, is, is anchoring to a unique token name. So let's talk about trust for a minute and trust in, in especially in digital communication. So for websites, we have HTTPS. So that protocol HTTPS will uh, encrypt the traffic, but it could encrypt the traffic to a bad guy. So you need to know who you're talking to and make sure that the person you're talking to or the website that you're talking to is who they say they are. And that's where SSL certificates come in. So that's where somebody like VeriSign or something like that signs a certificate that says uh, they are Google, they are, you know, we've seen their corporate documents, et cetera. Um, so that's SSL, SSL certificates for websites. For Twitter, we have the blue check mark, and that's so that somebody like Elon Musk uh, can have a blue check mark, so you know it's kind of the real Elon Musk and not somebody just uh, pretending to be that and saying, hey, we're doing a Bitcoin giveaway or something like that, right? Um, so you've got the trust there. Uh, for TV news brands, right? Doesn't mean that they're necessarily telling the truth, but each one of them have a brand. So you've got CNN, NBC, Fox, MSNBC, Newsmax, RT, Al Jazeera, OAN, all having a brand, right? So the, the uh, it do, doesn't mean you know we're not we're not going to solve the problem of fake news here today because you could create this brand and then still put out fake news, but it will all link back to that token. So that so the communication has a root anchor uh, that, that you have. And the same thing with online news, right? You have New York Times, Washington Post, uh, the Guardian, Wall Street Journal, right? You may or may not trust these. Uh, you know they they sometimes say opposite things. <laughs> I'm not going to get into that, and we're not going to solve that problem. Uh, but they all do have, uh, they all do, you know, articles and things in these uh, do have a brand and all link back to that publisher. And so we are going to be able to do that, link this back to a token. So token is a brand. So linking the token with communication, right? So the token is the brand. So this unique token that you create is the brand. Uh, and the communication will be anchored to that brand. And this will be digital signatures and cryptography linked to this brand. And one thing that it has that some of the other uh, options that we just talked about, uh, including Twitter, uh, including news stations, including websites uh, don't have is that it will be tamper proof and censorship resistant. Uh, by tamper proof, I mean, you cannot change the content. Someone can't change the content uh, at all. Um, and then some censorship resistant in the sense that uh, you're not gonna have uh, somebody say, well, I don't like this content, so we're just gonna take it down. Um, and that's because it's distributed. So all of, the, all of the communication that we're talking about is digitally signed. It uses the same digital signature that, that sends your Bitcoin. So this is your private key. Uh, and it's the same private key that you had when you issued the token. You issued the, the, the token to your address. And you have a private key that no one else has uh, that will allow you to communicate and attach it to this, to this token. And then this is probably the most important part, IPFS. If you haven't heard of it, you should look this up. Uh, this slide deck will be available later to anyone who wants it, uh, and this link uh, will take you there. But if you want to, you can just go to ipfs.io, and that'll take you to, to uh, this technology, interplanetary file system. So IPFS uh, doesn't actually store your files, but it's a system to make sure that your files aren't tampered with, 
uh, and that can be globally distributed. And it has this uh, couple of really unique features, really interesting features, and that is the content uh, that you put in there is addressed by the content. So it gives you back a hash and that hash is the reference to the data. So if the data changed for whatever reason, because somebody changed the IPFS software or whatever, it wouldn't match anymore. And so uh, by taking the content, uh, the hash and putting that in the Ravencoin blockchain and not being able to tamper with it or it wouldn't reference that actual file, uh, you have this immutable link. Uh, and so we've kind of, we used it for the metadata initially and I'll explain metadata in a minute. Metadata for the tokens initially in Ravencoin and it was so popular we've extended that out uh, so that you can put this information in with every transaction. And that activated uh, earlier this year. Um, so the token transaction, every token transaction, uh, it would include this IPFS hash that goes in the chain. Uh, and then you can link to the data. Uh, and the data can be anything. I'll explain that in a minute. Uh, so let me jump to Ravencoin assets. Um, there's, I think, six types, but I'm only going to talk about three types here. Uh, so there's a root asset. The root, root asset, here's one example, my underscore voice. Uh, it must be unique, uh, meaning uh, you create it if it's not unique, just like a domain name, right? So if someone already has it, you can't get it. Uh, and the Ravencoin uh, blockchain will actually sort this out, right? So the first one to grab it will get it, and then no one else can have it, and it sorts all that out. Uh, so that's root assets. Um, they, they cost 500 Raven, and those... Uh, those Raven are burned, so nobody gets them. They just, it's part of the tokenomics. Some of the Raven are just gone off the market. Uh, and then uh, sub assets. So if you own, let's say my voice, uh, then you can create my voice slash anything else you want. This, you know, collectively this whole thing needs to be unique, but it means you can get any name uh, like this, right? So here's an example of a blog. Uh, these are 100 Raven uh, and those 100 Raven are burned and then you own that uh, token as well. And then we have unique assets and they're set apart by having a hashtag in the middle. Uh, they start with a root asset. So somebody who had Spock, for example, and put a hashtag and then they can put anything they want. And if there's a hashtag in it, there's only ever one of these. So uh, you can, we call them unique assets, but uh, you can, you've also heard of them as uh, NFTs or nifties. Uh, they're just uh, non-fungible tokens uh, and, and guaranteed that there's only one of these. Um, so these are the three different types that we're gonna talk about. Uh, what was interesting is when I was creating this presentation with this idea of linking uh, tokens to uh, communication and putting that in IPFS, the communication in IPFS and having it be immutable and, and uncensorable, uncensorable, et cetera, uh, someone else actually created this My Voice token and this My Voice slash blog token and, and actually published a PDF. So that's available. Uh, you can go see it uh, through our Explorer. There'll be some links at the end of this and let you get to our Explorer, et cetera. Uh, but you can actually go see what they published. Uh, doesn't mean you'll appreciate what they published, but that you know, kind of doesn't matter. That's not, you know, Ravencoin doesn't care what you publish. It's just, uh, it's just a technology. So let me talk about uh, three different types of, of data uh, that you can publish. Uh, so Ravencoin metadata, Oh, when you publish the data, the data is all the same thing. It's files or folders, right? So all three of these are going to be files or folders, which means they can be anything. Uh, but the, the, the way it's associated or the way it's linked into the Ravencoin token is a little bit different. So Ravencoin metadata, the data is associated with a token. So it usually means what is this token about? What is this token for? What does it represent? And so you can put that information in there. And so some of the examples would be like a deed to a property if the token represented uh, you know, each token represented a share of the property. You basically say that in the metadata. Uh, or it could be a PDF about what the token represents. It could be a folder of files for a static website. Someone's actually put an entire website in this and you can actually just jump to the whole website with multiple files. And that's because the data can actually be a folder of files in IPFS, so that gets linked. Um, there's an example of that. Uh, it can be JSON formatted data with attributes. So JSON is easily readable, readable by computers and can have like this, you know, tag equals data. Uh, so you can put that in there. You can put in a photo or a movie. Uh, people have put in lots of photos and lots of movies in through this system. Um, and there's a reason uh, that works and that's because IPFS uh, stores the data and the chain just stores the hash to the data. So you're not really bloating the chain. And then just one person or multiple people, since they all have the same name, can store this file. And the more people that use the file and download the file, the better it gets. So that's another kind of neat feature about IPFS. Um, 
The other type is Ravencoin messages. And so this message is data sent by the token issuer. So whoever created or issued the token gets a special token, kind of an admin token. And if they uh, send that token back to themselves and include an IPFS hash, uh, then you know it's from the token issuer because they're the only ones that would have that token. There could only be one of those admin tokens. So they would be the holder of that. Uh, so you can do different things with this. One of the main purposes we had originally for it, uh, and it's kind of, you know, now there's lots of different use cases, but one of them is, is to notify token holders about, let's say, a vote. Uh, so you wanted to vote something about, you know, the, to, for all the holders of your token, you could do that. Uh, so one thing it, it's basically doing is proving that you are the token issuer, right? Because you're sending the admin token. Uh, and then another use case, we'll talk about this one a little bit, is uh, you could create a blog or news that's provably published by the token issuer. Right? So that's kind of you know, subject to this topic, or the, uh, the subject to this message. So Ravencoin memos, uh, these are the cheap and expensive ones. Any, uh, any transaction uh, that, that's made by anybody who holds a token, you could send the token to yourself, send it to your buddy, anything you can now include an IPFS hash. And that, that was activated like I said earlier this year. So it's a fairly new feature within Ravencoin, uh, but it's any transaction, you could include them. You don't have to include one, but you can. Uh, so you could publish the cost basis of the token. You could publish any public information uh, that anyone can read. Uh, you can publish encrypted uh, information so that uh, you know, only people who have the password uh, or private key can read it. Uh, you can basically publish anything linked to a token transaction. So you can do lots of these, right? And anybody who has the tokens can publish. Uh, and that's uh, built in now. Um, okay, so I'm going to collect all these features together, all the things that we've talked about, and so these are the features needed to do this communication thing. So these are the key features. You need a guaranteed unique token name. The reason you need that is that is your brand. So if you if you had the uh, if you had a token that someone could copy it, right, and make it the same token name, right, then they wouldn't know it was from you. So so the important part is that, that, that there's only one token of that name. Um, so the other thing you need is immutable data linked to the token. That's what Ravencoin and IPFS collectively provide. Uh, you need to unlimited data. So you need the ability to put in lots of data. So IPFS is providing that infrastructure and it's providing it off chain. So this, this, uh, these movies aren't going on chain. So it's not making these you know, terabyte size uh, blockchains. And then so that you can do things with, uh, you can link it directly to the token name. You can do link link it directly to the token owner, uh, token issuer, or you can link it to any token transaction, right? So those are the three different uh, types within Ravencoin that you, can, that you can do, and you can do all three. Uh, and then you want it distributed and uncensorable, right? So this gives it kind of a unique uh, thing and, and makes it, uh, while it may not be as efficient, uh, it does have the ability, uh, especially in these days where people are being canceled or, or deplatformed, et cetera, you have a platform that basically just allows you to do this, uh, you know, and, and it's just a technology. It's just out there. It's distributed. It allows you to do this. So what do these features make possible? What are the use cases? What can we do with this new feature set, right? What, what, is, what is possible? So uh, the rest of the presentation is, is basically that. It's just some examples. Uh, some of them are real-life examples. Some of them are in use. Some of them are just made up, and some of them are just kind of designed to kind of like fire the imagination. So one example would be a DNS system, right? A non-censorable DNS system. So uh, if you're familiar with kind of the poker, you know, you know poker sites were shut down by the government here, and I'm sure lots of websites in, in other countries are shut down by governments, et cetera, uh, because the, the DNS uh, system is relatively centralized. And so all you have to do is go and kind of yank that, shut off the IP, and then you can't get to the website anymore. So you can build a, a, a DNS that's uncensorable. So here's an example, right? So this, in the, in the vernacular of, of Ravencoin, you have a root token here, like com slash, and then a subtoken, right? And that would represent amazon.com. And then the metadata that goes in the IPFS would be the records that say, these are the IP addresses for all the amazon.com servers. Uh, and then you can extend that further because uh, Ravencoin allows sub sub tokens, right? So you could do root token, sub, sub asset or sub token, sub token, and that would represent prime.amazon.com, same thing, right? So the IP addresses would be uh, published in IPFS uh, and would go uh, you know, to, to directly to the servers. Blog publishing. So here's just another example. We kind of alluded to this one earlier. So, uh, you know, and this one's being done. So this was, uh, I actually had different tokens here in my original presentation when I wrote it. 
And then because someone had actually done it, I just switched to their tokens to kind of show this as an example. Uh, so, so basically a token, my voice blog, right? And so any, any information that's published on that is published. If it's published with the admin uh, private key, meaning using messages, uh, then it's coming from the person that created this. Uh, but then they could also send uh, tokens, blog tokens, so a bunch of people, and they could publish memos, which would come from anybody who's given uh, the, the blog token. Um, so in the case of, of messages, all the messages are public and timestamped uh, on chain. And that's because uh, Ravencoin uh, creates blocks every minute. So the transaction goes on the block. The block is timestamped every minute. So you have a timestamp for, for every transaction. Um, and those transactions would contain the links to this IPFS, which then links that together. Uh, so now we have uh, freedom of speech and freedom of press guaranteed globally just by technology. So the technology is providing this uh, just as, you know, kind of as a, as a service. Uh, certificate of authenticity, I alluded to this one earlier. So this would be a root token, uh, Spock, and then you create a, a unique asset. Right? So you put a hashtag and then any, any text you want in here. Uh, and then the metadata would be like a photo or a PDF of this item, right? So this thing, uh, just to uniquely distinguish it, right? It could have a serial number on it or be signed or something like that. And then when the ownership of this, this item, this physical item uh, gets transferred, uh, then you would also transfer the digital twin, uh, which would be this token. Uh, so the ownership changes are recorded uh, in, uh, in memos. Uh, to document a chain of custody for any item. So as that, as that item gets sold and moves around, uh, you would send the digital twin with it. Uh, and you couldn't counterfeit this digital twin because uh, there's only one of them and whoever created it started it. And so as it moves around, you can't create another one and Ravencoin will kind of make sure that that can't happen. Uh, so here's a fictional example, right? So a fictional global news network, GNN. Uh, so they would start with a root token, right? So the root uh, branding, right? They can publish under that directly, or they're the only ones that could create the sub assets of GNN News, GNN Opinion, GNN Facts, et cetera, right? And so they could publish under those, right? So opinion pieces, verifi verifiable facts and sources. Again, this is just a made up example. Uh, you could even create uh, unique tokens for each reader. And so they would be able to publish effectively anonymously, uh, but, but tied to their uh, tokens. This would be a little bit like a, uh, like a Twitter handle, for example. They could publish under that, uh, reader comments, et cetera, and you kind of get to know uh, their content, uh, but not necessarily know exactly who they are. So this is just a kind of a fictional example, uh, but definitely possible. Uh, so here's another example. So transparent record keeping. So uh, aircraft, airplanes, uh, they get a tail number, and that tail number typically stays uh, with the aircraft for the for the, you know, for, the for its lifetime, uh, even as it changes owners. A little bit like a VIN number on a car, uh, and you can do the same thing, same idea here with a VIN number of a car. But basically, you include all the records, all the maintenance records, etc., for the tail number for their, uh, that aircraft. So this is a root token. This would be a unique token for each aircraft, and that. Uh, that tail number uh, uh, token would just be sent back to the owner of the of the aircraft, right? So they, they own it, they send it to themselves, but then include uh, PDFs, documents, uh, you know, pictures, photos, things like that uh, for the aircraft, right? With with any additional records, and they would just be time stamped, and you could have, you could record as many of those as necessary for the aircraft. And those of those that information, all the records uh, would be public and time stamped. Uh, to the minute and immutable. So you couldn't change them kind of after the fact. You could add additionally, you could add addendums, you could add corrections, but you couldn't change the, the sequence. Uh, so uh, we talked a lot about this and a lot of information of course is public uh, because the blockchain is public, because IPFS is public, all this information is public. Um, so what's the solution if you want private information, private records? And the solution is encryption. Uh, and there's, uh, there's some articles of that on uh, Medium, and there's a link to that at the end of this. Uh, but there's a couple different types of encryption you can do, two major types, asymmetric, asymmetric. Uh, symmetric, uh, you just create a password. Uh, you put the data uh, in this, you know, publish the data through IPFS and the token, and then you give the password to anybody you want to read it, and you just have one copy to give the password to 20 people if you wanted to. Uh, asymmetric, a little bit different. Uh, you basically encrypt with someone else's public key and they have the private key and then they're the only ones that can decrypt it. For, so for that, you would need to uh, potentially store it uh, multiple times. Uh, 
um, and so that's asymmetric encryption. Uh, and then how do you know what their public key is and things like that? There's actually a uh, Raven improvement proposal number 11 done by Mango Farm. And it's, an, it's a spec for both how to encrypt the data and then also how to uh, publish your uh, public key uh, on chain uh, so that other people can get it and send to you without necessarily knowing who you are, but it's ensuring that only you would be able to decrypt the data. So that's kind of built in. So that's RIP 11. And that's it. So in conclusion, uh, Ravencoin is a publishing platform for immutable timestamped information of any type, right? Any file type, et cetera, you can, you can put that in there. Uh, and then because of the fact that you can link all of this to a token uh, and, and it's uh, digitally signed by the token holder or the token sender, uh, you can build trust in a brand uh, in that unique token name uh, that, uh, that only you have access to or that you've given access to. Uh, and all the records can be linked to that unique token. So it can be a publishing system. So that is uh, the end. Uh, so I have time for questions and answers. They'll hopefully shut me up when, I'm, when, when the time is, is over. And so if anybody has questions, I'm ready to, to, to take them. Sean, this is Christina. If Dustin Minch, our head of mining intelligence, could be here, he would ask you to explain the recent upgrade that you did to make mining uh, easier for the uh, mid-tier equipment versus the yeah. highest tier equipment. Yep. Okay. Sure. Uh, so, for people who aren't familiar with Ravencoin, one of the one of the initial goals, uh, we did change the mining algorithm from Bitcoin uh, to be able to keep it. Uh, what we're really trying to do is keep it uh, democratic and kind of available to everyone. So uh, goal is that somebody with a gaming rig could flip it on at night and make some Raven. And we had that for quite a while. In fact, you could run it on a computer for about the first month and then on uh, GPUs for about the first year. And then somebody did finally make kind of a custom machine that was a little bit more efficient, a little bit better at mining. And so it made it harder, not impossible, but harder for people who had GPUs. Uh, just graph, uh, just gaming rigs, right, with a graphics card, NVIDIA or AMD graphics cards, uh, to to uh, earn Raven. We made it tougher, right? Uh, and so there was a kind of request that, hey, we'd like to go back to this thing where we can just flip on our own machines at night and make Raven. And so we did switch to a um, switch over to another algorithm. Uh, at the time, this was you know about a month ago. So pretty much state of the art in terms of of trying in terms of an algorithm that uses as much as possible of a GPU, which means to create a custom machine uh, that, that competes with it, you'd, you'd be essentially creating a GPU, which would be not very cost effective. Um, so so it's, it's the algorithms uh, derivative of, of ETH hash uh, or ProgPal with the derivative of ETH hash, and we've renamed it CaPal with our tweaks in it. Um, and so that's, uh, that's what we upgraded to, um, yeah, about a month ago. Awesome. And now that I have unmuted the audience and they can ask their questions, I will turn the <laughs> over to them. If anybody has any questions, these are the links, uh, just some links. Uh, again, this slide deck will be available. If you want to know more about Ravencoin, the top link, Ravencoin Wiki kind of spreads out to lots of different things and community things and videos and music and stuff about Ravencoin and, and history and, and all kinds of things. And then and then uh, uh, I write on Medium and then uh, several different people write on the on the blog here. So um, those are just resources available. Any questions at all? stand here awkwardly. I really want to pick on Michael Holdman to, to ask you some questions. Um, Jonathan Kaim also, Dominic, Ben. Uh, Christian is coming up here in about three minutes. So Tron, you have three minutes to tell the audience anything that you find absolutely critical for them to know about Ravencoin. Oh, gosh. Uh, so one thing I didn't get into at, at all, because it was kind of focused on this communication thing, is kind of the higher level, broader overview. So uh, Ravencoin is, uh, was a derivative of, uh, it was a code fork, uh, not a chain fork, of Bitcoin. And then we added an asset layer. So if, if you're familiar with uh, open assets or 
uh, colored coins or counterparty. Uh, we basically built that into Ravencoin. So you can create your own asset uh, and, and it's all built in. And there's explorers out there that, that support it. And there's wallets for uh, Windows, Linux, Mac, iOS, Android, web. Uh, if you're just storing Raven, the coin, there's tons of wallets. I mean, it's in Coinami and all, all kind of all the multi-coin wallets. Um, but its real focus is, is on this asset creation. Uh, and with that asset creation, we linked uh, the assets. We, people needed to know what those assets were about. And we linked it to the metadata. And that went in IPFS. So they could publish an entire video about what their asset was for. And that feature became so popular that people wanted it. Uh, for every transaction so they could just publish information because really all it's doing is storing a short string that links to IPFS. But because those two are so tightly linked through this hash, uh, you can't change one or the other, uh, it becomes immutable data uh, in, in the chain. And so that was a super popular feature and we've extended it and because we have extended it and then all kinds of new things uh, were possible. That's what this presentation was about. Did that use my whole three minutes? Yes, sir. We are right okay. at the top of the time here. Thank you so much. Right. Um, we really appreciated it, Coin Genius, for you to join us here and tell us about Ravencoin. We are big fans. We watch the performance in the market. We are obviously watching the mining side of it. I mentioned to you that I we tend to bring you up in our Genius Wednesday calls. I'd love to have you come on and, and kind of hear what our team has to say about your project. I, I'd love to. I'd love to do that. And Excellent. thanks everybody for listening. I appreciate your time and, and uh, thank you. And we'll see you again. Thank you, sir. <laughs> thank Give you. Give best bye -bye. to everyone at Ravencoin. <laughs> Will do. Thanks. Bye-bye. Excellent. All right. Well, up next, we have Mr. Christian K. Meyer. Christian, are you here with us? I am, sure enough. Hello, sir. Good morning. Good morning. I emailed you, but I don't think you got it. I am slightly underwater and not able to re reply quickly. I've told everyone they have to call or text me at this point. So we are here today to talk about blockchain basics from invention to innovation. And Christian is very passionate. I cannot wait for him to share with you guys his, uh, his passions. All right, I give you the 90 second nickel tour first to put things into perspective mostly. So my partner Carl and I, we have been technology investing for some 20 years. The funny accent you hear my voice originated in Germany. I was a software developer for a very short period of time at Siemens Nixdorf in the mid 80s, which doesn't mean much. I learned basics and nonsense like that. Eventually ended up going to law school when I came out of law school, became general counsel for one of the very early internet service providers, means we were selling dial-up services in the late 90s. And we lucked out to sell this company to what's now the largest internet service provider in Europe, Tiscali, in 2000. So I promptly retired from the law and also moved to Southern California here to set up a venture fund. Our original focus was on voice of IP solution, multi-massive online player games. And a lot of people will probably see the similarities to the blockchain space specifically with MMOPGs already having in-game currencies with US dollar exchange rates since the mid nineties and um, voice of IP, the technology we are using here right now is also the most used peer-to-peer -peer solution in the world. So with that said, so my main pet peeve in that space is still that unfortunately reality doesn't have an advertising budget. So we have to weed through a lot of, let's call it um, motivated reasoning to get to ground truth. So let me start off with just the simple things that people seem to ignore a lot today, which is just the original Bitcoin white paper real quick. So keep in mind what is, was its original title and then ask yourself whether or not we have that. Ask yourself what are the tenants of what's called a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system or cash in particular. So we'll go into those details, but I would encourage you to read it. And if you have read it already, read it again. So. What are the main inventions? So and how are inventions different from innovation? So proof of work wasn't an invention of the white paper. Then blockchain technology was also not an invention of the white paper. What was the invention? The invention was Byzantine fault tolerance by putting those two concepts together. What does Byzantine fault tolerance mean? Uh, in very simple terms, and again, I'm not gonna be very technical. I'm trying to be very practical when I explain things. 
It means in short that if you have a network that needs to be maintained by a number of people, you wanna assume that some of those people are malicious and you wanna implement a mechanism that dissuades them from being malicious and hence a consensus mechanism that encourages everybody to work towards the same outcome. Hence, when you talk about a decentralized network, this is not the same as distributed network and people still seem to confuse the two. Decentralization is not necessarily obviously an absolute, it works on a scale. So even if there was one node operating the software, actually it was probably not at all in that particular operator's um, interest to actually be malicious, obviously, because immediately everybody would stop that using this particular network. All right, these were the innovations. So what did Satoshi introduce? He introduced self-executing code. And um, that's confusingly oftentimes referred to as smart contracts. Needless to say, these contracts are not smart at all. They're mostly kind of if-then statements. If you know basics, or oh, basic, you know what I'm talking about. And um, I like to refer to them as the building blocks for digital vending machines, a concept I'm gonna talk about a little later. So. Secondly, and that's built on self-executing code, is digital bearer instrument. So there's two different types, one being blockchain natives, these are coins, typically reward mechanisms, and protocol based, which are called tokens, i.e. the ERC20 token on uh, Ethereum's mainnet. And then lastly, and that would probably prove to be the most important innovation um, at last, is the decentralized autonomous organization. Unfortunately, I probably won't be able to get much into that. It's very far down the presentation chain here, but I would encourage you to learn more about it. So it's um, significant by on-chain governance and the alignment, most important of stakeholders, which differentiates it from current capital formation um, systems such as for-profit corporations. So what is the problem? There's a lot of confusion still what problem we are trying to solve. And that's why we have a lot, i.e. thousands and thousands of tokens. So people have identified banks and money technologies as the problem. Is that really the problem? So now we got a slew of tokens. Here's just a few. They are not the solution. What do I mean by that? The problem is the conflation of function. If you went to business school, you probably at one point in time encountered this definition of money, money being a medium of exchange, a unit of account, a store of value. That was a definition introduced by a gentleman called Javance in 1876. Well, in 1876, there was also another gentleman that introduced some new technology and he introduced this funny instrument, which was a telephone. Um, needless to say, telephones don't look like this anymore. Neither do money technologies. Excuse so, me, Christian. I'm so, I'm really sorry, but are you sharing your I, I, are you showing a presentation? Because I don't see a screen share. Oh, I hear you clicking. Wow, someone should have told me earlier. I, yeah, I heard you clicking. I'm sorry. Lapping away at my presentation, and no one is seeing it. Wow, that is embarrassing. Let me fix that right away. You missed out on all the funny images I created. So I'm going to share that later again. <laughs> and we fix yeah, thank you, sir. editing, I assume. <laughs> all right. But again, you didn't miss all that much yet. So what we're talking about right now, what is money technology today? Well, actually, most money technology today are DLTs. DLTs are the opposite of blockchain. So what happens when you send funds from one bank to another? Let's say you have an account of Bank of No Returns and you want to send Lisa at Chase Me If You Can Bank some dollars. What happens is you instruct Bank of No Returns to adjust your ledger or their ledger, actually. And then if you're lucky, Lisa's bank account or Lisa's ledger is gonna be adjusted with that same amount the next day, maybe, which tells you it's a DLT or more specifically, it's a federated DLT because intermittently the banks will have to reconcile with the Federal Reserve System. What it also tells you that the default medium of exchange are bytes. There have been bytes for decades. 97% of all values signified by bytes. So if you're looking at your wallet right now, 
What you see is you have your Bitcoin holdings, your Ether holdings and so forth. And what do you see? You see a translation. You see, see a translation in the language of money you understand. In our case, most likely the US dollar. But if you're in another country, you might as well say euros. You might as well see yens. Did the Bitcoin change? It didn't. So what this tells you is money is language, is the language of value. So what's your job as a technologist? What do you need to invent? If you know the symbol, then you've seen and or read the Hitchhiker's Guide Through the, the galaxy, galaxy. It's the babelfish. It translates seamlessly from one language to another. This is your task. I'm going to go into this a little later. So what is not to do? We don't expect that users will adapt a new language, as in the new language of money being, for example, Bitcoin. If you expect to see a Bitcoin price on your banana, you're sorely mistaken, you're wasting your time. As a technology inventor, what you don't want to do is expect users to adapt your technology. You adapt your technology to the user. So what does that mean? Specifically, I like to use this particular example. Smart contracts, or how I like to call them, self-executing code, lend themselves to build what I would call a digital vending machine. Here's how your typical vending machine works. You approach it with your coin or your, your printed US dollar. You push it into a slot. You pick uh, from the candy bar, uh, push the button, candy comes out, and no intermediary was needed. Uh, there's no additional fees attached to that transaction. You got, just get your result. Smart contracts, self-executing code, allows you to do the same thing in the digital world or buy it. We need to still build a lot of on and off ramps. All the value is in the on and off ramps to these systems. I'm going to show you later why. So money over IP, I used that term in the past. I've backed off from that because money is actually friction. What do I mean by that? The default language of money today for a user is typically the local fiat she is indoctrinated in. In the United States, you're indoctrinated into the US dollar and so forth. So what that means is, though, whenever you hold this fiat instrument, you're losing value, you're losing purchasing power due to inflation because there's always going to be more of it and never going to be less of it. Inflation is a little more complex. It's own topic. It's actually not how most people understand it. It's very, very sectional. Either way, what your job is, is to build value transfer protocols that do not hold on to inflationary instruments. Should be obvious, is not being practiced at the moment. So tokenizing the world, battle cry I've been hearing for four or five years already, not so much. Again, missing on and off ramps. Can you tokenize a house? It's a metaphor, you can't tokenize a house. When you take a picture of a house, you didn't digitize it, right? You took a picture of the house. It's a metaphor. Metaphors don't lend themselves well to build solid technology. You want to actually learn the specific vocabulary of the space, which is rather new and still rather confusing to most. So non-fungibles, I'm going to touch on it really, really shortly. Um, the most prominent example is this one of the broken crypto kitty here. This one sold for apparently for under forty thousand dollars, and the, we have seen a lot of proposals to do the same with in-game items. Unfortunately, none of these have materialized in a larger form at this point in time. In my personal opinion, that's mostly because there haven't been advancements on top of 721. So if you're looking at the non-fungible standard, the most prominent being the Ethereum 721 standard, it doesn't provide all that much utility. Essentially, you're buying an entry on a blockchain, but all the metadata, all the information that this particular item carries are still stored somewhere else, right? And so we need to fix that. So assets of IP, that's a very, very interesting concept and should also signify why we need more on and off ramps. So I can create an item simply on the blockchain that simplify it for a QR code, associate that to a real world item. And so in the past, in one of our meetups, we make up this example, which I still want to see in the real world is that of a virtual wine bottle. So I can associate that wine bottle with this particular entry. I can transfer it using the Ethereum blockchain as one example, moving on, tracking its provenance and so forth on another network like the Stellar network. 
Uh, actually, that would be not stellar, but okay. And then eventually it will end up, hopefully, at some point of sales system, at which point in time it might seamlessly move into my virtual wine cellar app. So I just hold the token at this point in time, but I have the rights to hold a particular wine bottle. All right, I'm rushing through this real quick to have most time left for um, frequently asked questions or EMA, whatever you want to call it. But this is probably one of the most important concepts that we focus on right now, as in for most of value transfer that's not digitally native, you need to identify the parties. And right now, the, most of the time, this is done through processes like KYC and so forth that end up in someone's database. Needless to say, that removes the peer-to-peer -peer character that we are looking for in order of asset transfers and introduces simply new middlemen that now enforce their rent seeking. And that's not the intent of what we're trying to build here. Identity is its own very, very long topic. Identity is most likely not gonna be solved on a blockchain. It's most likely going to be addressed by graph-based solutions. It's very important to understand that decentralized software is not limited to blockchains. It's also graphs which are utterly different and don't store entries. On that note, the ledger of a blockchain is somewhat of an optional element as in the public ledger is an optional element because the initial introduction was mainly to prove that the transfer was complete. And oftentimes people think it's a requirement. It's really not. It's important to know. Anyway, so DAOs. DAOs address a problem that we have right now. So we have corporations, we have INCs, we have LLCs, and what do they do? They're trying to align multiple stakeholders. You got operators, you got employees, you got clients, you got suppliers, you got shareholders, and they have all somewhat separate interests, should be obvious. The main purpose of a for profit corporation is to increase shareholder value. And to increase shareholder value, it will adopt a business model. My favorite example to pick on, because it's the most obvious one, is if you're using Google, you might call yourself a user, but you're actually the product that Google is selling to its actual um, uh, clients, which are the advertisers. So you are the product that Google is selling to the advertisers. Also, since Google and well, Alphabet now is a for-profit corporation, its main objective is not to provide the best search result to its users. Its main objective is to increase shareholder value. And the way it does it is by selling advertising. And the way it does it is selling you to the advertiser at the end of the day. So specifically in the search, you can see how this is not going to create the most optimal outcome, but that's also true for many, many other organizations. So in a DAO, uh, you probably know that, and Bitcoin being the most obvious and probably the most relevant DAO, you create ideally an alignment of the shareholders and the stakeholders in, in particular. So if you're buying into the network by buying a coin or buying the token, you participate in the network. So your interests are aligned with everybody else participating in the network, whether or not it's a node operator or someone else creating and taking assets from it. So what does that do? Well, it's gonna disrupt a whole lot of things. And um, I think one of the first things to be disrupted are rent-seeking instruments such as what we call the sharing economy. Like sharing economy today means mostly you're sharing your profits with a corporation, right? Your Airbnbs, your Ubers of the world that extract 15 or 25% of the revenue that its members quote unquote generate. So we already see the beginnings of decentralized systems that facilitate the exact same purpose. And obviously, with any transaction, you typically have another middleman, i.e. a credit card, that also gets to attract, a, 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 a distract 2 to 3% of the value being moved. So what's missing? Today, we are running internet protocol, we're running file transfer protocol, we're running TCP IP, and a lot of other protocols that make up what we call the World Wide Web. Well, actually, we never built the World Wide Web. We built the commercial web. It's being controlled by access by very few corporations and by fewer corporations for uh, directing eyeballs. So what we're building right now is, well, I call, I still have this manual IP in here. I'm gonna have to take that out, but 
building value and asset over IP protocols, and then eventually something resembling identity over IP protocols, at which point in time I would call it Web 1.0. So if you have been in the space for some time, at one point in time you came across this particular graphic, which is unfortunately utterly wrong. It was called initially the, the Fed protocol, as in the value is being created on the protocol level. That is obviously not true because the value is created, always will be created on the application and on an off um layer, not on the protocol. So what are the addressable markets? This is part of a very big, big outline that I have on a whiteboard that takes up my entire wall. We look at this in very large categories of value transfer. All of these value transfer co categories provide opportunities to startups in that space right now. They might be different in size. My personal prognosis said, is that things such as remittance and cash payments will actually end up being uh, user acquisition tools for companies providing additional services on top of it, but not um, extracting money from the actual payments or remittance itself. All right, there's further reading, but I rushed through this with a purpose. So now I'd like to open it up to any questions you guys might have. That was super fast. Okay, I put everybody to sleep. Sorry, Christian, one moment. I'm checking to make sure that everyone can get off mute here. Okay. We're gonna have to re-record uh, for Coin Genius University. My apologies for that introduction here. Um, Jeremy or anyone on the team, if you guys can uh, hit the correct buttons, I just want to, I've unmuted everyone. Hopefully everyone can join in now. <laughs> Well, there's uh, there's obviously a lot to unpack here, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I know how you feel about the uh, the future. I know when you're talking about crypto current uh, crypto kitty specifically in the future of ownership and digital assets, that becomes really interesting. That was a huge topic yesterday, um, so I'd love to hear anybody who has any thoughts or questions around that, or maybe even Christian, you can talk on that specifically because I think you were well suited also for that panel, but didn't get a chance. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we spend a lot of time on that topic. We, we talked probably to every team in that space that is working on the non-fundable token. I'm still bullish about the concept in general, not so much about uh, the particular application at this point in time. This comes back to that our theories, it's all about in the on and off ramps, specifically the, the topic of um, in-game items. It doesn't seem that the usual suspects are very interested in actually executing on that as in the, the main providers of um, the popular games aren't really taken by that idea that their in-game items could be transferred from, from user to user and are being used in, in other environments, right? Got it. So, I mean, do you think uh, Tops and Tops Digital, I know we had uh, somebody from there um, talking yesterday, they had a really great debut with the Garbage Pail Kids on the Wax blockchain. I mean, do you see Wax as a key player here? It seems like more and more folks in large companies are utilizing their protocols to launch these digital collectibles. Oh, yeah. I mean, we've known those guys for quite some time. We like them a lot. We, we think that their heart's in the right place. It's likely still way too early. And what I mean by that is I, I think the protocols are not nuanced enough to, to carry actual value on, on the protocol level at this point in time, right? We need a lot more fundamental technology to be built for those to be useful because what's the value of a, an entry on, on a chain if you still have to revert back to what's mostly still um, centralized databases of sorts, but even if you look at IPFS, it's actually not decentralized, right? We, that is a topic by itself. Christian, what do you, um, can you give the summary of your uh, position, the number of coins we should have is between zero and one? <laughs> yes, uh, so yeah, that's, uh, kind of, uh, as you guys know, my, my most like passionate point because uh, the problems that we see with, with current uh, value transfer systems, if you will, including the topic of money itself, it's the conflation of functions. These functions have been separated, however, a long time ago. 
right? So to kind of reunite those functions, it's a huge mistake. Even like Bitcoin itself, the function is of being a mining reward, right? People speculate on the mining reward that is the lowercase b Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is actually still missing. Um, A didn't achieve his main goal, but B is still missing, if you will, the minting function, if you want to use the metaphor of mining. There never was a minting function. So in that sense, it kind of failed this objective because obviously you cannot move um, Bitcoins for free or without a time delay. But more importantly right now, it's also not very anonymous. So those are the tenants that you require from an actual peer-to-peer -peer cash solution. But as far as, as new tokens are concerned, whenever you conflate functions, i.e. it's a reward mechanism for running a node, but it's also supposed to so, uh, solve payment, it will not work, period, right? We, we know that because it comes back to simply what you want to use for payment. The main two things here for users, do I understand it as in, is it like the US dollar? That's why you always see the translation into the US dollar. And is it quote unquote stable? So as soon as you have another function in there, it ends up being not stable. As soon as you put another label on there, you have to explain what that label means in my um, unit of value. There is A, no need to conflate those functions and B, it only introduces friction, including money itself being friction. So my point there being is you actually need to at all costs avoid anything that's inflationary and plus, all of these items today are simply speculative. I look at the um, quote unquote cryptocurrency market, which is a terrible, terrible term in and of itself that has a, caused a lot of unwanted attention for the space that we didn't need. But if you look at the space, there's hardly any connection to real life economic activity quite obviously at this point in time comes back to, we don't have the on and on, uh, on and off ramps for that. The point there being the state of cryptocurrencies is very much that of a multi-massive online player game. And I don't mean this disparaging. I think that should have happened with any financial system around the world. We didn't do that, but you have to realize that this is what the state is. So Christian, let me ask you one last question. Oh, uh, I've got one for him too. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah, so I, hey guys, if I could just say, Christian, I really appreciate it. I, I, you're definitely preaching to the choir. Um, although we disagree that the uh, sovereign identity can't be on the blockchain, um, but that's a whole different discussion. It is. Uh, but I just wanted to say, yeah, fantastic. Uh, I, you, we, you read right along with us. That was, that was great. Thank <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, the one question I had specifically is around, you talk about anywhere from zero to one in terms of cryptocurrencies that are needed specifically. So let's just go back to WAX, right? Because I think this is a really important point. And once again, we only have like three minutes. So whatever the best answer you can give me in three minutes would be, um, why is WAX important and why can WAX do what they're doing and help some of these large companies create these digital assets? And why is that important versus their token? And what's the difference and why in your opinion is the token in those types of scenarios not needed okay uh many different things here so uh, a i need to touch base with malcolm uh, i've known for some time and so I'll, I'll see what they have worked on lately to be honest i haven't looked at it lately but again it, it simply comes down to the conflation of function if you expect that people were to use your token as a payment function a that's a huge mistake to begin with don't ever expect that right use it for for something else right plus also whenever you start out issuing a token why would you ever start with any form of fixed supply how is that ever going to resemble any type of incentive in your system right it, it's you already set the monetary policy forever and you don't actually know before you start the network how this monetary policy will work out on the network participants which usually obviously it doesn't bitcoin kind of sort of got it right right but it's also been out there the longest and been tested in the wild and kind of had the chance to develop itself but whenever you just presuppose i mint a billion token and uh, I use this thing for payment and many other functions, you're, you're just committing an awful, awful mistake of conflating the functions that have been the bane of our existence to begin with our current monetary system where it's being used to influence the economy at large rather than simply functioning its original intent, which is as, as technology, which points to the main conflation here, which is, Currencies are systems of value transfer. Money is one particular technology you're using within that system. 
Christian, I have a quick follow-up question. So I consider you an expert on all things point of sale. I know that you've invested in the BTC ATMs. What are your thoughts on products like Joff Paradise's Cryptomatic ATM? Well, I love the concept overall because, I mean, the original shitcoin is really fiat, mm -hmm. if you will, right? And we need to suck out the original shitcoin out of the existing system to eventually move those to actual value transfer. Again, that doesn't mean that you create a new unit of account, right? But yeah, um, big fan of anything that's an on and off ramp. And since a lot more transactions are still facilitated by cash and a lot more people than you would think live in cash based societies, uh, I think those kind of automated um, uh, vending machines of sorts for money are utterly needed. And I, I actually see more versus less intermittently, but they have to get smart. Awesome. And in terms of uh, payment on and off ramps from uh, from ATM machines, where do you feel the next evolution of on and off ramps and uh, and mass adoption, lowering the barrier to entry? Where do you feel the next evolution will be? Well, you need to focus on the nuances here. We already have systems that simulate the real time transfer of uh, value. And by that, I mean settlement, unfortunately. Um, within the payment industry, they don't even use it accurately, in, including the people that are working on, at scale at this. So the, the settlement part, i.e. if you're looking at Zelle, to you as a user seems to be instant. It's actually not. There's another layer in between. But you need to achieve the same thing because um, our system here in the United States is more antiquated than uh, some of the other international systems. They already have layers that, are, uh, that mean instant settlement. And just as a frame of reference, so the, the payment sector itself right now creates about $2 billion of alpha every year. And most of that alpha, most of that profit is being created for banks specifically. 30% of the revenue of that banks made is coming from payment. So that's the low hanging fruit in my opinion specifically focus on the on and off ramps that let you move value for free. And that value can be expressed in the unit of account that people are understanding, but it doesn't have to be the same thing as it doesn't have to touch your bank account at all, quite obviously, right? The, your house doesn't change if you price it in, in dollar versus yen or in, in Bitcoin for that matter. So most of accounting entries, right, don't represent simple fiat. I mean, that's just uh, M1, M2. Everything else re represents something else, right? It re represents a, a part of a, a mortgage or, or whatever it is. So that's the more important part to realize. What is that entry representing? We have equanimity in terms of the, the transfer level. You just need to realize the current technology is databases. The new right. technology is blockchain or decentralized software is the better term in this context based. And there, the bytes just move much faster and just don't need the middleman. That's the focus you need to have because, again, the unit of account doesn't matter. The medium of exchange is simply bytes. Keep that in mind. Don't call Bitcoin a new medium of exchange. That's, that's just nonsense. Thank you, Christian. Thank you so much for being a part of Coin Genius University. We are proud to welcome you as a professor. For folks that want to get in touch with you and learn more um, or dig deeper into any of the topics that you brought up today, how do people get a hold of you? Uh, don't get a hold of me. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, so we typically publish something on Forbes every month or every other month or so that kind of pinpoints what we consider our thesis on the space in, in very short articles because they limit me to a thousand words. So what I typically do, I republish these articles on Hacker Noon and um, warning ahead. So I publish these for peer review, right? As in, if I'm wrong, I want to know about this sooner than later. And then also I will update those where I can, as in I can update them on Hacker and I can't update them on Forbes as I glean new insights. So some of these articles, in this case, I've been updating for the past five years. Okay, but, very But good. again, it's well, all, then... it's all uh, strong opinions weekly, hey, uh, weekly held, as people say, right? And, and that's okay in our books. So for those of you that want to get a hold of Christian, uh, reach out to me through the Genius Network. We will vet you. And if it's worth Christian's time, I will bug him. Christian, thank you so much for joining us today. It was a pleasure to have you. Up next, okay. we have Jennifer Ziegel with the basics of digital asset planning. Jennifer, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Hi, everyone. 
hope you're all doing really well and staying safe and healthy during these novel times. Uh, many thanks to Coin Genius for inviting me to speak today and putting on this fantastic conference. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a partner at the law firm of Klein Bard, uh, which is based in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And I am the head of the Estates and Trust Practice Group. So I focus my practice in the areas of estates and trust. And I also have a strong focus in business transactional law, uh, particularly with a focus on succession planning. And over the last few years, I've developed a subspecialty in digital asset planning. I also launched a podcast, which is in its second season called the Digital Planning Podcast, uh, with I, which I did with two other attorneys in the estates and trust space. And uh, that's available on all major uh, podcast outlets. So I hope you check it out if you like what you hear today. Um, so we're going to discuss the basics of digital asset planning. We're going to talk about how digital assets are defined. We're going to talk about uh, what needs to be addressed in both small business plans and individual estate plans, the current laws governing a fiduciary's access to digital assets, and some basic planning concepts. And when I talk about a fiduciary today, I'm talking about an agent under a power of attorney or an executor or an administrator of an estate or a trustee of a trust. And my goal is that by the end of this lecture today, you're gonna to have a far greater appreciation for the need to plan in this area, uh, especially in how, uh, in the light of how COVID-19 is really fast-tracking the global digitization of data. So there are many aspects. I'm gonna start my screen share here, or PowerPoint. Uh, in connection with digital asset planning. And the type of planning is really going to be varied depending on the type of digital asset owned and the security and accessibility concerns, you know, in connection to that asset. And people have a lot of various opinions on what is secure or how things should be accessed by when and uh, by whom. And planning in this area can be highly complex and uh, also needs to be very, very customized. So we're gonna start our journey today by discussing one of my favorite cases, which uh, talks about a very significant crypto loss. And this is the estate of Matthew Mellon. Now, Mr. Mellon uh, was one of the Mellon Bank heirs and he inherited a large trust from the Mellon Bank family. And he was an early adopter in the cryptocurrency space. And he fell in love with uh, the XRP coin on the Ripple network, which serves as a uh, payment settlement system, you know, specifically designed for financial institutions. And he invested early on in Ripple, uh, about $2 million. And at that point, each coin was worth a fraction of a penny. So if you fast forward, you know, from that point to uh, December of 2017, at the height of the crypto market, his initial investment was worth hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. He uh, cashed in, you know, part of his investment at that point. And uh, unfortunately, Mr. Mellon was notorious for having some drug issues and mental health issues. And uh, he became increasingly paranoid that hackers or other nefarious actors were trying to get him or trying to get his uh, remaining cryptocurrency that he hadn't liquidated. So what he did was he took the private keys for the cryptocurrencies and he put them on various uh, nano memory sticks and he hid them in safe deposit boxes under alias names across the country. Uh, fast forward to April of 2018, he was still having some issues with mental health issues, drug issues, and he decided to check himself into a rehab in Mexico. And on his way uh, to the rehab, he died under mysterious circumstances. And he uh, did not leave any known roadmap for locating the safe deposit boxes or unlocking uh, the map to identify and secure and obtain these uh, nano sticks that have significant, probably roughly around $300 million worth of cryptocurrency. And his estate is being probated in Los Angeles, California. Now this is a very extreme example, but it shows uh, and illustrates what can happen if there isn't a balanced plan in place. So here, Mr. Vaughn was uh, very securely stored his crypto, but it was completely inaccessible and making it ultimately useless, you know, unless it is obtained by his, uh, his family. So the need for digital asset planning is only going to exponentially increase as our physical lives become more digitized. And this should really be a component of any estate plan and especially plans for closely held businesses. 
Now, planning, as I mentioned, requires analyzing the types of digital assets owned and understanding what assets are capable of being transferred at a triggering event. And when I talk about a triggering event today, I'm really talking about somebody's sudden incapacity, mental incapacity, or their death. Now, not all digital assets can be transferred. Many people are under the misconception that their iTunes collection can be transferred upon death, but this is incorrect. Um, under the terms of service agreement, you know, with Apple for iTunes and a lot of other Apple products, the user only has a lifetime license in the, in the, in the uh, asset or interest. And once Apple finds out that somebody's gone, they're gonna shut down those accounts. And there can be a lot of issues in connection with that. Other digital assets may not be subject to terms of service agreements at all. For instance, cryptocurrencies or digital art or digital property, collectibles, NFTs, and planning for those types of assets really focuses more on identification, storage, security, and accessibility considerations. Smart contracts can also present a lot of other nuances in connection with the plan, depending on the terms of the smart contract, the anticipated duration, and the rights and obligations owed, and whether there are any uh, just jurisdictional laws that are governing the smart contract. And as this asset class you know, develops overall, planners really need to be more educated about the tech industry. And the tech industry really needs to know more about the legal issues and laws surrounding transfers at someone's incapacity or death so that these assets can be properly uh, documented and planned for. And of course, overlaying all of this is privacy, storage, and cybersecurity considerations. Now, you know, generally reasons to plan for this asset class are to ensure that the asset can be transferred if it's capable of being transferred um, and that it's transferred to the intended recipients. Um, if assets aren't identified and inventoried, especially in the digital asset space, they can be almost impossible to discover or their discovery or access could take uh, an extended period of time. And depending on the type of asset, you know, timing could be key. You know, with cryptocurrencies, the market could be very volatile. There could be other rights and obligations that have timing considerations in connection with the digital asset that need to be taken into consideration. And if it's not properly documented, it could be almost impossible to find or could be uh, cost a lot of money uh, hiring forensic investigators, uh, assuming there is legal access, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. Aside from a potential monetary loss, you know, if these assets aren't properly planned for, there can also be a real sentimental loss. If you have pictures in a cloud sharing platform, there might not actually be accessibility to those pictures at a person's uh, incapacity or death, depending on the terms of service agreements and some other laws that we're going to talk about a little bit later on. And they may not have a monetary value, but they could have, you know, uh, very, very uh, significant intrinsic value, uh, sentimental value to the heirs and loved ones that are left behind. Business records could also be completely inaccessible if they're not properly planned for. And I'm really focusing on closely held uh, corporations and, and uh, small companies, not large conglomerates that have you know, loads of departments and people and IT support you know, that are documenting these types of assets. Um, I'm very familiar with the case where a woman uh, was a widow and her husband was a small business owner. And unfortunately, he maintained all of his business accounts on a personal Google account. And he, she was unable to access the, the Gmail account after his passing and ultimately lost a couple hundred thousand dollars in receivables for the business because she couldn't get that type of information and go to the people who owed her husband uh, business money. Uh, Likewise, I know another example of a woman uh, whose husband died and he was a collector of uh, website domain names, but this wasn't properly documented. And during the estate administration period, one of the uh, website domains expired and it wasn't renewed because they didn't know about it. Somebody else scooped up the domain name and then sold it for, port for uh, reportedly a million dollars. I mean, that caused a direct economic loss to the estate. So it's really important you know, to identify these types of assets and incorporate them in the estate plans. Of course, planning during life and at death also helps safeguard and reduces the risk of identity theft and uh, other cyber crimes. So I've talked a lot about, about digital assets generally. You know, so what is that really? You know, there, there is no uniformly accepted definition of digital assets. And the definition can change on the authoritative uh, resource being consulted. 
So for our purposes today, we're going to use the definition from the revised Uniform Fiduciary Access to Digital Assets Act. And I know that's a mouthful and it commonly goes by RUFADA. And I personally think RUFADA sounds like a superhero or something like that. But uh, RUFADA un uh, defines digital assets as an electronic record in which an individual has a right or an interest and that term does not include an underlying asset or liability unless that asset or liability is itself an electronic record. And Rufata defines an electronic record as meaning relating to technology, having electrical, digital, magnetic, wireless, optical, or other similar capabilities. And it was written you know, very broadly to address future uh, technology. And Rufata was promulgated by the Uniform Law Commission uh, for a uh, model legislation that states could adopt to govern uh, at the state level of fiduciaries access to digital assets. Now, RFADA only controls digital assets that are subject to terms of service agreements. Um, digital assets, you know, generally speaking, are not your computers or your smartphones, or your devices. Digital assets in this definition are all of the pieces of information, all of the data, um, online accounts that are uh, maintained, managed through those devices, or you know, generally speaking, in the cloud. Those are the digital assets. So, kind of expanding on the definition of digital assets, you know, there's five you know main categories that are recognized right now. So, you know, you have your electronic documents. This is documents stored on a digital device in a cloud, software sharing platforms with incorporate electronic communications and uh, Dropbox uh, and other types of uh, file sharing platforms, emails, instant messages, and those types of communications. Then you have your social media accounts. You know, this would be LinkedIn, Shutterfly, uh, Snapchat, Instagram, TikTok, you know, more of these types of platforms are being constantly created. And then you have your financial assets. You know, this would incorporate cryptocurrencies, tokens, uh, digital devices and accounts maintained and online that are connecting to financial accounts or information, um, tokens, PayPal, Venmo, eBay accounts, anything else really associated with a monetary value. This also could incorporate smart contracts. They may also fall into the next category, which would be uh, business accounts and interests. Now, this would be customer information stored in digital form, databases, trademarks, websites, domain names, copyrights, anything electronically stored for a company. And as companies are moving towards becoming online, especially in the wake of COVID, almost anything connected to a business you know, could really be a digital asset. And of course, that could also include smart contracts or other rights or obligations uh, with blockchain interests. And then you have your kind of miscellaneous category. Your, uh, this would include online gaming, airline miles, loyalty programs and points, YouTube accounts, pictures, videos, uh, hologram likenesses, uh, AI technology stored on smart property, the Internet of Things, uh, NFTs could fall into this category. And this is constantly evolving. So these types of categories could be very different in a year, two years, five years down the line. Little joke for you. So now let's move into discussing some of the general laws governing uh, digital assets uh, in connection with the fiduciary's access. So you have the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, which includes the Stored Communications Act. You have the Computer Fraud Abuse Act and RUFADA, and of course, Terms of Service Agreements. So the Electronic Communication Privacy Act really protects privacy and restricts accessibility to contents of files stored by service providers and records held about subscribers. There are some exceptions, but generally speaking, it prohibits the knowingly divulging of the contents of communications that are in electronic storage. Now, this law is silent on whether a fiduciary would have the right to access a, a subscriber's information at a triggering event. Uh, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act uh, similarly penalizes people who access computers and data without proper authorization from the user. Now, most states have adopted similar versions of these two federal laws, and the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act and, and many state uh, adoptions of these types of acts don't address whether a fiduciary uh, has access because the access is silent under these laws. Now, both of these laws were uh, drafted back in the 1980s, and they're you know, completely inadequate to address a lot of the emerging needs, and uh, especially as technology advances. So, Rufada 
was promulgated by the Uniform Law Commission in an effort to fill some of the gaps left by the two federal laws I just mentioned. Now, a version of RUFADA has been adopted in almost every state. And I'm in Philadelphia, I'm in Pennsylvania, and we're actually one of the only states that hasn't adopted a version of this law yet, although it is pending and it could be within the next few weeks that Pennsylvania adopts it, which is very exciting. And again, the default rule under RUFADA is that uh, consent to access digital assets by a fiduciary that are subject to terms of service agreements must be clearly established by the user through estate planning documents or an online tool. We're going to talk about what an online tool is in a minute. So Rufada doesn't apply to tangible property like devices and a fiduciary can lawfully access a decedent's phone or a computer, uh, but the issue really comes into play and it could be a violation of Rufada if if a, I'll give you an example, if a decedent's iPhone, uh, anything on the local side of that iPhone could be accessed by the fiduciary. So if there's photos or information stored on the local side that doesn't require an internet to access, we're not gonna have any problems with the fiduciary access. The issue really uh, comes into play is if that phone is uh, connecting to the internet and then it's connecting to different apps or uh, accounts maintained by service providers. And that's where the issue really comes in because that would be unlawful for fiduciary to go into a decedent's email account through their phone because it would be a prohibition of Rufada. Under Rufada, a fiduciary cannot impersonate a user. Now, uh, and the fiduciary has to maintain the duties of care and loyalty and confidentiality, as you see in other physical tangible assets, you know, where fiduciaries have certain duties and, and requirements for their uh, conduct. Now, Rufada also doesn't grant more rights to a fiduciary that the user didn't have. So in connection with my iTunes example, a fiduciary isn't going to be given more rights under Rufada. The uh, user only had a lifetime license. So this doesn't expand any type of uh, right that, uh, to the actual underlying asset. Um, and this also doesn't apply to an employee's use of an employer's digital assets because the employee has no other right to the asset other than what the employer has provided. And when an employee dies or is no longer working for the employer, that right is terminated. So there is no continuing right under Rufata for employees' uh, use of the employer's digital asset. Now, I'm sure you're all familiar with terms of service agreements, and there are agreements that control the relationship between a user and a custodian and their service provider. Um, most of them prohibit password sharing, and they establish policies and procedures over account and assets. There was a study by uh, the Queen Mary School of Law uh, last year where they uh, reviewed and analyzed a lot of terms of service agreements. And 85% of them don't address incapacity or death provisions, you know, in the underlying terms of service agreements, which is very problematic. So I mentioned uh, a new concept that Rufada uh, uses, which is called an online tool. Now, under Rufada, an online tool is defined as an electronic service provided by a custodian that allows a user in a contract distinct from the terms of service agreement between the custodian and the user to provide direction for the disclosure or non-disclosure of digital assets and information to a third party. Now, an online tool only controls if the access is actually offered and utilized. And there are a lot of other nuances with custodian access uh, that can still limit information even if there was an online tool utilized, but that's a topic for another day. I really look at online tools as being akin in some ways to a beneficiary designation, like a transfer on death account, but you have to be really, really careful. I mean, only two service providers are really utilizing this on their platforms right now. Facebook has a legacy contact page that you can through their platform designate who you would want to control your Facebook page after your passing. Google also has an inactive account manager through their platform and you can specify, you know, for all of your Google accounts and interests, you know, from email to Google Hangouts to document sharing software, who would be the inactive account manager that would have access or if those assets or accounts should be completely deleted uh, when the inactive account manager would be triggered. Now, you have to be very careful though, because there's gonna be a trend with service providers utilizing online tools. There are 
startup companies in the space now that are uh, attempting to serve as a, a third party online tool. And it's not quite clear if that will be respected. Uh, it's probably not respected now, but maybe as these laws evolve, there will be you know, a cottage industry developing for uh, a third party to, to utilize and, and be an online tool for various uh, service providers, uh, accounts and digital assets that's going to, to be evolving. But the, the bigger planning landscape with this is you have to be very careful. If you're, if you're going to use an online tool, you should have those designations very clearly identified in different uh, digital asset inventories, which we'll talk about in a moment, because you could have a situation where you name one person, uh, maybe unintentionally, to be you know, the contact under these online tools, but you have another person who would lawfully be you know, the exact administrator under your will if, you're, if you don't have a will or who you've named in your will to serve in that function. And if it's not aligned or, or if it wasn't intentional to have uh, different people, there could be a lot of issues. You know, a lot of the things that have been talked about in this conference might not apply directly uh, to Rufata because some of the assets and interest with cryptocurrencies and blockchains are not subject to terms or service agreements. But the issue really comes into play is if private keys or other information are being stored in a platform that would be subject to a terms of service agreement. And so these issues and, and kind of the overall general landscape really need to be taken into consideration because you may not um, be able to access it uh, and, and get the information that wouldn't necessarily be subject to Rufata because of how it's stored. Now, Rufata also you know, has a hierarchy of access. So if an online tool is utilized, you know, that is what the legal access is gonna be first, whoever that uh, person is or whatever that uh, direction is, it could be to delete the accounts. Uh, the next, if there is no online tool utilized, would be estate planning documents or other written records that are directly authorizing a fiduciary to access this type of information. And if there's no estate planning in place or other written record, then the terms of service agreements are going to be looked at. And that can be very problematic because the majority of them don't address these provisions. So let's move into some basic steps someone can take in connection with developing a digital asset plan. So the first step is really to inventory all of the digital assets and interests. And I really like clients to do it in separate inventories. So we'll have an inventory for all the different types of cryptocurrencies and uh, we'll talk specifically about what I like to include there uh, a little bit later on. But generally speaking, they would have those types of assets, maybe some gov that are governed by Rufata on one list, and then you can have separate inventory lists for all the hardware you know, that uh, somebody has acquired and all the software that they use. Um, you know, a big no-no in this area would be to have password information included with these types of inventory lists. Um, passwords that aren't subject to Rufata, you know, they could be stored elsewhere and it's more of a security and accessibility consideration for assets that are uh, interests that are governed by Rufata. You know, uh, password sharing is completely prohibited because it would be uh, a violation of Rufata and the federal laws and, and the person needing a user. There's a lot of different schools of thought about the best way to manage inventory lists as well. Um, the next step would be to explore whether any online tools, if they're available, have been utilized. Uh, what the designation is, is in those online tools, is the asset being deleted? Who is the person designated? Is that person cohesive uh, with the uh, estate plan? And even if online tools are utilized, it's still very important to include provisions in a will, a power of attorney, and a trust agreement that either limit or expand a fiduciary's access to digital assets and designate the intended uh, recipients and beneficiaries. Now, there's a lot of different types of digital asset clauses, but typically, you know, you want to make sure you've established lawful consent. You want to address, you know, whether the information is being disclosed, transferred, deleted. Um, you want to define the digital asset, you know, that, that is being discussed or, you know, provision uh, for identification of that digital asset. And then you want to designate the ultimate recipients of those uh, assets and information. Prenuptial and postnuptial agreements should also take into consideration digital asset clauses. Uh, generally speaking, I've seen a lot of uh, married couples who may share a Gmail account. Now, technically, that's not allowed under their terms of service agreements. But if they do that, you know, who would have the right to have that Gmail account? Or if they have digital assets, are they uh, marital property? Are they separate uh, interests? And those types of things should be begun to be fleshed out 
in a pre and post nuptial agreements as part of just overall planning. And then for small businesses, it's, it's extremely important to incorporate you know, access provisions in the governing documents for a closely held business. There are a lot of different schools of thought with this, and especially for business owners. Um, in my example that I discussed with the husband who ran his company through a, a personal Gmail account, uh, that should also be cleared up. Should it, is it a business account? What is in the business? Are tech management guides needed? I mean, these may not be legal documents, but even if you have established, you know, clear legal access and the fiduciaries in, you know, what does all of the, the business information mean? So a lot of times uh, tech management guides are written with a technologist and consult with a planner to make sure, you know, everything is, is very clearly laid out and cohesive. And smart contracts can provide a whole other layer to the type of planning because it's a good idea to have those types of contracts uh, have plain language terms incorporated or uh, as part of a digital asset plan so they're clearly identified and the rights and obligations are known. Jennifer, um, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to have to go ahead and uh, start transitioning. I'm not sure if you're completely done, um, but if you have any final thoughts, that would be great so we can um, get to the next breakout. Okay, well, uh, I do have more information. So if you wanna follow me and learn more about digital asset planning, uh, please follow the Digital Asset Planning uh, Podcast, which is available on all major platforms. But the biggest takeaway for all of this is it, it can be very, very complicated it, to properly address and incorporate digital asset planning into an estate plan. And it's not a one size fits all approach. So thank you, thank you very much and be well and stay safe everyone. All right, thank you so much. Well, coming up next, uh, we have Travis Wright, Joel Calm from the Bad Crypto Podcast. Guys, if you wanna go ahead and join me now, please do. I can't start my video. All right, well, we will fix that for you. I mean, not that anybody wants to see me anyway. Oh, look at that. Hey, Whoa, mom, got mom, our mom. videos. What's happening, Jeremy? Not much. How are you guys doing? Bad. So you guys, uh, you guys were on a really incredible panel. We got some uh, great feedback from that yesterday with Tobin Lent from Tops Digital Trading Cards and talking about garbage pail kids and the future of digital collectibles. And now you guys are kind of taking it a step further and talking about putting the fun in non fungible tokens. You guys are doing a heck of a lot in the space. You guys have your nifty podcast show as well, uh, which I think um, you know you guys stream that with video, which is cool. Um, then you guys are doing the blockchain heroes thing. So not to steal your thunder, but huge fans of what you guys are doing. I think the future is in non-fungible tokens and digital collectibles. So really excited to hear what you guys have to say about this. So I'll uh, let you guys take it away from there. Thank you, you're Mr. Bourne. A, you're a thunder thief, Jeremy Bourne. <laughs> just, just took it right away from us like that. Well, let's see. Let me go ahead and uh, pull up my PowerPoint because we live and die by the PowerPoint. And uh, he is correct. We're going to be talking about putting the fun in non-fungible tokens. Uh, this is me. You guys know me. And, you got a lot uh, of stuff. Wow, look at you. And and this is uh, this is you. And this is me. And they know you. You do a lot of things and stuff. And you you wrote a book. And together, I wrote a book, which was good. Together we. How many have you written? You've written like a lot of books. A few books. Yeah. yeah. Uh, maybe 15, 16, I don't know. I lose track. Um, and we did a podcast apparently for two days, July 16th and July 18th. <laughs> That's when we started the show. And um, if you don't listen to Bad Crypto Podcast, please do. That was a great um, two-day run we had. Yeah, it was, it was a nice run. So we're going to talk about uh, non-fungible tokens today. Mr. Travis Wright, what does the word fungible mean? Let's do some basics here. Let's for those. basics. Yeah, yeah, so you hear the term non-fungible tokens and you hear NFT being tossed around. You're like, what does that even mean? So fungible means, as you can read right here, clearly interchangeable or flexible. And this next slide shows what it means. Like $1 equals $1. It doesn't matter what the serial number is on my dollar. $1, that is so trippy. Look at that gold in the back. Ooh. One Ethereum is one Ethereum. One Bitcoin is one Bitcoin. It doesn't matter which one it is or where it came from. They are interchangeable. What's, uh, what's one Doge? One doge is worth one doge. Still one doge. And one, one bad, bad coin is, is worth one bad coin, but it's worth less. 
and um, you know, if we pull up this dirty fiat, this five dollar bill is still a five dollar bill, worth less today than it was yesterday, most likely. There you go. Uh, but non fungible tokens are different. They're a scarce digital asset on the distributed ledger, known as blockchain. They're real world proof of ownership of virtual goods and sometimes real goods as well. So for example, one crypto kitty is not the same as another crypto kitty. A front row seat is definitely not the same as a back row seat. And this house is not the same as that house. I think I like the first house because it's got that balcony. You like the snowflakes though? Because snowflakes are not the same. The snowflakes are not the same. That was very subtle. I'm glad that you, that you pointed it out. Now, <laughs> yeah. uh, way back in 2003, MySpace came on the scene in uh, on the World Wide Web. And of course, we all became best friends with Tom Anderson, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody was like, you'd sign up for MySpace and you'd be like, yeah. who's Tom? Well, yeah. he's he's your buddy. And the dude- and Ellen there, part. Ellen's now 37 years old and has a couple of kids probably. <laughs> well, it says there she was 20. So yeah, yeah good, good, nice math there, Mr. Travis Wright. <laughs> so MySpace was that moment in the social media world where um, all of a sudden social media was a thing. Well, a couple of years ago, actually in late 2017, NFTs had what we call their MySpace moment with the launch of CryptoKitties. Yeah, and it might've been our funniest episode ever because we were just laughing at this thing. Like, are you serious? Like, what what a ridiculous thing. We're like, meow, oh, meow, my kitty, meow. And they then, were laughing at us, Travis, because we spent money on them and then you <laughs> lost your kitties. <laughs> meow. Yeah, I totally lost all my kitties. Yeah, you lost sad. your kitties. And my, so people, my, my computer crashed and I was sad. They're still going and they've gotten more interesting as, as they go. But this was the first NFT based application that really um, took the crypto world by storm. Yeah, look at that, that rock star crypto kitty. Boy, she's awesome. Yeah. She's like punk a rock, rock star. kitty rock star. Uh, listen, kitty. there was the 896,775th crypto kitty sold for 600 Ethereum. 600. That was $172,000 at the time for well, one. Like, what was the, what's the significance of that number? Uh, you know, I don't even know. The, the kitty was called drag and have to do a little bit more research if somebody wants to look up why wow. this kitty, because it doesn't look particularly unique, especially it doesn't worth what? nearly $200,000 worth. I mean, look at that thing. What? Yeah, I don't know. So let, let's set the Wayback Machine to 1985, and we just hit nostalgia here. Travis, you collected Garbage Pail Kids. I'm 12 right? years old now, and I'm going to <laughs> Casey's General Store. I'm going to go buy me some Garbage Pail Kids. For a and quarter. I did, for a quarter. And I would go up there, and I would get a few packs, man, open them up, and they were stickers. You, you know, I was a dumbass. I actually peeled them. <clears throat> I would take the sticker off and put them on my, on my, uh, on my wall. <clears throat> me too. Uh, Tops, you know, we Tops was a household name then, still is now, and people would collect these uh, these garbage pail kids cards and stickers, and they mm -hmm. were all numbered, um, and so those are still, you know, they're still manufacturing the physical cards today. But just a couple months ago, something happened. Now it wasn't Facebook that happened. Facebook started in 2004, but what I what I would like to point is Sakir Pusa Hitara. When you put these two there together, is. Garbage Pail Kids and the Facebook moment, this is NFT's Facebook moment. Very quietly, amongst a small segment of the blockchain community, Tops digitized and sold Garbage Pail Kids on the blockchain on the Wax blockchain. Yeah. Now, one of the things that was very fascinating about this, and we and you guys might have heard this yesterday during the uh, the panel with uh, with Tobin Lent, who's the head of digital over there, when Garbage Pail Kids came out in 1985, they printed anywhere between five million and ten million of these cards. Mm -hmm. Now, when we launched when they launched the Garbage Pail Kids digitally, there's only a hundred and ten thousand cards total in the first series. That's a very small amount compared to what they printed back in the day. Okay, so um, you know what? I might need to tell me if you can hear the audio on this. Can I yes. This okay. A this is a guy doing pack openings live on YouTube. <laughs> Let's 
Might want to turn your volume down just a little bit here. It's about to get loud. Well, I think the volume is coming through your computer. Get a money pass. Come on, give us something. Give us something. Okay. 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 Yes. Wow. That was an amazing pack. We got one. Oh, sorry for yelling. Oh, my God. There it is. Oh, my God. Super rare. We just. So there you see the guy is absolutely freaking out because he got a card that out of 110,000, there might be what, five or six of those card maybe in maybe. the whole set. Yeah, those are the uh, the collector's edition, and those are extremely, extremely rare. So that's one thing that they did with this is they had various different rarities. They had your common cards, uh, then they had the prism cards, they have sketch cards, and then they had these CE, which are completely animated, and then they have golden cards that they dropped in after everybody bought all the packs. Mm -hmm. So you, the community around this, these, these packs sold out in 28 hours. A super rare... Uh, let me go past this. There we go. So that gives you an idea of, you know, the enthusiasm behind um, this this piece of this property, this intellectual IP that tapped into nostalgia and the Wax blockchain made it possible for people to buy and open and trade. And there's a secondary market now around these Garbage Pail Kids packs that some of them have gone for 25, 30x what they were paid for i mean right. we've seen well, cards the, go that was the common thing i mean we were we were buying these packs for four dollars and 95 cents and there was a time when those packs were going for 175 dollars and then the 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 30 card pack originally sold for 25 dollars, and they were selling for 800 900 over a thousand dollars and some it was just unbelievable because they were rare you can't get them anymore they're sold out well in here this is a crypto kitty this just happened i think a couple weeks ago right trav yeah, so on a website called niftygateway.com, um, which is owned by the Winklevoss twins, they acquired it from the Cockfoster twins. There's a lot of twin stuff going on, but they do these gateway drops, these nifty drops, and they partnered with Momo Wang, who is a digital artist, and there was only one of this, and this sold for $10,500, digital art. Yeah, pretty amazing, and, and uh, somebody now owns that. Um, that you can't go and steal it off their wall. It's in their wallet. And as long as they own the keys to their wallet, they own this piece of art. It, it can't be, you know, taken from them. And nobody can make a forgery of it because the blockchain, the distributed ledger confirms that the ownership belongs to the person who now owns it. So you mentioned Nifty Gateway, and they're they're regularly putting up pieces of art that animate. That one in the bottom left just sold out yesterday, and it's like his eyes bulge out and yeah, they fall pop. out. Yeah, it's so gross. <laughs> it's so, but it's it's you know it's great artwork. Yeah. Uh, so this is one of the sites that people are selling their artwork on. Yep. There are a lot of different places out there, so you can mint your own NFTs. There's a site called we're going to talk about it here in a moment, Mintable. There's a couple other ones where you can actually you got to pay some Ethereum to mint your token, and then your to then I I've done this with some art that I've created, and then I have that in my Ethereum wallet, my Ethereum 721 uh, tokens area. I can actually look at that and and see my my coin, and I can actually I could send them to Super Rare to sell them if I wanted to, or maybe the gateway nifty gateway somewhere yeah you sent me one of yours it's uh, the eiffel tower thing because we've been playing with the the cards we're making you've come up with some really cool stuff well not only are they tokenizing art um and collectibles like kitties and cards but they're tokenizing games and there's a couple different card games that are gaining some really nice adoption online one of them is called gods unchained and if you've ever played a magic the gathering trading card game where you actually battle with your cards or if you've ever played blizzard entertainment's hearthstone card game online this is like that only you actually own the cards there is rarities to them and you can buy sell and trade them on the marketplace um and and actually you know unlike magic the gathering uh where there could be hundreds of certain cards out there and they could be anywhere in the world you know exactly who owns 
which card. Um, another one that we've come across, which is actually the top DAP on DAP radar right now, is Splinterlands. Dot com. Uh, shout out to uh, Agrode and the team there at Splinterlands uh, for putting together a, a really nice set of cards in a, in a fun game. Yeah. Is it kind of like Uno? Because I, I got like these draw fours. Is that anything like <laughs> it's that? It's not like Uno. Like, I wonder how many is, billions of cards those were printed out. It's, it's more like <laughs> battling stuff. Now, this is one, Travis, I came across a couple weeks ago and we're actually interviewing um, another Jesse who's the founder of Bullion X. Dot io on the nifty show later today we do a a live broadcast every friday at 5 p.m eastern two o'clock pacific on uh on all the various live channels called the nifty show and, and jesse's going to be our guest today and what he did is he backed nfts by real gold so each one of these nfts that you're looking at there's a limited supply of them and using the dgx token you can purchase you see what the newest one there travis the liberty 10 that's a 10 gram nft backed by real gold wow so how much is a uh, so if it's backed by real gold then the price of the dgx token is probably pretty consistent right a, a dgx token is about 52 dollars right now okay right okay. that's a gram so 10 grams uh, it says 15 dgx i'm not exactly sure what the exchange rate is but uh you know i'm such a nerd with the stuff as soon as i saw they had them available i went and bought one they're I beautiful to, i really uh, like those those are really cool in and fact, the, you know because that's one like one of the other cryptos their engine whenever you mint a a crypto uh, nft with with engine you actually are staking a certain amount of engine with that and so then you can melt it down and then get your engine tokens back so they're kind of taking the same principle that engine's doing but doing it with actual gold right here so this is actually my display case on bullion x so one dgx is 54 dollars 87 cents and if i click into this little guy here this is one of five that were sold and i could actually see in three dimensions here's the the coin that i purchased and that i own so it's got a little shine to it also see as i turn it mm. got a little effect to it now is that in your ethereum wallet then is that where that is um this would be in my ethereum wallet that is correct yes, that's really you good. are correct sir that's so good so we could tokenize gold and now like let's talk a little bit about this trav virtual real estate virtual real estate so if you saw the panel yesterday we talked a little bit about this not only can you uh, do virtual real estate but actual real real estate and um there are several different sites out there now you know, a lot of your a lot of your kids are very familiar with Minecraft. They've been playing Minecraft all these years. Well, these are decentral decentralized uh, sort of Minecrafty places where you can go in. There, it's sort of like Second Life back in the day, where you can go in, build your own world, buy a parcel, buy an area, build it up, do cool stuff there. And uh, there's been people making a lot of money in this place. It's it's really interesting how it's, how it's all panning out. Yeah, there's there's four of them in all. Two of them I don't have slides of. One of them's called Somnium VR. Another one is called Sandbox. I've bought a few lots there that are empty. One of the more popular ones that got a lot of hype early on is Decentraland. It's interesting. It's a little glitchy um because it takes it's because up a lot of the cool of, sunglasses you get to wear right yeah <laughs> it takes up a lot of processor power but one that i found really interesting is um more minecrafty oh by the way this is uh, from 2018 somebody spent two hundred fifteen thousand dollars for a 126 piece plot of land into central land wow <laughs> wow so crypto voxels Dot com is one that I find really interesting. They've sold out their main map of properties and, uh, and, and people are creating galleries. They're, they're decorating these properties that they are building with, um, with NFTs. And uh, we actually have a Republic of Bad Cryptopia right there in uh, in crypto voxels if you want to check it out well, we got to go. check your id before you come in you can tell that <laughs> yeah you got the bouncers um <laughs> the uh, if you go to nifty.show forward slash voxels nifty.show forward slash voxels you can go there and and, and it'll, it'll take you right there but let me share a live view of crypto voxels here travis you can kind of talk a little bit about what we're seeing is yes these are all different plots that people have purchased and oh. built do you hear the water? Do you hear that? Do not hear that, no. Oh, maybe I didn't click the do audio. 
Oh, look, stairs. Yeah. So you can go check out all kinds of different places. Oh, this is Sam's place. He's Sam has built this up. And and so I, I'm curious about the various different textures and the block styles. I mean, are, are the people importing and creating their own styles of blocks? Or are they uh, <coughs> is that just available to import art on top no, of the everything everything you see is designed? Ah I fell by individuals right you it is a blank slate so all the colors see we can walk in this guy's building here evil voxels estate building evilvoxels.com there's a video here what happens oh if i click it see so now we've got a youtube video that's playing here in crypto voxels yeah you can kind of hear that so, so you can actually use this straight from your browser. You don't have to have a VR headset, but this does work with VR headsets, correct? You just got to type in the browser URL and then go in and it works. Yeah, let me shut it off. Joel's over there jamming. He can't even it's, hear it. It's playing, um, uh, what was it? Uh, I'm going to pop some tabs. I got $20 in my pocket. Macklemore. Thrift Macklemore, yeah. yeah. So let me go back to the, the presentation. Anyway, you guys can check out Crypto Voxels. And I think that um, the dude we had on the panel yesterday said that there's some properties that are going for thousands of dollars now in resale, virtual yeah. real well, estate. Well, the dude said he went in and he bought two, the, the two cheapest ones and spent two grand. <laughs> That's crazy. Uh, here's another one we've been playing around with, Travis. They've actually, um, they've sponsored our podcast before. We dig their, their app. It's called Upland and uh, epland.me they got their little llama guy there and you basically buy sell and trade virtual properties based on real addresses yeah and and you can actually cruise on all, all over the place you can go to different areas of the town uh and then you can buy a property in the different areas if you buy a certain amount of properties then you can complete the collection for that area they also now have airports uh, where you can go to the airport and fly to New York. New York is not open yet, but uh, San Francisco is the only area that's currently open. You do not need to watch where you step, though, in San Francisco in this game. <laughs> uh, here's another one we've come across called Chain Clash. It's a fighting game. <laughs> and uh, they actually made avatars of uh, Brock Pierce. Um, there's Crystal Rose. There's John McAfee. And, and these two clowns over here. Man, uh, I, I swear I look like I'm chewing to some tobacco. And I'm from Alabama. <laughs> and I'm just in the backwoods. I'm going to kick somebody's ass. Uh, it's just hilarious. And actually, our... Uh, so there's these clans that are within this group and ours is the strongest. I think they made, they made me way too strong or something or Joel's farts too strong. I don't know, but we're that kicking everybody's ass. But here's the thing. Each of the characters are an NFT and then you, and there's different levels of them. And then you can either fight with those or you can sell them to others. Right. And so you build up the power and level of one and then it's more valuable to sell to others. Uh, we encountered this one, what, a couple of years ago, MLB champions tokenizing these little uh, figurines of yeah, real baseball was, players. Was, yeah, what was fun about this game was that uh, you basically assemble a roster and then if those players are actually playing that day and they do stuff and get hits and whatnot, sort of like fantasy baseball, you earn these points, which are called caps, and you can use those caps to then open up new packs to get new players. And so it was a fun, it was kind of a fun system. I think there's a lot more they could do with it. It's kind of basic for now, but the Dodgers, they gave away the first NFT crypto token at an LA Dodgers game. You can see it up there at the top Dodgers crypto token. And then you could, you could basically redeem it and they would give you some special Dodgers uh, NFT. Yeah. So there's a lot of different platforms now that you can build your NFTs on. Uh, the Garbage Pail Kids was built on Wax. We're going to show you what we're building on Wax in a little bit. Um, another platform that Travis mentioned earlier is Engine. Engine Coin is actually built on the Ethereum blockchain, but they have their own standard called the ERC-1155. And uh, you and I have both created tokens. I created business cards on the engine coin. Um, and each of my business cards, I minted a hundred of them. Each one is backed by five engine. 
So if engine is worth, you know, 12 cents, then my business card can be melted back into engine and be worth 60 cents. So well, kind of, I think it was at like around 20 cents. And so your business card is literally worth a dollar. I have a whole box of business cards that I got from people that ain't worth anything. No, they're, they're worthless. Uh, this is another one, Cred, who you might be familiar with from their social scoring platform. They have gone down the non-fungible token rabbit hole, and they've actually got the most comprehensive system platform I've seen for creating your own NFTs. You know, yeah. you can make badges, you can make cards, you can make business cards, you can make- Coupons, um, token, deals. Right. Yeah. And they last week we interviewed them on the Nifty Show and they talked about how you can tokenize. This is a Zoom we're in right now. This Zoom can be tokenized. All of the data, all of the attendees, all of the messages, all of the links placed into an uh, um, uh, ERC-20 token that is then portable so that I could transfer the Zoom token for this Zoom to you and now you would have all of the data, uh, you know, re the public data that is referenced in this uh, particular broadcast. And we thought about doing that, but um, we had to do the create the presentation. Well, well we're going to for the Nifty Show today. They sent me the the link, so we're going to actually set that up for our broadcast. You mentioned yeah. Mintable e uh, before. Yeah. Another yeah, way. That's, that's a great place you can go to, to mint your own. Mm -hmm. And it just it just costs you a little bit of Ethereum to mint your token. Right. And right. De and depending on how many you create, that's how much uh, your fee is. And so if you create one, obviously it's a lot smaller. You create more. I, cre I created 10 of one that cost me like 0.1 Ethereum, so like 20 something dollars. And then I did some other ones as well. Now, this is kind of fun because we talked about real world assets being tokenized. And while there's a bigger picture tokenizing real real estate, real, you know, physical works of art, um, the guys at uh, Oliver, CryptoKaiju.io has done a cool job. He worked with CryptoKitties and they've actually made these physical uh, vinyl toys. That one's about eight, nine inches tall. And it's, it's backed by... Um, an NFT that you own in your wallet. So you actually have proof that this toy belongs to you because you own the NFT. Yep. And I own that NFT. It's on my shelf. We got five minutes, Mr. Travis Wright. So I'm going to breeze through some of this here, but Travis and I don't just like talking about this stuff. We like to do it ourselves to try it out. And so we, uh, we pioneered what's called the proof of listening protocol after offering NFTs to um, conference attendees at a couple events we went at. Travis designed these cool little NFTs. And if you met us at our booth, we'd scan your wallet and we'd airdrop you one of these NFTs just as like a loyalty thing. Here's another first one. was we, our, first, our first test. Yeah. Yeah. This one we did um, Bitcoin Miami earlier this year. And then, you know, we came up with this idea of special NFTs for certain episodes. If you listen to the show, we tell you, okay, from the time this episode drops, you got 72 hours to claim it. And, uh, and we started dropping NFTs like this. There's uh, Pete McCormick. There's Samson Williams. Oh, this is funny, Travis, because Samson was from is from San Francisco. And of course, for the Super Bowl, you know, you guys were battling it out because you're a Chiefs fan, right? Yeah, he, he was talking lots of smack. And so this this was what it could have looked like, but this is what it actually looked like. I kept him having a Chiefs hat on because I go. <laughs> That's great. And now, you know, we talked about actually doing something um, more substantial with NFTs prior to COVID happening. Um, and then we ended up getting distracted by virtual blockchain week, which we think has helped to inspire a coin geniuses conference as well. And you guys are doing a great job with this. And now that we've seen what wax can do and the success of the garbage pail kids, we are launching the blockchain heroes set 50 original collectible digital superheroes inspired by real world crypto personalities check this out yeah so this is the first card in the series this is genesis and you can see on the far left that is the basic common card that's what all the art looks like you know you got the white border around it and uh that nameplate uh the second card there is the uncommon which is the next level of rarity and that is an homage to the great comic book artists of all time right stan lee and the other ones 
And then, and I also noticed the font there on that second one. Now, the third one over is sort of an homage to Leonardo da Vinci. And so th that's the rare category. So we have the common, we have the uncommon, we have the rare, and we have yet to reveal several other of our rarities. We have the epic, which is going to be an animated sketch next. Then we have uh, the, uh, ep what, the legendary legendary, one. legendary. And mythic. And then mythic. Yep. And then golden. Um, and if you want to keep up to date on this, we'd love to, to share it with you guys. We have a telegram at t.me forward slash BC heroes and BC heroes.com. There's already hundreds of people that have signed up for this. It's going to launch the first week in August. And we've actually got some partners that we're working with right now to give away promotional cards. Uh, the one on the left is from coin geckos giving away. The one on the right is an original superhero from coin telegraph called Telegraphico, Telegraphico, you guys can get it for free. You need to come to our telegram at t.me forward slash BC heroes to get that. And our last slide here, Travis, beam me yeah. up. Beam us up. Yeah. William Shatner is now tokenizing a lot of his memorabilia and stuff that he's collected in his life on the wax blockchain. They announced that earlier this week. So it's really wild to see what's going on, how NFTs are growing. It's very, very early. It's, it's a nascent space. And uh, I think you guys should want to pay attention. If you're in marketing or if you're doing anything around loyalty or any sort of, you know, creating some ideas to create some digital collectibles, NFTs are something you're going to want to pay attention to. There you go. I'm Joel Kahn. I'm Travis Wright. And we are from the Bad Crypto Podcast. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Christina. And thank you, entire Coin Genius team for putting on this event. Thank you guys so much. As always, you guys uh, don't disappoint. That was really incredible. Um, talking about garbage pail kids all the way to, you know, <laughs> tokenizing a, a lot of different types of collectibles, including William Shatner. So that's great. Let's talk about doing a Coin Genius one specifically. I'd love to talk to you guys about that. Um, but once again, if you guys want to reach out to the Bad Crypto Podcast, one of the best podcasts in the space, actually the best one, let's just say it out loud, go follow them on Twitter, social media, whatever the case may be. They're always doing some great things. Thank you guys always for support uh, of Coin Genius. You guys are some of the earliest believers and advisors of our company. So really appreciate everything you've done. Love what you're doing. Thank you, you guys. Rock Thank on. you guys. Have a good one. All right, Mr. Hey. Jeremy Born, we have uh, our No St. Paul up next for blockchain and philanthropy. Okay. Uh, there's a hello. There's a thank you well. so much for having me and thank you for organizing it. Um, uh, there was a little bit of a mishap, and I thought I didn't have the keynote, and then it happened about an hour ago. So I had to put all together in you know the midst of time. But uh, I hope that it will help people to understand a bit better how um, philanthropy and blockchain works uh, nowadays. Um, can I share my screen? Please do. Okay. Thanks. Wonderful. So let's see. Again, I apologize for uh, the unpreparedness, but we'll do our best uh, to, to make it happen for everyone. So uh, let me put play. Just a second, uh, here we go. So can you see my screen? I assume you do, okay. Yes, uh, we can. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Uh, so the, you know, the, my, my name is Arno St. Paul. I am the founder of Give Nation, which uh, we'll talk about it a little bit later, but it's a blockchain driven uh, initiative uh, related to philanthropy, hence, uh, the subject. Uh, I've been um, uh, also working conscious capitalism and uh, I have another company which is about personal development and fostering more love and positivity throughout the world. Um, my thing is about consciousness and technology and how to use one to foster the other. And uh, here's my cat, by the way. <laughs> Uh, and uh, so we are working here about how can we create an environment uh, that enables and fosters more uh, giving throughout the world. And so philanthropy is my day-to-day uh, -day activity. And I wanted to share a little bit further uh, where we stand to nowadays and how we can grow. So a, a very quick feedback on, on how 
philanthropy is growing in the US. Um, to give you an idea, in 2017, $410 billion were given uh, only in the US, which is roughly a little bit below 2% of the GDP. Uh, it's 1.7 actually. Uh, what is interesting though, is that uh, the total charitable giving grew 5% uh, in 2000, 2017. Uh, that education charities like Give Nation are uh, amongst the most beneficial. They receive, they had an increase of 6.2%. And also a very interesting uh, data shows that millennials are uh, the ones that are giving the most. 84% um, of the millennials are giving to charity. And we're here in this uh, surrounded by millennials, uh, I, I assume. 11% uh, of total donations come from millennials. This number will grow as uh, they get more and more come of age and, uh, and get access to more and more capital. Uh, another information that is more related to blockchain in this case is that nowadays, as referenced by Stanford, there are 240 uh, projects that are related to social impact. Well, we don't know if they are live projects or not, but uh, overall, I would say that the, the, the idea of applying blockchain to social impact and philanthropy is uh, still a nascent sector and it has room to grow. And, uh, and so we can explore together how we can make that happen. So to give you an example of how important giving is for people, for people like you and me, uh, we have that uh, young boy, 15 years old, who donated half a million dollars, not thanks to his father, parents' money, but because he, he won them, basically. He, he is three times world golf champion, and, uh, and he auctioned off his hard-earned trophies. And that's how he took that money and then gave it to charity to help uh, supporting children. And I'm heading Give Nation, so that's why we, we talk here about Give Nation, but it is all about how can we empower people and not just children to give them the tools, not only to donate, but also uh, using the blockchain to empower these people to provide uh, a, a, a clear path towards helping others. Uh, blockchain is an amazing community. It is all about uh, helping each other to grow that amazing, these amazing concepts that we are, uh, we are dear about, right? That we love. And uh, together we can make a huge impact. We can uh, not only provide or, or, or communicate that sense of community, but we can also use the, the advantages of our technology to provide transparency. So not only transparency from a, a tech standpoint, but also, sorry, I have a dog, quiet. Uh, to, so transparency, uh, sorry, uh, transparency for uh, uh, providing a full transparency across the donation. And this is a big aspect that blockchain uh, enables. And as Give Nation, for instance, we will request gradually uh, from the charities that we're supporting to provide a full transparency across towards the impact so that we can provide a, um, a, an accounting of the impact that is being given at the end of the last mileage, if that, may, if that uh, makes sense. Uh, along with that idea, I, I don't know if you are aware of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, so the UN, a few years ago, created a target uh, with 17 objectives about no poverty, about uh, altruism, et cetera. And um, we, are, uh, we can provide such visibility and trackability thanks to the blockchain uh, so that any project, any person, any organization that are having an impact whether it is negative or positive, can be referenced on the blockchain and we can all know how we are uh, moving towards a better planet and a better humanity. 
that's what blockchain is powerful about and for, and that's what we should use as a tool uh, to make uh, a better planet. So I'm gonna uh, use the use case of the one that we're working on uh, every day in and out with our team, which is, uh, and that's what blockchain uh, for me uh, is amazing for, which is how can I engineer, how can I use the, the magnificent potential of blockchain and cryptocurrency to create a positive driven currency, to create an environment where people are incentivized directly and uh, also inspired to uh, make an impact. So it's not about, you know, blockchain is about many things. Uh, we've seen that the, the core of, of uh, the blockchain community is all about open source and helping each other, et cetera, et cetera. And then, you know, gradually as we went more and more mass market, we started to attract people that are more uh, connected to managing supply chain, to increase their, uh, their uh, financial assets, et cetera, et cetera. And we believe that uh, as a community, we have an amazing potential of helping others to make a change in their lives. We believe that using our currencies, if we make it the right way, we can create the tools that will empower people to impact their community directly. Very much like what are the core values of a blockchain. So in our case, it's called Give Nation, and uh, we created, we're creating the only nation on the blockchain uh, that uh, is called the Give Nation. And the Give Nation has a currency called the Give Coin. And our vision is to educate 1.6 billion kids from 5 to 18, to create a space where, uh, and an environment and a community where it is all about using a currency, in this case, the gift coin, to impact the world, whether their local community, their local orphanage, the shelter, or also obviously uh, the social uh, um, uh, community at large. And we are using, again, cryptocurrencies to make that happen, not only towards giving to charity, but also towards saving and, and investing, and I'll get back to that in a second. Uh, using always the UN Sustainable Development Goals as a tool to monitor how we're impacting globally. So the problem we're solving is not only a financial literacy issue, uh, allowing children not to be um, in, into more debt than, than where we are now, but also to create an environment where they can uh, uh, give in, and uh, be empowered to do so. So we designed an app that enable children to save, to invest, to earn, to spend in a fun and, and social and easy uh, environment. And so the product we've built is here, we, you have a, our first implementation is an apple tree that has five roots, which is about saving, investing, learning, education, uh, uh, playing and, and giving. And as they use the money, the apple tree will grow. So. The, the point here is how can a kid can support a charity? How can a kid buy a product or learn about um, a, a topic that is dear to him? And according to his action, he will earn more coins or will spend them and uh, create a, a more positive environment for himself and his community. It's all about the we. Um, and, I, and that's what I love about blockchain is it's all about us together to make a change. And we should do, use that power to make a huge change at the world level. And I believe we can do it as a community together. We'll obviously get into more features in the next few months. Um, here's uh, Arjun, as you saw already. We made trials in Kosovo, uh, which were amazing and uh, and we were about to launch in Barcelona with 25,000 kids, but COVID happened. And so we put together some pre-compassion classes uh, online and we're rolling them out right now in the US. Um, so it's a, fun, it's a fun adventure for sure. 
Uh, we have amazing partners. Brave is one, uh, Kinder is another, um, uh, Brave, uh, so Sikana, we have Everypedia as well, and a few more that are all here to fight against uh, financial illiteracy. And this is a very important aspect to a blockchain as well. We need to educate the kids because they are the ones that are going to use our technology together uh, from their first, very first day. So that's the type of things that will enable a mass market adoption of our technology. So we have a little team. Uh, you most likely know Elise and uh, maybe Patrick as well. And we're all building that together. Uh, we'll skip that. Some testimonials from people uh, from the uh, Kosovo and Aviva. And uh, yeah, so from a, from a, uh, a presentation standpoint, that's about it. Uh, you can reach me on givenation.world. I would like to say that I really believe that uh, using cryptocurrency and blockchain, we have a chance uh, as, as these amazing guys from uh, uh, CoinGenius to uh, educate and provide positive tools to help individuals and a society in general to make a big change in their lives. And we, I believe that we have the, uh, the tools to enable an abundance-based society. Until now, uh, in until the past 200 years, it has always been about scarcity and, uh, and survival. And you know, what we've done with UBI and with uh, the different uh, uh, explorations that we've done together, uh, and, and also the methods of governance and so on. It, it, we, we believe that it is now possible to create an economy that is based on abundance and gift and not just about taking and about competition. And that's what we're looking to embody here in this world uh, with Give Nation and with your help, uh, and, which is to uh, promote that idea of uh, we can do it together and we can bring a positive um, use of a technology such as blockchain. And by the way, actually, we are soon will start launching concerts online uh, using blockchain as, as well. You probably saw Sam uh, doing a pitch about concerts tonight. So we're launching very soon uh, givemusic.live, which will purpose will be to launch charity concerts again and from, with top tier artists. Uh, that will enable us to uh, reach out to more and more people. So thank you very much for listening. I hope that it was useful in some way. I apologize for not being ready uh, as I should have been, uh, but uh, I'm sure, I hope that next time I'll be invited and I'll prepare something better. That was great, Arno. Thank you for being here and thank you for sharing your vision. I think that this is a wonderful application of blockchain and the uh, ability for folks to understand what tokenized economies are and the power yeah. of their vote, the power of their behavior. And I love that it's focused with kids who are inherently altruistic and haven't been, you know, <laughs> I think that's really smart. Um, what can you tell me a bit about your team and the folks that are rallying around this idea, the folks that are supporting you? Yes, uh, I, I would love to. So I'll, I'll put the slide. That's like, here we go. So the, from a team perspective, um, well, besides me, who have uh, 30 years of experience in technology and finance, uh, we have Fernando in Portugal, who is uh, an amazing CTO, works a lot on, in social impact. Uh, Patrick, who is with Team McAfee, you know, more from the blockchain world. Uh, so he's our CFO and uh, has been supporting us in the past year. Elise, uh, Sam, uh, who is uh, now, I think, the world expert in uh, stable coins. Hey, yay. Uh, so she's uh, my co-founder, uh, joined us about uh, a year and a half ago, and she's absolutely amazing. And I really believe she's the mother of uh, all these kids that we're uh, putting together. Every is an amazing uh, young guy as well who um, has worked at BTO, which is one of the big uh, uh, consulting firms. And, uh, and Michael comes from media um, and uh, Timothy in the US. But anyway, many people, uh, I think the most important thing is 
having partners like you guys, CoinGenius, and others like Brave and so on, help us a lot to first know that we're on the right mission and going in the right direction, uh, but also to uh, look to connect to everyone that is ready to make a positive change. And uh, I think that's, that's what helps me to wake up every morning and be very happy to work with the amazing team we have. We're about 12 today within the team, uh, but there are many companies that are uh, working with us um, and looking to work uh, to create a beautiful world together for the kids, for our next generation and for our planet at the same time, which is the important bit, right? I, I would agree. That's why we uh, we put our work with Charity Genius and folks like you and folks like Binance Charity and you know the the people that are really trying to make a difference. Patcoin, shout out to Patcoin there. Yeah, um, yeah, it's amazing. So, what can you tell me, Arno? You've you've been in many industries, be you know, before all of this, but you've been around. You know, a lot of the folks in the industry. What can you tell me about the evolution, the bridge to? the rest of the world, right? The the road to mass adoption. What are you seeing in entertainment? What are you seeing in, in philanthropy? What are you seeing in the shift of mentality of folks kind of migrating to blockchain? And, and this is this is one application of it, but this blockchain revolution is a huge thing. Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, and my, my, my point of view here is that mass adoption comes because it's, it's convenient uh, to the individual. So it is because we're offering a lot of utility for a specific use case that it is going to be adopted. We're all about laziness, I, as I was said yesterday, actually in a, in a panel. Um, and, and so that's the, the bet we're making related to, uh, uh, to Givecoin in this case, it's because we're fulfilling something that exists already, but we're providing a new way of doing it that is easier for everyone that is going to be adopted. As long as there is no friction to adopt it, right? So uh, the, the bottom line is, if it's easy to use, like a little bit like the UI that I showed you, if it's, it has a purpose that helps me in my day-to-day -day life, therefore it's gonna be adopted and, uh, and used. So, and we see that in education, in media, in everything, really. So what we're looking at is how can we create systemic change that uh, I can also um, create the, the systemic approach to, uh, to acquire more and more users yeah, and uh, hence the concerts and, and therefore bring them to use the platform and then they start educating their parents and other people. And so creating like, so like washing machine, <laughs> bringing in more people and, and, uh, and uh, educating them in the process. Education is big, it's the tool, but it's also convenience that is very important, if that makes sense. Totally agree. Well, we appreciate everything that you're doing right now. Um, what are you seeing in terms of when we're talking about social impact and we're talking about other companies that are also leading the charge here? Who are some other companies that you'd identify in the space that are really doing a great job in terms of education and creating a really st uh, more sustainable future? Ha, huh, that's a good question. Um, I, I've seen a few companies or initiatives uh, like uh, Giver.io or Elise that are doing an amazing job, but then necessarily in the education market, they are more on the charity aspect. Uh, in the educational market, I would I haven't seen that many people, uh, frankly, um, because it's it's probably perceived as a non-profitable uh, market, and uh, and and also to tell you the truth, it takes a lot of time to to get into that market. That's true as well, which is a bit incompatible with the blockchain way of seeing things. Uh, now, there are a few initiatives, so we're connecting with initiatives that are already providing um, uh, tools. So, for instance, um, a, our friends from, uh, uh oh, sorry, there are some work around me. Uh, our friends from um, Brittany, Brittany Kaiser and, uh, and the Own Your Data Foundation, we're working with them because they have an amazing tool 
to teach about owning your own data, about blockchain. And I believe, and they are working with uh, uh, a, a lab in Singapore that have created a whole curriculum for children. Uh, and the Q, the Q lab, was it? If I'm not mistaken. Uh, and so we're gonna work with them to broadcast that kind of information. Likewise, not from the blockchain world, there is uh, an amazing company called OutSchool uh, and they have created very engaging remote programs for children with live teachers. And, and so we're gonna work with them as well to provide that on our platform because you know, in the end, uh, if it's fun and if it pays or it engages at least, uh, then there is no reason why not people will be there uh, to to use them. So um, in the blockchain world, there is much about educating, you know, about trading and and uh, or in the B two B market, you know, uh, supply chain and all that stuff. But towards the consumer market, I haven't seen yet big initiatives. I've seen local ones. There is a a project in Belgium creating uh, little uh, shops or bars where you go and you get taught about uh, uh, about blockchain, and um, so it's um, David De Brissier that does that and is, is doing a real great job. And you know, we're I hope to connect to anybody that is going into the educational marketplace so that we can help each other and, and grow uh, uh, blockchain acceptance throughout the world. Love it. Well, you know that we will love to bring all of that into Coin Genius yeah. University and help have that avenue so that folks can find those resources and know that these are legitimate resources. Um, yeah. Arno, I love everything that you're that you're doing. Um, tell me a few. So you you mentioned Brittany Kaiser's foundation. I know Jeremy Gardner has the Blockchain Education Network. Don Tapscott has the Enterprise Level of Blockchain Research Institute. Um, our folk, our friends over at Cointelligence have Cointelligence Academy, uh, and I know quite a few folks have like trading groups. Nick Spanos. Uh, Nick Spanos has an education platform. Um, what are some of the other ones that I don't have on my list that I should have on my list here? Huh. Um, I don't have them in my, so, you know, our, we're focused on the five to 18 years old. That's our thing. Right. And there, it's kind of nobody's around. Uh, above 18, there are many different people, and uh, and well, thankfully they are there. Uh, I do have, I do remember having uh, heard about a school in Germany that teaches like after-hour school that teaches about uh, blockchain. Uh, and but I don't have the name here on in my head, unfortunately. But I can send it to you afterwards. Yeah. You let me know if they yep. belong in the network. We want to help encourage folks to be able to find them. Yeah, yeah no, we uh, let's let's definitely keep speaking and work together. We're working towards um, you know in the future here in Coin Genius a completely gamified experience that's highly customized to the user themselves. So um, perfect. The younger generations are very used to gaming uh, and tokens and all those kinds of things. So the way in which they would be onboarded is very educational by nature, but um, also gamified in terms of the experience and leading them down the road of understanding the technology from opening a wallet and getting rewards. We even have something that we've come a uh, coin that will release a little bit later this year called GXP, which is genius experience points, making a line of the gaming uh, sector, right? Because that's what they're used to. They want to experience points. We're going to give them badges. So the more that they do and the more education they consume, the more they go to events and interact, they'll earn more points um, to be able to be more educated and be empowered. So that's what we're mm -hmm. working towards. That, that's awesome. Let's do it together with okay. pleasure. I mean, uh, we'll start with five years old, uh, you know, using yeah. already uh, some some coins and uh, but they, they need to expand and let's create these tools together and create a, a, um, fun stories that uh, gives them the sense of adventure of, of going into crypto. Definitely. We could even have trading uh, lessons for 12 years old uh, on some kind of uh, token as well. Let's Absolutely. do all these things. So Arno, you know my my joke. Well, rather, you know, Stephen Hawking says if you can't explain it to a five year old, you're not really an expert. So I can think of no better demographic for me to have a user experience, one click, uh, you know, kind of walk through. If they if they can understand it, then 
the rest of the yeah. world can understand it. And I think that that's a really important baseline uh, for us to build technology around for that user experience. Totally, totally. I totally agree. Um, uh, I, Arno, how, if somebody's interested in learning a little bit more about what you do or joining, uh, where they where can they best find you? Where should they follow you? And maybe a website you can give out. Well, givenation.world is uh, where you can you know subscribe and uh, be kept posted. There you can subscribe to our homeschool program. Of course, it's free. Uh, and if you want to join and help and and be part of the adventure. As a company or as an individual, please do uh, let us know and we're accepting everyone. It's a community-based effort, not just us. And, uh, and you can follow me on LinkedIn, on Twitter, you know, I'm a bit everywhere. Hi, Josh. Hello. <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for uh, having me and I wish you an amazing day. Thank you so thank much, Arno. Uh, Bye. I can't talk to you next week about a partnership integration yes. all right awesome thank, thank you. you take care I'm sorry to intrude i was told i'd be like not on camera or mic when i signed on so all good you know what uh, we're just gonna roll right into it so uh thanks everybody for joining us for this one um josh lawler is an expert in a lot of different things i'm gonna let him do the intro i don't want to steal your thunder like i did with the bad crypto guys i told uh, basically everything they were going to promote no i'm kidding um but uh tokenized income sharing agreement so this is really interesting somewhat complex but josh has a really good way of breaking it down and uh, helping the layman to understand the implications of this stuff um he was on some panels yesterday so i really appreciate the support josh and really looking forward to uh hearing this deep dive Okay, great. So let me just make sure the PowerPoint is here. Yep, that should do it. Okay, wonderful. All right. So um, thank you for that introduction, Jeremy. Uh, I am Josh Lawler. You just share your screen. I'm sorry. If you could just share your screen, we. Can. Oh, sorry. Right. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, blah, 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 blah. How are we doing on that one? Is that working for you? All right, take it away. Okay, great. So um, as mentioned, I am Josh Lawler. I am a partner at the law firm Zuber Lawler, where I head our new technologies group. Uh, and I practice securities and intellectual property law and do uh, commercial law as well. Uh, and uh, I've been practicing for about 25 years and obviously distributed ledger technology hasn't been with us nearly that long, but um, I'm fortunate in that I've got a real uh, mental itch uh, for the topic and uh, a passion for it. And I gave a version of the tokenized income sharing agreement talk in Miami, and I just launched right into my, uh, my PowerPoint there, which is, you know, a typical lawyer boring PowerPoint. And I, I found I had a few people's eyes glaze over. So um, I'm going to do a little bit more background here first. And uh, hopefully uh, I'm not telling everybody anything that they already know, but, you know, if so, well, so be it. Um, so, you know, the, the first thing I want to mention is that um, the securities laws in the United States don't really work so well for digital ledger technology and, and for cryptocurrency, obviously. Um, and uh, it is as a lead into the tokenized income sharing agreement, I kind of want to give you the story of why so that you can appreciate the, the problem that we're looking to solve. Um, if you look at kind of the, the history of cryptocurrency, you know, after you've got, you know, Bitcoin and, you know, Silk Road and all that kind of stuff, and you, you get into the altcoins and the ICO craze, um, what you're going to find is that, you know, the initial uh, impetus is that software engineers were raising money without needing to raise money. And that's to be expected, which is to say that if you were previously somebody with a software company startup and you needed to raise money, it's a royal pain in the butt. You have to comply with securities laws. You have to go and you know, walk it around to all the seed investors and, and angels and venture capitalists, and it takes forever. And um, you know, I've been doing this for a long time, so I've heard a lot of people really uh, complain about the process, and there's nothing that I could say that would be telling them they're wrong. It, it was a pain. So um, somebody figures out, uh, Vitalik, that they can basically raise money by selling tokens that are going to be important in a future system. And I'm sure it felt very much like Kickstarter or Indiegogo at the time. Uh, and the tokens are products. 
And the reason somebody would buy these is because they're going to work in the system. Um, and it was a short hop from that to the idea that, you know, because of this supply and demand dynamic and because people were speculating that they could sell anything uh, and they could sell it really fast. And from that point, you had a lot of people who fit the category of profiteer more than software engineer jump in with all kinds of projects. And, you know, we all know how many shit coins there are out there. So as this is happening, um, you've got, you know, in the United States, uh, a lot of people, uh, as usual, who aren't in the know, who try to jump on the get rich quick scheme. And the result of that was that a lot of people not in the know uh, got absolutely abused. Uh, and they got abused in the way that the securities laws are designed to prevent. So the SEC is watching this. Uh, they have their twin mandate of preserve orderly markets and, pre and protect the Main Street investor. And the Main Street investors getting killed. Now, were they getting killed by a sale of securities? Hard to say, really. However, nobody else was jumping in to help them out. You know, my own preference would have been that the Federal Trade Commission got involved, but they didn't really, maybe a little. So the SEC comes out and they use the Howey test and they crowbar tokens into the definition of investment contract. And for a variety of reasons, I'm not going to go into on this uh, panel, huh? this breakout. It doesn't really fit and it doesn't really work. However, we are stuck with it. Uh, no question. And for anybody who is watching the Telegram saga and Telegram just, I think it was today, announced that they will be paying the SEC $18 million or so to settle uh, their issues. Um, but, but Telegram was very important because Telegram tried to do it right. They hired my old law firm, Skadnarps, very expensive, very experienced, very good law firm. And they did their offering. And then they had Skadnarps defend them in their, you know, their SEC action. And the, the SEC, you know, quite frankly, or the judge, I should say, quite frankly, in, in my view, broke a few really key rules that mess up the entire securities industry. But nonetheless, have locked in the idea that, you know, in the United States, if you're going to do a token offering and it resembles a financial product, uh, including via supply and demand, that you're going to need to comply with the securities laws. Um, and while I don't begrudge the SEC how they got there, there's a great place for regulation. It has unfortunately left us in a very bad position globally in terms of innovation. Um, and uh, in terms of what I think is going to be, you know, a really extreme revolution uh, into distributed ledger technology. Um, so let's talk about that extreme shift for a second. Um, you know, I've been asked many times whether uh, how one regulates digital assets. And uh, I tend to think that it's a somewhat ridiculous question because, you know, you might as well ask me how you regulate paper. If you think about it, all, all a digital asset is, is something that's recorded on, you know, electrons, uh, software code. There is no difference between that and a piece of paper. There is no difference between that and a clay tablet in terms of regulating what is on those things. So, you know, there's a lot of variety here. You can't really lump things together. What has changed dramatically is the idea of a centralized ledger versus decentralized. And if you look at the dawn of human existence, you're gonna find that the guy in a cave who's keeping track of the mammoth stakes and the nuts and berries is a centralized ledger. Uh, that's, that's what it is. He knows how many mammoth stakes and what the nuts and berries are, where who brought who to what and who gets what is a centralized ledger. And if you go from there up to 2008, um, Mostly, there's some argument about before 2008, but up to 2008, everything uh, is centralized ledgers. And all of our financial systems, all of our government, all of our uh, religion, uh, all of our you know, socioeconomic class uh, structures, literally everything has been based on centralized ledgers. And um, it, it takes a little while thinking about that to really understand how big of a statement that actually is, um, you know, it's, it's almost like saying that, you know, beehives are based on honeycombs and like, what would it be if a hive had an option to do something else? What would that look like? I mean, it's, it's rather amazing to think about, but that paradigm can now shift uh, to a distributed paradigm where you don't need trusted intermediaries for everything. You don't have the ability of certain entities and organizations to monopolize data and exert control 
from that perspective, which uh, scares the heck out of the governments and the central banks. Um, it's it's a massive shift, and um, I'm certainly not advocating for a full shift to distributed ledger tech. There's definitely a place for regulation and for government, um, but um, you know, I, I think in order to appreciate what I'm about to go into, you have to really understand that scale. So hopefully that that explained it uh, all. Um, all right. So with that kind of behind us, um, let's talk about securities for a second. Um, so generally speaking, they fall into a few categories and uh, the investment contract that you know from Howie is kind of the great catch all for anything that's not in these categories. Um, but, you know, you're, I'm sure familiar with stock uh, equity. You're familiar with debt. That's bonds. Uh, you've got this whole world of derivatives. Um, and derivatives are important because derivatives are contracts and they're very structured, but, you know, that can be anything from, you know, pooling uh, mortgages and income from mortgages. That's our, you know, infamous collateralized debt obligations that caused the 2008 crash. Um, it can be pools of different stocks and, you know, ETFs fall into that category. Mutual funds fall into that category. Um, it can be futures contracts for commodities. Uh, so, you know, you've got spot markets, which is the actual commodity you're buying. And then there's paper uh, commodities. And oftentimes in many commodity markets, there's more paper than there is actual commodities, silver being a great example of that. And then you've got the investment contract. And the investment contract is, you know, defined by, you know, the court in Howey in 1946 to basically be a situation where, you know, somebody who is running an organization uh, sells some kind of an interest in that organization uh, for, you know, to avoid breaking out the entire Howey test. And uh, that oftentimes can be looked at as kind of a royalty um, and notably the income sharing agreement fits into that category. So about the income sharing agreement, it has been up to now a really, really horrible financial product. It is not a good investment. And the reason it's not a good investment is because it's not typically diversified. You're, you're usually talking about a single income stream um, and it's uh, also illiquid. And to give you some examples of that, you know, every year I get pitched by my uh, law school alma mater Northwestern if I would like to enter into an income sharing agreement to finance uh, the um, tuition for you know a promising student, and were I to do that, you know I'm pretty much stuck with that investment, and I'm hoping that that student does well and gets a good job and is able to like pay me some you know percentage back, but I don't really know that, and there's certainly nobody who's looking to take that income sharing agreement off of my hands. There's no marketplace for it, even if there was, how would anybody ever trade it? It's a horrible, horrible investment. However, um, if you turn it into the root of a tokenized contract, it can turn into a really, really good investment. So we're going to get to that in a second. Before we do, again, um, you'll humor me. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about our current securities uh, kind of trading and secondary trading system and what goes on under the hood that allows things to be traded. And the reason I want to do that is because it helps illustrate the inefficiencies in uh, the current situation. And, you know, when you look at that, the thing you need to keep in mind is that it's all because these are written on paper, or at least historically have been written on paper. Uh, you know, if you go back to, you know, 1950, whatever, 40, whatever, a share of stock is a piece of paper, period. Now, in our day and age, um, that's not necessarily always true. However, we still treat it as if it is. So if I am a company and I am going to be public and traded and I issue stock or I issue bonds or really anything else that's going to be a liquid security, um, I am going to take my certificate, my paper certificate, and I'm going to send it to a organization called DTCC, which is, stands for the Depository Trust and Clearing Company. And DTCC is actually a co-op of, I think it's 27 different banks um, who realized that they had this issue way back when and put DTCC together. 
And uh, if you were to look, um, you would find that last year, the uh, stat on their website is that they processed roughly $2.15 quadrillion worth of transactions last year. Um, and, you know, you think about that, I mean, you know, our government is issuing trillions and it's a large piece of the money supply in terms of, you know, COVID-19 relief. We are talking quadrillions. That's kind of insane. And what DTCC does metaphorically, no longer actually the case, but, you know, they've got a file room and they stick these stock certificates in a file room and they have arrangements with correspondent regulated institutions that have uh, accounts with DTCC. And those would be places like, you know, Fidelity or Schwab, or, you know, I'm sure Morgan Stanley and Goldman have theirs, those types of places. Um, now those places then who are registered broker dealers, they in turn, that's called holding in street name. That's who has this thing for the record. They in turn have sub accounts uh, for uh, different of their customers and their customers may have sub accounts and more sub accounts and more and more sub accounts all the way till you get to the final owner who's called beneficial owner uh, of, of a security. So very complicated. And the people who are the beneficial owners, um, you know, they're not holding their securities, they're holding rights to an account, to an account, to an account, to an account. Um, and if that sounds familiar, that's, you know, something in the beginnings of how a centralized cryptocurrency exchange works. Also, um, you know, you have your exchange at Coinbase. Coinbase has all the tokens in, you know, their storage and just keeps a record of, of who has what. You're not actually holding your coins in, in an account. Um, so that's, that's the basic setup. Now, if you want to trade a security, then depending on um, what's going on, the, the catch is that things have to run all the way up that chain so that DTCC can, uh, you know, make the, the right notation in terms of who's got what account. And there's a transfer agent involved. There's a concept called custody involved. Uh, there is a concept called clearing and settlement involved. And the short version is that it takes a few days. Um, you know, T plus three is actually kind of the known time for clearing certain types of trades. And, you know, stating the obvious, it's a lot faster to do a trade on a blockchain. I mean, even Bitcoin moves faster than three days. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's that. And then the other piece is that every single step of the way is an opportunity for somebody to collect a transaction fee. So you've got time and you've got expense. And none of that stuff is, at least in my mind, necessary for trading digital assets. Um, you know, the fact of the matter is you don't need the centralized ledger. There goes DTCC. You don't really need custody. They're digital assets. You might still have custody in certain circumstances, but you don't need it. You don't really need a transfer agent when you've got an immutable transparent blockchain that anybody who wants to can look at. Um, and, you know, accordingly, I don't think you really need all the fees either. So that's kind of the preamble uh, to the income sharing agreement. And that took me 15 minutes. So. Thank you for bearing with me on that. Um, and uh, we're now going to jump into the PowerPoint. So that's me again. I'm Josh Lawler uh, at uh, Zuber Lawler. Uh, and uh, based on that last discussion, you probably have a pretty good idea what it is that I do. Uh, so let's talk about the tokenized income sharing agreements and its benefits. And um, I like to call this the TISA because it's T-I-S-A. Um, and um, I, I will say up front that we do have a side project based on these things that hopefully you'll be seeing more of in the coming months. And um, a lot of uh, what I would have going in that project, I can't say because it's all confidential, but we can talk about the advantages of tokenized income sharing agreement. So what are those advantages? Uh, well, as I just mentioned, they are fully automated um, or they can be fully automated. If I want to trade a digital asset, I can do so on a peer to peer basis. Now, there may not be a market for that, but you know, if I want to trade my Northwestern law student's income to Jeremy Bourne, because the sucker's born every minute, sorry, Jeremy, um, I can do that and he can buy it. And it's just a question of, of the transfer. Um, that can also happen through a bulletin board like a DEX. It can happen through a centralized exchange like Coinbase uh, or Kraken or whomever. 
it can happen through our legacy systems like NASDAQ capital markets or the Canadian Stock Exchange, who are both very forward thinking. Um, that's not going to happen instantaneously for other regulatory reasons, but theoretically it could. Um, so that's, uh, that's pretty, pretty huge. Um, the other place that they're fully automated or can be fully automated, that is really amazing, is you know, from an income perspective, these are income sharing agreements. The idea is that you're paying something up front for a continuing string of income. Now, that may feel a little bit like a dividend or interest that you know, you'd make off of uh, a bond or, or a share of stock. Um, it's not. Uh, it's not taxed the same way, notably. Uh, but the thing about it is if you think about the dividend process, it's complicated. You've got a record date, uh, which is you know who gets the, the dividend has to be holding a share at a particular date. You then have a distribution date. Um, and you know the funds all need to be wired uh, through the entire chain that I just discussed. So you know I won't go into the whole process, but you know, there's there's the uh, the nominal owners uh, that DTCC has, and then it goes all the way down the chain. You get the idea. With a tokenized income sharing agreement, you don't really need all of that. You need the income to hit a bank account, and then uh, preferably through some type of an oracle, uh, like a chain link, for instance. I had to give the shout out. Um, that can then trigger a stable point payment to whomever happens to be holding the tokens at the time. And the only thing that I've found so far that's in the way of that automation is transaction costs for the chain. So if you've got a micro payment, the transaction cost for that might be enough that it doesn't make it worth it. So possibly you have to wait till there's some minimum distribution. But the point is, it can be automated. Now, the other thing that can be automated there is the record keeping. Um, and we'll get to this from a tax reporting perspective later, but you know, as you are making those payments, that can be recorded. Uh, so you know who you paid, uh, how much, at what time, because as your TISA tokens move, um, people are going to um, be entitled to payments at you know, whenever they're holding it, but then they might sell it. So over time, it creates a lot of data. Um, the income sharing agreement is flexible. It's super flexible. Um, if there is a revenue stream, uh, I can make an income sharing agreement out of it and I can tokenize it. And this gets to that question about, you know, how do you regulate digital assets? Well, how do you regulate paper? Um, the fact is that this can be anything from Spencer Dinwiddie's NBA uh, contract and his guaranteed payments, which he ultimately did tokenize, uh, albeit in a somewhat legacy type of way, not the way he initially wanted to. It can be a stream of profits from a cryptocurrency miner. It can be a stream of profits from the graduating class of Juilliard so that they can buy their instruments on graduation. And then over the next five years, you get 15% of all of their income and that's all directed. Um, it can be dividends off a share of stock. Uh, it can be DeFi. It can be interest off of a bond. They're, literally is no end to how you can draw up a contract that can simulate you know, the tokenization of any income stream that you want. Um, and if you think about that, it's super attractive because it opens up capital raising to whole categories of people who otherwise don't have what would be a standard type of security or business model that would allow them to, to do this type of thing. Um, it goes without saying that as tokens, these are fungible. Uh, so, you know, for any series of, of TISAs, if you will, uh, so for instance, if Coin Genius raises $3 million and, you know, in exchange for that over the next five years is paying 10% of Coin Genius's net profits, um, all of those Coin Genius tokens in that series, just like any share of stock, any bond, they're the same. Um, it's, uh, you know, a fungible token. Um, they are fractional, and this is a really big deal, um, and it's huge in the real estate context. But you know, because you know, Bitcoin, for instance, will fractionalize to 18 decimal places, if I have my tokenized income sharing agreement, and because I want to be securities compliant, let's say that initially I in issue those you know, $100,000 capital investment per token, um, which is not unusual for kind of a private securities deal. Um, once those things can be traded in secondary market, they can fractionalize out to however many decimal places. 
And therefore, you know, once from a securities law perspective, it's legal to do so, people can invest in and they might buy, you know, one one hundredth of that hundred thousand dollar token. And, you know, you guys, again, are familiar with the way digital assets work. So that's not uh, too, too hard. And that gets us to our next point, which is to say that it's kind of familiar for, you know, anyone once they're familiar with digital assets and, and tokens. Um, there's no real magic to this. Uh, and, you know, that's not to say that they can't be complicated, because as I mentioned, the, the contracts themselves can be anything that we kind of imagine. But in terms of the trading of them, you don't need the whole broker dealer um, kind of dynamic that's available right now through you know the whole chain of DTCC and everything under it that I described. Um, you know it, it can be done on a peer to peer basis. Um, you know Jeremy, if he decides that Coin Genius is doing really well, can go out and he can rebuy uh, on a peer-to-peer -peer basis those tokens from anybody who sold them to him. And you know, that's a very basic example. And then they're fully visible. Um, and this is the whole kind of uh, transparent, immutable blockchain piece of it. Um, you can see what wallets transacted every transaction. Anybody can see it. Um, that makes auditing much easier. It makes for you know, a much more trusting uh, type of system. You know, if you're an investor and you can look and see, okay, income is coming from the income source, it's hitting a bank account, it's being automatically pushed from an oracle to whoever is holding the token, and you can verify who's holding the token at the time, that's, you know, a, a lot uh, easier for people to keep track of than, than the current system, which is, you know, a bit Byzantine. Uh, okay, so that's actually taking us to the next slide. So. The key here is complying with the existing securities laws. Um, we are not going to be able to get the regulators in the United States to be forward thinking and change the law to what we think it should be. Um, they are going to need us to lead them uh, in order to do that. And there's a variety of reasons for that, none of which makes anybody a bad person. Uh, it has to do with you know our political system, how laws are are created. It has to do with the fact that the mandates for the SEC don't automatically include innovation. They include protecting the Main Street investor and the order of capital markets, none of which require them to change the law on this. Hence, you know the the attraction to trying to crowbar everything into current uh, established protocols. So right here, I've got kind of a progression of securities offerings. And this is a little bit uh, more esoteric to, you know, people who are securities attorneys are in the industry. And this is why the people in Miami's eyes glazed over because I didn't give them that lead up. The 506C private offering, this is what you tend to think of as a private placement. It was made a bit easier than it had been by the Jobs Act. It's, you know, if you've heard of the term accredited investor, all this means is that you are selling your securities to accredited investors who are buying for their own account. That's the gist of it. They're not buying to resell it to somebody else, which is actually how Telegram uh, was, was corralled. Um, they are just buying it for their own account. And yeah, someday they may want to resell it or possibly it's the type of security that has an expiration date, um, but that's the most basic item. And if you were to come to me right now as an issuer of a token, and we were to do an analysis and determine that it in fact fit into the definition of a security, this is what we would have you do. And there might be a private placement memorandum involved and all that other kind of stuff. And it's you know a little bit more expensive and time consuming than you wanted it to be, but that's what it is. This next item, Regulation S, which is also often done at the same time, that's a sale that's overseas. So the way US jurisdiction works, they say, look, if you're not selling this to US persons, then we don't really need to regulate it. Um, and uh, got somebody connecting to audio here. Uh, and that's, um, that's, that's pretty much the way that the government has that. And that can be done at the same time. But the catch is you have to have restrictions on those securities then so that they don't flow back into the United States. That's, that's the catch on that one. And again, that's a little bit how Telegram got, got caught. Uh, and typically, you're looking for a year uh, before those can become less restricted. Um, and that's that's what we have now. If I were to do an offering of tokenized tokens that represent an income sharing agreement, I'd use one or both of those exemptions. The next item we've got is Regulation A Tier 2. And Reg A Tier 2 
is really, really awesome. Um, this is kind of the, the holy grail. Christina just smiled, so she agrees. Um, you know, you can, for up to $50 million right now, and they may raise it to 75, do an offering to anyone, not just accredited investors, of unrestricted securities. And there's some accounting reporting tied to that. But uh, the other thing tied to that is the fact that the SEC has to qualify your disclosure document. Um, and that has been a real obstacle in token world. Uh, and for a long time, they hadn't qualified any of them. Uh, and in fact, usually this is a four month process and amazingly the, the token applications just kind of sat there literally uh, for a couple of years now. Um, eventually Blockstack did get one through. They, according to them, spent a seven digit number to do that. Um, this ordinarily should not cost anything close to that. Um, but where I'm getting to here is that tokens in an income sharing agreement, which are readily understandable, easily auditable. Um, my expectation, and I haven't talked to them about this, but I think it's the case, is that the SEC is actually going to love these because it's very easy to track compliance with restrictions. It's very easy to understand whether or not somebody is doing the right financial reporting, um, which all leads us to S1. Do I have yeah. to go? Am I getting it's, pulled? It's, yeah, that was your cue. Um, ah, last few right. seconds, and then we're going to turn it All right, last time. few seconds. All right, so S1, S3 is a shelf registration statement. The ultimate goal is to have like $50 billion on a shelf and to be able to rip these things off quickly and easily. Then there's secondary sales through markets. And the idea here is to actually have a liquid trading market so that any of these tokenized income sharing agreements can be traded like uh, stocks or bonds. And for that, you need to do Exchange Act reporting. Um, which in this case really ought to be relatively easy because it's just an income statement. It's not part of a company, so there's no balance sheet or statement of cash flows involved. Uh, and then you've got uh, tax reporting, which um, hopefully would automate. And there's a few companies, TaxBit being one that I like a lot, that can do that, which leads us to the company to keep an eye out for in a couple months called SciArc, which stands for Smart Contract Issue Administration Reporting Company. And we hope to take over the world. And that is all I have to say about that because I don't have any more time. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Josh. Mr. Lawler. If anyone wants to get a hold of Mr. Josh Lawler and the folks over at Coin Genius Collective Intelligence sponsors, Zuber Lawler and Del Duca, Josh, where would they find you? Uh, they would find me at J Lawler, the letter J, uh, L A W L E R, at zuberlawler.com. Uh, and uh, we're very, very, very easy to find. Uh, so just you know, Google Zuber Lawler, it'll take you right to us. Josh, Great. thank you again to you and the firm for sponsoring. Uh, and I will just make a, a little plug here. Um, you know, we've worked with a lot of different firms before and gotten advice here and there. And uh, there's no other firm that we found specifically that really truly does have the industry expertise as it relates to, you know, um, securities law and different things like that, especially in digital assets. Um, Josh really knows this stuff. He speaks all over the place. He's at every conference, especially ours, of course. Um, but yeah, if you ever just want to ping him and ask him a question, I mean, he's, he's pretty awesome at getting back to people, especially on LinkedIn. He posts a lot of great content there. Uh, about all the relevant topics that are happening. So anyway, with that said, thank you again, Josh. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the very kind words and uh, very, very pleased to be associated with Coin Genius. And, you know, again, I've had the ability to watch you guys develop also, and it's extremely exciting uh, to see where you guys are going. Thank well, you. Thanks for keeping right. us out of hot water, sir. We appreciate it. <laughs> try. <laughs> all righty. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everyone. All, all right. right. Next up, we have Mark Scarpa from Decentric Media for Media in the Blockchain Era. Mr. We Mark, sure do. Here. Let me get that up and running here. All right. Cool. Hey, guys. Hey. Oh. Uh, you got to, the host has to um, enable me to do some video here. Yep, I'm on it right now. Cool. Okay, you should be good to uh, share the video. Oh yeah, there it is. All right. In all my sleepy glory, uh, thanks for having me, Jeremy. And Absolutely. Boy, I learned a ton from Josh. Uh, what a smart guy, and yep. just. Uh, I'm not sure if my 
presentation is going to be anywhere near as uh, as yeah. useful, but I'll do my best. Um, it's a little cool. little off topic for most of you guys, but uh, let me give a shot here. All right, Mark. And there it is. A little uh, media in the blockchain era. Uh, just uh, full screen mode. Voila. Okay, um, so I'm going to go through this presentation fairly quickly. Uh, there's some information here, and since it's a very expert crowd, I think that uh, you folks will know. Uh, and then I'd love to do some Q&A at the end if I can, uh, which would be terrific. I know I only got about a half an hour. Really appreciate being invited to be a part of this event. Um, my name is Mark Scarpa. I'm the co-founder of Decentric Media. Uh, Decentric Media is a 24-hour global broadcast network dedicated to decentralized culture, finance, and technology. Uh, we're a startup. We, uh, we have uh, quite a great group of backers and advisors. I invite everyone to go to decentric.media.com, check out our video, and uh, look what we're, uh, you know, check out what we're looking to do. Uh, my background, real quick, is I've been on the internet uh, for a long, long time, since about 1979. I was a, a phone freaker early on, uh, went to film school, was uh, uh, worked at MTV News, at CBS News. I was one of the founding producers of CNET and have been doing a lot of live participatory media and live streaming for many, many years. And the blockchain um, you know, sort of is the 3.0 for me. Uh, internet being 1.0, web being 2.0, and this is being 3.0. The power of the revolution of it is just uh, overwhelming so many things. And I think a lot of folks really overlook how blockchain is going to impact uh, media, audio and visual content. So, so looking at supply chain management and other areas. So, I mean, you know, blockchain in general, as you can see, is not just disrupting finance. It's it's everywhere. It's automotive. It's charity. It's cybersecurity. Um, it's all across the board. Travel, real estate. There's just endless examples of how blockchain is going to be utilized. And some very interesting areas for me are again video and music streaming uh, and, and these type of areas. Um, you know, overall, just a general quote, the internet revolution really has reshaped 30% of the global economy. Uh, you know, the entire internet sector, both public and private in 1996 was only about 120 billion. Um, and so I, I looked at this, this when I saw this, um, this chart from Genesis, uh, I'm sorry, source from Scribblers, I really thought that this was an interesting timeline because we are really just at the beginning of this blockchain revolution, uh, and uh, you know it is it is just growing uh, tremendously, and and history is repeating itself. Uh, you know the the medium is the message ultimately. Uh, uh, we've all heard Marshall McLuhan talk about this. Uh, you know the the idea of the scales and the size of of what linear broadcast did for the world. And now you're introducing a decentralized uh, media in infrastructure that cannot ultimately be turned off. It's not centrally controlled. This changes the, the power structure of how media is distributed and consumed all across the board. And for me, it's very exciting. Uh, you know, as I was saying, media is still heavily centralized. You have basically about four or five country uh, companies that control all of global media, uh, CBS, Viacom, Disney, NBC, uh, being Mark, the top three. Sorry, your slides are not moving. I'm not sure if there's an issue there. Hmm. Do you see the media in 2020 slide? Mm, we see the future of media in the blockchain era. Maybe reload the program. Uh, it's just a, how about now? There we go. Okay, we didn't see any of those. Uh, well, they weren't that interesting anyway. <laughs> this is a good one. How about now? Are you guys able to see a little bit of my desktop too? Yes, I would you are good. Okay, great. Got to have a little comedy in here. Uh, so, you know, these are important things. Um, now we're getting to the meat of it. So for me, there's five ways that blockchain is really disrupting the media industry. It's re-envisioning publishing. 
uh, it's introducing this idea of micropayments to monetize content creation. Uh, the whole concept of music and digital rights management um, is being transformed as we speak. Uh, cleaning up fake news is, uh, I think, a very relevant area to look at right now, although it's a bit harder and a bit further out, although with uh, AI and other technologies coming in and object recognition and facial recognition and so on, uh, we should be able to look at fake news in a video asset uh, and identify a lot quicker than uh, how we're able to do it today. And then probably the biggest one is actually advertising, uh, making it extremely more, you know, extremely targeted, less intrusive, uh, and almost participatory in a way where you want to particip participate in the ads in order to reap rewards. So let's talk about uh, music and digital rights. There's sort of four main areas. Uh, we're all familiar with smart contracts. Um, digital rights management and arbitrate uh, attribution, excuse me. Uh, uh, you know, the issue here is a lot of artists are that have contributed to a song, for example, are simply not in a database anywhere. Um, and they're not getting credit for the music that they've created or for the sample that they've created as part of a song. And we still see these battles today uh, you know, even with top name artists, um, you know, who have ripped off some other artist, and, and in many cases, they don't even know that they've done that. It's you know, their producers taking a hook or whatever it is, uh, and they've included it in their song. So they're not necessarily doing it uh, willingly or, or maliciously. Uh, it's just sort of happening. Um, with blockchain, you can uh, have a little bit better digital rights management and attribution than we currently have today. Uh, digital theft is uh, obviously another big issue, uh, supply chain management on music and how it flows from point A to point B to the consumer. And the most important part is the resolution of royalty disputes. Uh, everyone has heard about creative accounting in the entertainment business. This is film, TV, uh, but where it is most pervasive and probably the most abused is in the music industry. So, uh, you know, you make a hit song, um, it's number one on the charts, but for some reason you're not getting your royalties and you're wondering why, how does that happen in the 21st century? And it does, it happens every day, even with top artists. So by being able to, uh, have an ID on every single song or every stem of a track, stems are the assets that create a, you know, a frame or a bar, if you will, in a musical track and to be able to track uh, down to the stems and how they're utilized and where they're utilized on a global basis across the entire, entire internet uh, and be able to distribute royalties based upon that usage is a revolutionary use case. Uh, so, you know, this is a little bit more breakdown. Uh, going into this Spotify, largest music distributor uh, out there, uh, a couple of years ago or about last year actually, uh, acquired Media Chain, their digital light management startup working on uh, using blockchain technology to help solve these problems. Um, the reason why Spotify went and purchased this blockchain company is because they had this dispute of unpaid royalties in 2016 that cost them several hundred million dollars. So they're looking to get ahead of the curve. Um, you know, I talked about some of the details here already. So now let's move on to micropayments, this idea of micropayment monetization and new pricing models. Uh, the thing that's nice about micropayments this works across all media, whether it be publishing, music, video, whatever it might be. This idea of being able to pay, be paid again for a stem, a hook, a bar, uh, a word, uh, you know, it can be, uh, you can be compensated for an element of the song as well as the entire song. And uh, it creates a, you know, a new revenue stream for artists that typically may not have been compensated in the past. And this creates these new pricing models as well. Uh, you know, again, creative music industry accounting, at the moment, you're not getting paid on a fraction of a penny. Uh, they in fact put minimums in place in terms of how much they pay out to you. Same thing with uh, YouTube. You're, you, you won't get your, uh, your payment unless it's a certain minimum. Uh, so there's, there's 
in essence, hundreds of millions of dollars are, are left on the table because that particular artist and that creator is not make, you know, reaching a specific threshold in order to be compensated. It's kind of a crazy concept. Uh, you should be paid no matter what. <laughs> the second you create something, you need to be compensated for it. And using blockchain technology, you're able to be compensated by down to a fraction of a penny, which is very um, revolutionary. So advertising, uh, the big 800 pound gorilla advertising uh, drives media. I think that that is definitely going to be changing. We saw a shift of advertising from traditional uh, media uh, buys going into television and radio. Now it's more into Google and Facebook and Twitter and all the social platforms. Um, but, you know, you're, you're looking at media buying as a whole new, using the blockchain in a whole new way. So uh, marketing group launched a, um, a blockchain enabled advertising agency uh, called Truth. It will use Ethereum uh, in order to create smart contract on uh, technology and underpin its media buying and planning platforms. So in essence, it's a supply chain management being able to uh, track where the actual expenditures are going to be on a micro payments level uh, back to uh, who the media buyer is buying media on behalf of. Right now, the reports that they're getting are pretty broad. You give me $100 million, I'm the media buyer, I'm going to go out and spend it for you. We're going to spend X amount of dollars in these exact areas. And here's a bucket of how that money has been spent and what the results are. Of course, with Google and Facebook, they're, they're very detailed. But using blockchain and Ethereum, you can actually get into a, uh, a much more detailed environment. Now, we've all heard of um, Brave. I hope everyone on this call has at least heard of Brave, uh, the basic attention co token. Uh, you know, this is a, a really interesting situation where you're compensating advertisers and users uh, while they're using the browser. So they're revolutionizing the business model of the browser itself. Uh, if I want to engage in advertising and participate in advertising, I can earn credits as a result of that that could be then used as payments for other things that I want to purchase uh, via the blockchain and via the internet. Permission-based ads. Uh, this is another uh, interesting area for advertising. Allows consumers to choose what ads they see uh, and who gets their data and, uh, and who gets paid for viewing their ads via the ALX token. Publishing, uh, I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. Um, the thing that I like about the publishing area, this is print publishing, is, is really the first point here is peer review. This, this idea of you have something that you're putting out that has scientific fact in it, but it's very expensive and opaque to uh, be able to get uh, a good pool of data back from those advisors, if you will, on that particular review of the printed work. You know, using blockchain, it would help the reviewers to uh, have verifiable identity, verifiable um, you know, facts, increase transparency, and just speed up the scientific discovery and the academic process in general, creating a lot of progress. Uh, this process right now of peer review for scientific papers is a very, very lengthy, long process. We can all understand why. Um, access control and so on. Cleaning up fake news. Um, this one, I think, has a lot of challenges. People are talking about this quite a bit right now. Uh, the idea of being able to check reputation, have ad-free journalism, and of course, fact-checking. Um, so, there's some examples of folks that are doing uh, digital, that are sharing digital content built on top of the decent network. Rewards distributed in public are, are based upon the reputation of the authors built exclusively from the views and the feedback of these readers. This already sort of exists in other environments such as Medium and so on. But if I'm able to have a deeper fact check on the author itself, it builds that reputation and makes that reputation a lot stronger. Uh, ultimately, we all want to get to an ad-free journalistic environment uh, with the hope that as a result of an ad-free journalistic environment, we are going to be seeing um, less influence news, if you will. 
uh, you know, news that is being published because the author is writing it because it is newsworthy and it has authentic information to be shared. Um, and it's not influenced by the bias of the advertisers of the publication itself. Or even worse, they're not writing about a particular topic because the publisher or the media network is telling them you can't do that because it will piss off our advertisers. Um, fact checking, uh, there's a few of these. I think this is probably the most interesting use case where you're able to just check words in an article uh, that uh, or phrases uh, to see if they're actually scientifically valid. Um, is this statement correct? How do you do that in real time? Um, there's an army of fact checkers in television and radio and of course uh, print journalism that work for these organizations who are, it's, it's the majority of it right now is a manual process and the ability to have that become real time and using AI and blockchain in order to accelerate that uh, is a profound revolution in the way that we're going to consume media. Now, in order to do that in video, I touched upon this earlier, you're looking at live, real-time live streaming, if you will, or live broadcasting, where you have to almost check um, the audio, uh, the words that are coming out of the speaker's mouth in order to know if what that person is saying is real or not. So that's you know audio recognition, and then of course there's video recognition to determine if it's a deep fake and other sorts of things. So that's, in audio and video, this is gonna take quite a bit of time. Um, so before I turn over the questions, this is uh, what I hope the key takeaways are for everyone, is that it's really gonna disrupt all four areas of media, content production, aggregation, distribution, and consumption. And through blockchain distribution, uh, sorry, through the disruption of blockchain, you're looking at new pricing models, um, you know, content bypassing aggregators and distributors. So, you know, the gatekeepers, if you will, of our modern day media infrastructure will be circumvented. Uh, this also, as I said earlier, you can create a media network that cannot be taken down. Um, now think about that. You know, if I'm broadcasting live and I'm NBC and something's happening, uh, and I have someone that I'm interviewing and for whatever reason, uh, they are something, saying something that's against FCC standards or against the principles of the network, I can just turn them off. Um, but through blockchain and distributed uh, streaming using IPFS and other technologies, there's just no way to take that media asset down. It's just going to be there because of how it's architected. Uh, royalty payments, monetization, um, the way we consume paid content is, is going to be very interesting. And there's a new group here. There's content brokers, content creators, aggregators, platform providers, and of course, um, performance rights organizations and so on. So uh, that's, uh, that's us in a nutshell. And Decentric Media, you know, our goal is to create a new architecture on how you build a media news network completely decentralized in its architecture, meaning no central offices, if you will, no um, $20 million studios that you would see, for example, uh, CNN and so on. Um, we're in a living in, a, in an era now where everything has to be decentralized in terms of the architecture of how you work. And uh, we're able to do this with cloud-based uh, technologies that allow us to switch in the cloud like a control room in the cloud, if you will. And the uh, and our subject matter hopefully will uh, resonate with everybody on this call and, and millions of other people worldwide as we uh, look to promote the adoption, uh, ultimately of 1 billion original crop, uh, crypto wallet holders by 2025. So uh, that was my presentation. I hope everyone liked it and I would love to get some questions. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Mark. Really appreciate it. This was great. Uh, Christina, I'll let you kind of kick it off. Sure. I hope our audience has lots of questions, but I, of course, want to dig into the AI and the sentiment and the NLP and the taxonomy side of it. What can you tell me about the data and the technology behind your projects? Um, 
I think the in terms of how we look at data, I think we look at data is is the way that uh, you know Brittany Kaiser, who's coming up in a few minutes, is on our board of advisors. She's a good friend, and and there's without question we look at the data of our users uh, and how we're going to architect that in our product is something that is theirs. It's it's their data. It's not ours. Um, they can share it with other members uh, of Decentric Media because Decentric will be a member-based organization as opposed to solely, um, uh, you know, having a revenue stream and being supported by advertising. So we look at uh, that as a way to move us beyond being subjugated to the outside influences that exist in traditional media. So anyone that has any sort of movement or activity on our platform, they'll be able to look at that and say, okay, this is what I've been doing on the Decentric Media platform, have a, in essence their own little portfolio of what that data is and take it with them and or share it with other third parties. Awesome. Um, so I'm gonna take it back a bit when I used to walk the halls of LA Times and I was helping them uh, go from a paper uh, to a digital platform, which was a very steep learning curve. And uh, shout out to the folks over there. They're still going and lots of changes. There's a certain level of, of institutional um, hallowed ground for journalism. Um, it's It seems to kind of, I, I'm curious on your thoughts about that. And then I have curious thoughts around turnkey solutions for the actual editorial process like it's a lot to get something published like that's a big process to try and like take apart and reassemble yeah it is I, i'm not sure exactly what uh so wh which uh how should i answer the question which which part of the question would you like me you to can take uh, it wherever you want i, I realize that i don't want to get too much into fake news kind of things but there is a level of authenticity that happens with sentiment and nlp and i just wonder what you think that does for journalism as a whole I'm not a big fan of sentiment in journalism. I think that uh, sentiment is great in social media because that's a that's the type of platform where you're expressing your feelings. Um, sentiment in journalism, from a user perspective, they can express how they feel about the article or about the video to the other people in the group, but the journalists themselves needs to stay neutral. Uh, and make a media asset that stands up to uh, scientific information and, and just basic facts, right? The, the problem has been that it's a tremendous amount of work to fact check. Um, Twitter was ignored for a, a very long time in the, in the beginning. And then they created a group there called Twitter TV and they did a tremendous job. And once Twitter TV was established, you started to see tweets on broadcast television. Like it just happened all of a sudden. It was several years into the existence of Twitter. And, um, you know, at that point they were using Twitter as a, as a source. How can you do that? Like Twitter is a self publishing platform. You can't really, there's no way to actually check that source of information without in essence having a, uh, an interconnected blockchain driven global database of facts that's tied to one another in some way and in distributed architecture. So, you know, uh, I think that the news industry as a whole is ripe for disruption. Uh, it's, it's still, as you pointed out, the transition from a print publication to a digital publication, that took 20 years. And it shouldn't have. It should have taken two years. And what happened as a result was instead of um, that transition happening quickly for legacy organizations, you saw new news media organizations come uh, and, and start to exist. I mean, CNET, we were brand new. I mean, nobody knew what we were doing and we were reporting on all the cool stuff, all the tech. So, um, you know, I, th I think that's it. It's just like, it's out with the old and in with the new. You know, Cheddar's been doing a great job. Newsy's doing a good job. Um, there are some terrific organizations out there that are brand new media channels that are still taking the fundamental principles of the formats of linear broadcast, for example, um, and, and just doing it in a new way. 
uh, we look to, to do it in a, uh, in a very forward thinking way. Oh, I see we have someone else coming up. So someone else come up. Yeah. You know, just one point, I just wanted to agree with you um, in terms of sentiment around journalism, what we're most interested in because we, uh, you know, have a strong NLP presence um, and some of the things that we're doing internally on our exploratory research side of things is yeah, definitely a lot on Twitter and some of the forums um, and that kind of first person voice of people that are just giving their opinions and you can tie that to an emotion and categorize it and all that stuff. Um, we're most interested in somebody publishes an article, like what are the comments and what are the reactions to that piece particularly, because I agree journalistically, uh, it should be uh, very neutral in terms of the sentiment from that author. So 100% agree. And then for us, it's really categorizing like who are the trusted players and the distribution partners uh, and the publishers that you can actually trust, right? Which is also tough as well, um, because you know they tend to publish fake news sometimes without even knowing it sometimes, where they're just kind of republishing. So that becomes an eternal challenge. And that's why uh, we're, we're definitely trying to crack that that net open. It's just going to be very difficult uh, over time. But I think a lot of people are definitely trying it as well. Rule of thumb is don't trust anything um, unless you experience it yourself. And yeah. when you talk about, you know, looking at the comments and looking at the tweets and the reactions from the audience, you have to understand that there are um, very powerful groups out there that have social farms that are flooding comments on uh, a news events to influence the change in the narrative of that story and to ruin your data collection. So, you know, you might put the most wonderful thing up in the world that you know, is, is something that you would think that everyone could get behind, like peace and love, but you'll have a thousand comments about how peace and love is bullshit. And that's coming from a social farm in Indiana and it's sponsored by X PAC right, that has a, a corporate reason why they don't want that narrative to be out there. So, you know, it, it's, I think that everyone on the call, the best piece of advice I can give you is don't consume media, study it. Love it. Great message. Thank you, Mark, uh, as right. always, for joining us. Um, Thank you. Stuff, so we'll talk to you soon. Absolutely. Had a great time. Appreciate it. All right. Coming up next is uh, something that I think a lot of people have been waiting for. Um, you know, this is uh, Nick Sapinaro from Divi uh, talking about mastering masternodes, as uh, everybody probably already knows. Um, Divi is uh, one of the top couple uh, masternode projects in the space, in the crypto space. We're huge fans of everything they're doing. They've had a tremendous growth, a lot of which is just organic because uh, Nick just has uh, this great presence and is a great representative of Divi. He's out there everywhere uh, preaching the gospel of blockchain and uh, master nodes and uh, all the stuff that they're doing is really exciting. So with that said, Nick, I'm going to pass it over to you. And thanks again for joining us. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you for that uh, wonderful intro. I wish I could take full credit for our recent success, but uh, it, it really is a testament to our entire team. And um, it is, it's been mind boggling to me that, that we've seen this kind of growth uh, with basically no marketing, it's all just organic grassroots uh, development. So um, thank you, though, for, for saying that. And I'm really excited to be here to speak to everyone today about masternodes. Masternodes to me are, are probably one of the most uh, important features of building our network. Uh, and we will talk about that a lot today. Um, let me get my screen share rolling here. So... Um, as Jeremy introduced, I'm Nick Safanero. I am the Chief Information Officer of the Divi Project, which is a cryptocurrency and blockchain startup that is aimed at making, earning, transacting, and spending cryptocurrency accessible to everyone worldwide. Today, we'll be talking about masternodes and the importance of earning a passive or active income in a recession. And before we get into masternodes and all the blockchain stuff, I just want to give a little precursor on exactly what a recession is. I think there's probably a lot of misconceptions about exactly what a recession is. Uh, and let's clarify that, right? So if you look at a textbook answer, it'll say, you know, it's a short term, usually a two or three month decline in an economy. But there are so many things that lead up to the recession that signal that it's going to happen. Um, and one of the most clear and usually earliest indicators of that is the yield curve inversion, 
And really that just means long-term debt instruments are yielding uh, lower returns than short-term debt instruments, uh, which damages investor confidence um, and creates all sorts of interest rate um, cuts and hikes depending on the length of the debt instrument. Um, of course, unemployment is a huge uh, factor in a recession. We've seen 22 million Americans unemployed over the past few months. A lot of people say that that is due to COVID-19. Uh, I disagree. I think COVID-19 was probably a catalyst um, and definitely obviously unemployed more people than uh, would have been unemployed potentially, but nevertheless, not the only cause. Um, we've already saw, you know, stagnating middle-class incomes. In fact, a lot of people think the middle class is disappearing. Um, that is a huge factor in how recessions start to develop. We've, we've, we're starting to see contracting GDP. I think it was JP Morgan Chase, uh, or maybe it was Goldman Sachs, one of the big firms, thinks that we'll see like a 32% uh, reduction in GDP over the next couple of years, which is actually very, very significant um, and will cause a worldwide recession, not just a US recession. Uh, we're we saw a lot of stock market volatility, right? In the beginning of um, the pandemic starting, there was a ton of, of volatility and now it's, it's booming because of several factors. Um, one of which is printing trillions of dollars and pumping it into those markets. Um, and, and you have to understand like the, the stock market is soaring right now artificially. It, it is partially the, the trillions of dollars of sti stimulus money, some of which is going into the stock market um, and, and long-term equities and things like that. Um, but there's also this retail boom going on right now, somewhat spearheaded by apps like Robinhood, which are allowing Main Street investors, retail investors to trade what are called CFDs, which are not actual ownership of stocks, but really just contracts. Um, and they're allowing people to trade on margin and it's incredibly dangerous. Um, and it's going to cause a lot more volatility in the long term, um, even though a lot of people are making money right now. That's kind of, it's actually a lot like the 2017 bull run in crypto. You could throw your money almost at anything and it would return a massive profit for you. Seeing companies like Hertz, which are bankrupt, pumping in the stock market is a huge indicator of uh, an inflated and artificial market. Um, the trillions, of course, going to other things uh, like uh, outside of just payroll and things that actually influence the economy. I mean, yeah, they gave everyone uh, who makes less than 100K, 1200 bucks, but that's not really a major influence on the economy. They also sent billions of dollars to a bunch of dead people. We won't talk about that too much, though. <laughs> Oil prices went negative a couple of months ago, uh, which is, again, a huge indicator that something is wrong. And it's all just consumed by this massive worldwide pandemic. It's not a great current state of affairs, especially when you start to look at historic information, right? So you have uh, unemployment at the highest level since the Great Recession. Um, even in the Great Depression, you know, in the, in the early part of this chart here, where it was, you know, 23 or 24%, a lot of those people that were considered to be unemployed were actually doing what are called make work jobs, which is basically a job that the government provides that was uh, assisting in whatever uh, rationing or, you know, um, supplying things to uh, soldiers or what have you. Um, they were still working technically, but they were considered unemployed. So I, I'm guessing that the number of unemployed people right now, which is around 22 million. It might have gone down actually a little bit since some economies are reopening. Regardless, it's probably somewhat close to what it was during the Great Depression. Um, and even before all of this was happening, we had this, as I mentioned before, declining or disappearing middle class. Most people in this country were un are unable to afford an unexpected bill of $400. $400 could literally bankrupt the average person. Um, that's, that's a long-term effect that we're not going to, going to see until the recession is really, really uh, affecting the economy, but that is still looming in the background. Now we are starting to see some of the economies, state economies reopening. 
and we already are seeing some better employment numbers, but we're not seeing an instant recovery necessarily in the economies. I mean, a lot of companies are still filing for bankruptcy, restructuring their organizations and getting rid of a lot of people to try to prepare for the essentially the inevitable uh, what's coming. And we're also seeing a major change in the way that we live and work. So we already have seen that automation is basically a guarantee. <laughs> you know, the, the sort of manual jobs or, or um, jobs in, in warehouses, even driving trucks and things of that nature are probably going to be the first to be fully automated. We already have self-driving cars um, and they're working on self-driving um, freight. So we'll probably see those jobs disappearing and those are the middle class jobs. Um, and now we're also seeing a change in our society where we're working from home. I mean, most companies right now are, are still remote. I can tell you that most major organizations will stay remote probably into uh, fall, if not into 2021, uh, which says a lot, right? They're going to they're gonna be analyzing their uh, personnel and, and wondering how many of these people do we really need? There's a lot of people that work specifically in these office buildings uh, that may or may not be necessary anymore, especially if these companies tend to trend towards uh, more remote working schedules. So we have to consider all these things. And we have to consider the fact that the Federal Reserve is just printing absurd amounts of money out of thin air. Uh, <laughs> and it's it, it is scary, right? Um, it's just propping up and prolonging what has been coming for a really long time. And if, if we follow the trend, the historic trend of recessions, we are in one now, right? Even if it's the textbook answer, it's been two or three months of decline. But if you go back to uh, the 2008, the Great Recession, the yield curve inverted in 2006. And it took a while for obviously what happened in 2008 to happen, but they did similar things where they were trying to pump the uh, stimulus money into the markets, into long-term bonds and things like that. And it doesn't work. It works in the short term, but eventually you can only print yourself out of trouble for so long before it catches up with you. So is it, is it all doom and gloom? Are we just screwed? I don't think so. Um, I'm a realist, right? But I, I do have a sense of optimism. And I believe that we basically have a couple of choices. You can rely on them to keep sending us $1,200 checks or printing money or pretending that they're helping us, or you can rely on yourself. And I think a sense of self-reliance is really important, especially at this time in our history. And I think that even before all of COVID and all of the uh, recession indicators, we were starting to see a trend toward self-reliance or at least partial self-reliance, right? If you look at the gig economy. The gig economy is still pretty massive. 57 million American workers were participating in the gig economy before COVID. And it's probably a similar amount now. Maybe more people are going to things like Fiverr, Upwork and things of that nature. But Grubhub, Lyft, Uber, TaskRabbit, all these things allowed people to take control of their schedule, of earning their money, kind of write their own check to some extent. And that level of adoption is really encouraging to me as somebody who creates software that enables individuals to take control of their finance, because it shows that people do care about and understand that they can do this alone. And people are starting to realize how valuable their time is. If I work at a company, you know, five days a week, 40 hours a week, am I getting all of the value out of that company that I can? And I'm not just talking about money it's your freedom it's your happiness it's the way that you live your lifestyle right why are we trading all of this time for an income that doesn't provide all the full scope of lifestyle that we deserve and want and we're also seeing more and more entrepreneurs a lot of people you know they do gravitate toward the gig economy but a lot of people try to start their own business as well you have shark tank really influencing people to try to get their own businesses off the ground. But unfortunately, a lot of people really aren't cut out to be entrepreneurs. Being an entrepreneur means more than 40 hours a week, trust me. Uh, it means dealing with all of the problems that your boss and your boss's boss and his boss's boss deal with all yourself. There are a lot of caveats to being your own boss. So 
not everybody does well at that. And only about 3% of people who start their own business succeed. So that's why it's so important to look at forms of passive or active income. And there is a big difference. There's a reason I've crossed out passive here because there are very few actual forms of passive income. I'm going to explain the difference. So passive income is where you have no material participation in the business whatsoever. Um, you, like a, a rental property, for example, all you did was provide a space for people to live. They kind of live there. Um, and even then, sometimes you have to you know, replace the water heater and things of that nature. Passive income is really what investors do. They just give money to entrepreneurs and their hands off. Most things are active income where you actually do have some material participation in the business. Um, and that could be as uh, small as running software like a Bitcoin miner um, or a masternode. So in the crypto economy, there are several ways of making income, some passive, some active, and some just directly basically working. One that is essentially working would be trading. And I'm not trying to deter anyone from trading. If you're already a trader, more power to you. I'm not a trader. I'm a guy that just likes to buy and hold and, and you know, invest in good projects. Trading can be incredibly difficult. You're, you're competing against some of the most complex quant algorithms on earth, high frequency trading bots and things of that nature. If you're just sitting at your computer trying to make trades up and down or, or time the market, you might do okay, um, but it's, it's, it's more akin to gambling that way if you're, not, if you're not like programming really high tech bots. Mining is another way that you can earn money with crypto. The investment is kind of high initially. You have to purchase a bunch of hardware and you have to maintain that hardware. It can be complex and the hardware does tend to um, go into obsolescence pretty quickly. I think you guys can correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's like every six months or something, uh, the Bitcoin miners have to swap out their hardware, which can be kind of a big deal and it's expensive. In my opinion, the best way to earn um, active income with crypto is staking and with masternodes. Staking is essentially running, uh, running a program that contributes blocks to the blockchain. Um, so it's doing the same thing as mining, where it's basically trying to solve a complex uh, hashing algorithm. Um, and instead of running a um, hardware machine, you're running... Uh, you're just basically allocating funds to the network. You're not really running any hardware. You do have to have a computer, of course, uh, but it doesn't require a massive investment in you know, mining equipment, upgrading that equipment, et cetera. You just basically put your money into the system and let the computer do the work for you. It's pretty hands-off and it can be run on pretty much any server, Raspberry Pi, Air, uh, MacBook Air, whatever. Um, and masternodes are the same way. But instead of adding blocks to the chain, they're validating the transactions in those blocks. I'll go a little bit deeper now, since this is a masternode presentation, into exactly what masternodes are and how they function. Um, so it's very simple. Masternodes are just a full node carrying a copy of the blockchain that verify and secure the network's transactions. Um, it, I'll break it down a little further, right? So somebody, let's call her Alice, requests a transaction that transaction is broadcast to the network and the staking nodes are basically the ones that get it first. Um, they essentially uh, de determine whether or not that transaction should go into the chain and they send it to the master nodes who validate the transaction. Uh, it's like a second layer of, of validation essentially. And once it's verified, all of the transactions in that block go into the blockchain and that's how blockchains work. It's uh, pretty simple. And really all you need to know is this part here <laughs> at the beginning and this part here at the end. And if you feel like this guy, it's okay. Most of us do when we first learn about this stuff. I mean, I'm still learning every single day, new things about this industry. You can never really be fully caught up. All you need to know is that masternodes are programs. And what they do is you allocate your money to it, it runs in the cloud or on your PC, and you make money from it. Why would you do this? Why would you run a masternode? 
It's a way to support your favorite crypto or blockchain networks and earn active income for doing so. Very, very easy way to earn rewards. So if it's that easy, why is everyone not doing this? Well, it's not that easy. <laughs> In the past, masternodes have been incredibly difficult to set up. Even for developers like myself, it can take hours and hours of sifting through outdated documentation and trying to get servers configured in the, just the right way in order to get your masternode running. I mean, even some of the biggest coins in the ecosystem warn people that it can be hard work. If you don't know Putty and Linux, you shouldn't even try. You know, take into consideration all of the difficulties and then maybe you could think about possibly, <laughs> it's not really accessible to the average person is my point, which is why we created our system which is essentially a one-click masternode. And this video will take you through exactly how it works in our wallet. You just click the button. As long as you have enough funds in the wallet, you can subscribe via PayPal or your credit card, which our friend here is going to do for you. Once you are logged in and pay, it's a monthly subscription of 10 or $15, depending on the level of masternode that you deploy. All you have to do is name your node, which he's not very creative. He just called it copper node setup. That's it. You click the button and it deploys in the cloud for you. It takes about 15 minutes after you click the button and then you can start earning crypto from there on out. Sounds really awesome, right? And I would totally love to recommend that you buy Divi and get into our ecosystem. We'd love to have you as part of our community, but I really do recommend that you do your own research and while you do so, you focus on the fundamental basis of each of these coins that you're researching. I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about how I make my determinations on which coins to invest in. And you can take that and, and kind of build your own strategy based on that. The first thing you have to look at is the team. Is the team anonymous and behind the shadows? Or are they active and public and going on Coin Genius Collective Intelligence to tell you about their projects? Uh, do they have a community, right? Is it active and welcoming or is it just a bunch of bots chatting with one another ad nauseum? You wanna make sure that you talk to people in that community, not the admins, not the team members, but the actual individuals who are using the software because they can tell you everything you need to know usually about what that project is and how, how it works. Do they have a, a real advisory board? I don't know if you guys remember this, if you guys have been around since 2017, 2018, since that era, you may have seen this hilarious ICO. This was a real ICO that used Ryan Gosling's face as one of their advisors and just renamed the guy. Uh, hilarious, right? But you, if you see that, you know that project's BS. Find a team that has real advisors who are actually contributing value. And it's not just a name on their website to make them look like they have clout. Communication is huge for me, right? If they're reaching out consistently, uh, on a weekly or at least a monthly basis through blogs, videos, going on podcasts, those types of things, and actually giving updates on what's happening in the company or the project, that's a big deal. A history of success, especially in this industry, can tell you a lot about whether or not this project has the legs to survive, right? The bear market of 2017 wiped out 92% of the market, maybe more. Most of those projects are defunct, failed, gone, Maybe the community has picked it up or whatever, but they're for the most part dead. And you can go on deadcoins.com or one of those sites to see how many of those projects failed. If you made it out of that, if you're a project that started in 2017 or even before that, and you're still around and you're still growing, that's probably an indication that you're going to go the distance. And you can check how much progress is actually being made with these projects because most of them are open source. If you go on their GitHub, how many times is their GitHub been updated recently. How many projects are they actively working on? Now, this doesn't tell you everything you need to know about their development progress, because a lot of teams do end up doing things in private. Um, but at the same time, it is a big deal. Sometimes they'll have a roadmap on their website as well if they're doing private development. Okay, now once you're through all of that, what does this project actually do? Does it have a real utility or purpose? And why does it have this purpose? Is that a real business case? or a real use case, or is it just another money grab? I see a lot of projects recently 
coming out and, and they have these amazing concepts and ideas, but there's nothing really tangible about it. And there's definitely no business case. It's just kind of like a, a cool idea that's sort of in the early stages of development. So you want to look for those things as well. And once you determine all of those things and you feel confident, then you can ask yourself, how am I getting my money back? What's the potential ROI? And if I do get the money back, is it real money? Is it real crypto coming back to me? Or is it just on paper? I'm now a millionaire and I can go and pretend that I'm, I'm rich. You want to make sure that the profits are liquid and real. Um, how much time do we have? Like, okay. Um, so we are running slightly low on time. Uh, I could go through a Q and A if that's wanted, um, or I can uh, keep going. You guys tell me. I can't actually. You, you can keep going. You have eight minutes. Um, okay. If you still have more content to get through. We can save maybe the last few minutes for Q&A. Okay. Well, I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, what we're doing at Divi then, if that's cool. Um, you know, one of the biggest deals for us as a company is creating world-class hybrid cryptocurrency opportunities for people. Um, and it's not just about crypto, right? It's a hybrid ecosystem. What does that mean? What we aim to do and what we are doing is to consolidate the value chain of all digital finance. So that means you should be able to buy and sell Bitcoin as well as store fiat currencies and send them all over the world, as well as set up master nodes and stake and do all the things that make crypto the beautiful opportunity that it is. So what we've done is we've created uh, basically a fintech arm of our project. In uh, the early part of, or the late part of 2019, we purchased a fintech operation that was at the time a remittance company. Um, and with our investment, we were able to, to turn that company into a, um, basically a fully fledged, we can't say bank, <laughs> but it, it basically is an, uh, an organization that can issue international bank account numbers, debit cards, um, and facilitate the funds, uh, the transfer of funds worldwide. Um, and that also means that we can operate an exchange all within this one beautiful user experience. Um, so that's kind of what I've been working on for the past year or so, um, is this what we call Divi Pay application. Uh, when this launches, you'll actually have the opportunity to associate your name with your address. Uh, if you choose, you don't have to. Um, you can associate a picture with it, uh, your email if you like, pretty much any of the normal metadata that exists in your typical internet accounts can be associated with your address. What this does for you is allows you to easily transition between any of our software products, whether that be the desktop or mobile wallet or anything that comes out there uh, moving forward, but it also allows you to easily search your friends, um, send money to them without having to deal with, you know, the addresses, um, longs of strings of numbers and letters, um, and have more of like a, a PayPal experience. Um, I actually did have a, a screenshot up, but I lost it. No worries. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's basically what we've been working on building over the past year. Because as I said during my presentation, it's really important for especially masternode coins to have a use case. It, a lot of the masternode coins have died because they were just basically Ponzi schemes. They, you know, only did one thing, which was create more coins. And until you have more people to buy those coins, it just becomes uh, a, basically a Ponzi scheme in the making. We were and are committed to not having that happen. And we've seen that we already have a lot of use cases on online in the physical world. Um, and we believe that more will come online as we integrate this hybrid infrastructure. Well, Coin Genius would agree with you on that. We've been watching you guys in the market. And uh, before our head of market research uh, knew who Divi was, he was like, so I checked out all the master node coins and the top two performers are this thing called Dash and DIVI. And we're like, that's Divi. <laughs> so we we're like, is are getting this like organic traffic because of because of the use case? It, it really is amazing. You know, for me, I look at it as a Darwinian science observer of like, all right, it's you know, you either you either live or die on the beach. You know, so yeah. it's great to see you guys thriving. 
Thank you. Means a lot. Nick, well done, sir. As always. Thank you, sir. Thank yep. you for having me, man. I really appreciate yeah. the opportunity. Yeah, for sure. Well, if anybody has any other questions, uh, please let Nick know. Nick, uh, I don't know if you shared this already, but uh, where can people get a hold of you? Where should they follow Divi? Yeah, um, come join us. All our social medias are just at Divi Project, including Telegram. If you want to reach out to me specifically, you can find me on Telegram or on Twitter at NSAP Productions. Awesome. Well, with that said, we'll go ahead and pivot to the next one. Thanks again for all the support and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Nick. See you. Thank you. All right, Jeremy Bourne, up next we yes. have our sponsor, Joff Paradise, and he is going to be talking uh, about uh, quite a few things, not only the Cryptomatic ATM, uh, but also the past, present, and future, uh, yep. and the four laws of success. That is correct. Let's see here. I'm trying to pull this up here. Got too many things open, apparently. There he is. How Hello, you doing, Joff? Good to see you, sir. Is he on mute? Unmute. There we go. Oh. There we are. <laughs> good to see everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever everyone is today. Thanks for tuning in. Absolutely. Well, uh, thanks for, for having me on. Know, uh, Joff uh, is also part of uh, Cryptomatic ATM, um, and they're one of our uh, top sponsors here for the Collective Intelligence Summit. So thank you again for the sponsorship um, on that end of things and for contributing to today's topic. Uh, Joff is a, you know, I'm not going to take away his thunder once again, but he's a very successful entrepreneur, has done a lot in the space very early into blockchain and crypto. We call him a crypto OG, as you'll hear from him. Um, and he's learned a lot around, along the way, and uh, especially in terms of uh, success and what it really takes to actually create successful companies and, and do right by your customers and your partners. So he's going to talk about, you know, crypto ATMs, the past, present and future and the four laws of success. And with that, Joff, uh, if you'd like me to, I can go ahead and start sharing that video. Sure, please. Okay. You know, I have to say, and I have to admit that success comes with some fear, uh, you know, especially in the cryptocurrency world because it's so volatile. And people tell me all the time, aren't you afraid that it's going to crash? You know, I don't look at it that way. I look at it what it was a year ago and what it was, what it was when I got in in 2010. And I see nothing but greatness, and, but I educate myself on, on this. So is there a fear? I do have fear. I, I think all successful people should have fear. As a matter of fact, one of my quotes is, if your dream doesn't scare you, then your dream's not big enough. Your dream should scare you. It scares me, but I go every day and take action to make my dreams come true. You can too. I'm Joff Paradise. We will see you where? At the top. There we are. Hey, uh, again, thanks for all the hard work and effort everyone's putting in on this amazing event, this virtual event that we're having with Coin Genius. And I, again, want to say how much I appreciate you inviting me to be a speaker and also to even think of us uh, over at Cryptomatic to be one of the uh, sponsors of this amazing event. Uh, well, let me start with, I'll share my screen here if I can for just a, a couple of minutes. Uh, I have to talk with all of you and I'm, I'm looking forward to it. They asked me to say a little bit about me. And when I do that, I wanna talk about the laws of success. See, there are, what I have found there, there are four laws of success. And, you know, when I get into my, what I've done and what I've been through in my, my lifetime, uh, we're gonna talk about a few things. You know, the four principles isn't taught in school. I don't think anyone uh, learns this, but you have to learn it the hard way. You know, it, you have to have courage, you have to fail, and the courage comes in when you have to keep picking yourselves up and keep going. You know, 
I started as a, in a very young in uh, the entrepreneurial world. I was about 14 years old. Uh, and I fast forward all the way up to having multiple businesses, selling and buying, uh, selling businesses throughout my life. Uh, in 2007 through 2000, well, in 99 through 2010, I had acquired 10 fitness centers, three casinos, two restaurants, a bar, a coffee shop, and a telecommunications company. Prior to that, uh, when I was about, when I was in college, and when I was 24 years old, uh, the company came in and asked me, and I, I had been through multiple failures, and I'm sure that people will tell you, uh, any successful person will tell you that they've had to fail more times than they've succeeded. It's the home runs that really count. So, uh, you know, what I want to talk about is to never, never give up also. But when I was 24, uh, I sold a, a swimwear company to a big headline swimwear company called Venus Swimwear. I had Paradise Swimwear. And by the time I was 28, four years, fast cars, fast lifestyle, fast women, I was broke. B-R-O-K-E broke and uh, had to start over again. And it's because of the things that I wasn't taught uh, in school and because I, I had failed to do the number one thing we talk about is how to make money. And, and, and a lot of us out there know how to do that, don't we? I could say a lot of you out there, uh, I think you have to make money to survive. Wouldn't you say to be truly successful, to travel, if you like to travel, to have success in your life, uh, to pay the bills, to buy the things that you want, not to get on credit, uh, to be financially free, you need to know how to make money. And, and, and then number two uh, is learning how to keep it. Now, I knew how to make it, and I still know how to make it, but a lot of people aren't taught number two, and that's how to keep your money. So the next, the sec first law of success is learning how to make money. The second law is learning how to keep the money. How do you actually keep it? And then we go into the third law, and that's how to increase it. How do you keep your money and keep make your money, make more money? So instead of you working for your money, now your money's working for you. It doesn't, it doesn't take a day off. It doesn't get sick. It doesn't ask for a raise. You're actually talking about having a residual income that works for you instead of you working for it. And then, of course, number four. And number four is very important, and it's giving back. And you know, when I had acquired all of these fitness centers and everything, I always believed in, and still today believe that if you don't give back, uh, you're not going to be truly, truly successful. And that's pretty much where I'm at in, in my life today is I like to give back. I want to talk to uh, all of you, uh, not only about the laws and principles, but about how you go through your life and, and giving back. Now, what is giving back? Does that mean that you have to take 10% and give to the church or your tithing. If you believe that, yes, I like, to, I like to have that in my life. I like to have religion, but also what is giving back? It's learning these four laws and these four principles, if you will, and giving that back to others. If you learn how to make money, you learn how to keep money, you learn how to make it more, what else is there? It's actually to give back. So the, the true basis is, is learning how to give that value back and take control of your success teaching your children. Today, uh, I have eight children. I have four girls and four boys. I'm very blessed in my life. And with this, I've also taught to them and taught them about how to uh, do these four principles. And it's very important. And through Bitcoin and blockchain technology and NTFs and all this stuff, the, the kids are really catching on. I think NTFs are going to be huge in the gaming industry. Um, and that's where my kids come in. But one of the cool things is that uh, they have learned how to not only keep it, but to make it grow. And they love watching, I, they all have wallets. They all have their, their wallets, yes, they do. And they, uh, they watch Bitcoin. And, and when this pandemic or scandemic, scamdemic or plandemic, whatever you wanna call it came about, uh, they asked me, dad, uh, you know, am I going to do, am I going to make this? Cause we made a deal with them uh, that they get for A's, they get X amount of Bitcoin every quarter. Uh, and at the end of the year, they'll, they'll have, a, a, you know, two Bitcoin or more. And that's, you know, depending on what grade they're in and level. And they called me up and wanted to know, we still got that same deal. I'm doing online school. And I'm like, well, is it harder or easier? And they're, you know, but that's another story. Um, but we, we teach them. And then, of course, giving back and sharing their experiences. You know, um, my oldest, 
all of my oldest kids can today pretty much tell you all the things that, that I just said. And, and they follow me or they, they follow the roads to success. They follow those experiences. And I remember when uh, was, my wife was driving in the car with one of my boys and uh, he started talking about Bitcoin and sharing his experiencing and showing his wallet on his phone. Uh, so, you know, it's just, it's, it's phenomenal that when you do these things to see it come full circle, how to use the wallets. There's, there's hot wallets and cold wallets. Of course, the best thing is to have is a cold wallet, cold storage, uh, you know, keeping uh, your wallets safe and your security and your keys uh, safe. Uh, so if you don't know, you know, you can follow me if you want to know more of those laws and more in depth and, and some more of the teachings that we do at jockparadise.com. We're happy to do that. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. I think we're on about 133 social media sites. So now let's, let's roll into something else that I have planned for us. Um, let's do, um, let's talk about the Cryptomatic. And, you know, I, I'm a, a shareholder and founder of the company Cryptomatic. And now it's a, it's a big company. And we have a factory that's based out of Ukraine. Uh, that's, that's uh, all shareholders, of course. And we've done uh, 1600 different types of vending machines The the, Factory's been in business for 15 years. Um, I just met them about three years ago and got in involved with them and uh, got them to, they were basically, Patrick Dolphner uh, is the CEO and director of the companies there. And uh, he, and we started talking and he comes from a, they come from a background of actually doing ATM, traditional ATM machines. And so they've been doing that for a number of years. And that's where we got into doing the cryptocurrency ATM uh, machines. You know, the history of Bitcoin, you know, a, a lot of you know that it's, you know, it's, it's been sporadic up and down, uh, but I have always seen it as a, an incline and in going up. Uh, I, I saw, I got into Bitcoin around 2000, ladder of 2010. I wait, I paid way too much. Uh, at that time, I was around a dollar 90 I paid. Uh, I was very upset actually at the time that I paid a little too much, but uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm very happy uh, later on in life. And then uh, when I was going through this transition from selling my fitness centers, I uh, ran into the guys that were buying it and they, it was a publicly traded company that were buying all the, the fitness clubs and they had a forensics accounting to come in and the guy told me about Bitcoin and crypto and said, we'll give you a little bit. I took a little bit. Uh, I wish I would have taken a lot more, uh, but um, that's where I got into it. And then unfortunately in 2011, the very last day, December 31st, I was on a motorcycle, uh, my Harley, I was on the way home and uh, an 80 year old man on a cell phone didn't see me and ran me over. Uh, the results of that accident was that I lost my left leg. I have a plate, a rod, 18 screws and two plates, uh, died twice, got a complete right knee replacement, 47 surgeries and procedures, RFAs, you know, epidurals, all on my neck and spine. And uh, in 2000, that went from 2012 to two, uh, January 7th, my leg was amputated. So that went from in 2012. And then I went into 2000, all the way into 2014. I was on about 21 prescription medications. I, I, I was uh, 310 pounds and uh, I was going back to that grade really. And then I, and what happened was I, I got off all that stuff. I today take zero prescription medication. Um, I had a you know, severe brain trauma. Uh, that six doctors said I'd never walk again uh, after 91 days of sitting and trying to, to figure things out and uh, getting out of the hospital. And then I went into uh, rehab or rehabilitation and, and physical therapy and uh, went into speech therapy, learning to, to speak again. Uh, I, was, I would stutter really badly back then. And this took me all the way to 2014. And finally, I realized that I need to get off those pharmaceuticals and get on those nutraceuticals. And that's exactly what I did. And so today I take a nutraceutical or uh, some people might they say it's a vitamin, but it's more than that. And then I also uh, do stem cell and some other crazy stuff that people uh, see this paradigm shifts happening now in the world. And one of them is the medical, one of them's energy. Uh, we're going for the green, clean energy. That's a paradigm shift that's happening. The metal industry, medical industry is going from Western society medicine over to uh, uh, tradition from traditional Western society medicine into functional medicine, uh, finding out instead of treating the, the symptom, we're, we're trying to treat the cause. 
so you see these paradigm shifts happening. And of course, our financial industry is going through a paradigm shift. Thank goodness for Bitcoin uh, and cryptocurrency and blockchain and all this wonderful stuff. So anyway, I got up all that, lost all the weight, got off of all the, the pharmaceuticals and uh, and got really heavily immersed in the cryptocurrency world. And that's what led me into from going from mining and I still do trading. I still love following all the top traders, love being involved in the trading uh, uh, talks yesterday with all those guys, it was great. Um, you know, so, uh, and then of course now we're into the ATM business, but I do multiple different companies. I invest, I, I love the shark tank idea, the approach that we had the other day. Uh, yeah, it was really cool. So the history of Bitcoin, that's the history for me. I think all of you here know what the history of Bitcoin is. In January 12th, Bitcoin, uh, you know, 2009 exchanged uh, the first Bitcoin. And then I can read all this to you. And I'm sure all you guys got all this down. If you want these decks, just let me know. I can send it to you. October 29, uh, uh, 2013, uh, RoboCoin was that supposedly the first ATM machine, uh, it's a Wells coffee shop out of Vancouver, uh, that was believed to be the first transaction in an ATM machine. Today we have more than 7,000, right now we're about 8,000 around the world. Uh, ATMs, you can go to Coin Radar or Coin ATM Radar and see, uh, they're not, all the ATMs are not there, but most of them are there. If you list, uh, if you have an ATM and you list with them, then the and they will put it there only if it's live with pictures and it's actually online and they can uh, verify that. So we have several ATM machines around the world. Uh, keep in mind that Cryptomatic ATM, JP Technologies and the rest of our companies, we, can, we do private label for some of the larger manufacturing companies, or they say they're manufacturers, uh, but we're the actual manufacturer. But today you have about 10 top operators operating about 3,500 crypto ATMs, uh, 550 other operators for, that's the total of around 7,000, as you can see. Um, this will give you a little bit of an idea of where they're coming from, what sources, here's Cryptomatic listed here on the bot, uh, what the sixth uh, top one. And then you go through producers, the market, how much the market that they're sharing today, three top producers. And I, you know, I'm gonna get into some more about the ATMs here. Uh, you know, if you're looking to do something uh, now, you know, most of your machines are out there, or most of your units out there are running. If you'll look around and you can go to crypto, uh, the, the coin radar, coin ATM radar, and they will tell you if you click on the producers, what they're selling their ATMs at. Uh, ours started around 500 for beginners. Um, wrapping up on this one, I'm gonna go to another slide real quick hey, to show you some things. Here's some uh, hey, hey, here's Joff, website. I'm just gonna let yeah. you know that we can't see you switching your slides. It's still on joffparadise.com. Oh man, wow. Okay, let me stop and let me try this again. I'm glad you told me. There we go. Uh, Maybe if you go back to one, the last slide, and then uh, so we can see that, and then go on to this one. Yeah, now it's not. Let me one second. Well, okay. Let's try this again. So I'm so sorry. Technical issues here. I was buzzing through those slides like crazy. <laughs> How about now? There they, there they are. There we go. Okay. So we, you know, I, I buzzed through these real quick. I was so I, I apologize that I didn't see if you guys were seeing them. Um, I'm sure you're seeing them now. So, so everything that I covered, this is the ATMs, the market of the ATMs, starting at around 500. Uh, you know, there are, there are all types of, of solutions out there. We believe that the economy will support and people will need ATM machines to get cash uh, from, and other countries, you're, you know, some people think, uh, more narrow or, or smaller minded wise, as far as they, they live in their own world. And if you're in the United States, then you, you know, 
ATMs, I believe, will last a long time to get the dollar. They are gonna, you know, they're going to need it. Uh, but if you think about it, there are around 3 billion people today that don't have a bank account. Now, yes, uh, the digital banking is coming up better and better. Crypto uh, companies uh, are coming up with solutions for digital banking uh, that you can just do right over your phone, which is great. Uh, and then connect it to hopefully a debit card. I know of a few companies that I work with that do that uh, right now and invested in with a couple of companies uh, that, that are doing that. But you keep keep in mind that people are, are the cash will be around for a, a few more years, I, I, I suspect, and I think all of you do too. Um, so we're going to need a way to get it and get it through our crypto. So with a, you know, I, there, we have actual three way machines, which will do cash in, which means that you can use your cash inside the machine to buy different types of cryptocurrency, not just Bitcoin, because we all know Bitcoin one day is going to be as we hope, very large, and uh, you won't want to buy a bottle of water with it. Uh, and I hope you're not doing it even now. But regardless, uh, eventually, so you're wanting to use different cryptocurrencies. And then we have a cash out, which means that you can actually sell your crypto. And where, where does this come in at? Well, you know, all these money exchanges and any of you that's flown outside your country know that when you try to exchange your dollar the USD for, for euros or for pesos or for other, those companies charge you an outrageous amount. I know when I was in the US trying to, and I tried to, I went to an exchange uh, and used, had euros, they wanted 30%, literally 30% exchange rate. And I was like, wow, uh, no, thank you. I'll keep my euro. Um, but if you don't and you need that and you need to exchange it and you don't do it in the same, in the country, then, in you, you know, the ATM would be a, a perfect place for that. And then also think about transporting. If you're going to transport more than 10,000 USD, you're going to, you, you have to report it with cryptocurrency. There is nowhere to report it. Um, you carry it and that's that. And you go to an ATM machine and you can withdraw whatever cash you need. So the ATMs, are, I think, program will be around quite a long time. And then I want to talk uh, uh, really quickly about um, we have an affiliate program, our affiliate. So we have multiples, uh, multiple ways of getting started with an ATM machine. Uh, if you don't have, you know, the money or you don't have a location, but you want to, you know, get involved and you might know someone that will, well, then here you can refer a customer. This is not a network marketing, multi-level marketing, none of that stuff. It's actually a referral based program uh, that, you know, rewards you for referring uh, other businesses, local businesses, or referring friends or people that you might know that have uh, a nice little store that they want to get involved with um, doing cryptocurrency. We have quite a few around the world that are in like 7-Eleven uh, or uh, In-N-Out or different types of uh, little convenience stores. Uh, cell phone stores are really good. The aftermarket cell phone stores are great at that. I would think dispensaries would probably be a good place too, um, but I, I'm currently we're not in any dispensaries that I'm aware of. Um, and then we'll talk about um, also that one of the other things I'd like to share with you really quickly is our other program, and this is a this is a really fun program. Um, get back over here. Um, And this is the sharing program. And I like this program a lot uh, for, for multiple reasons. But if you look at this, you know, it's, is it worth starting a new business? Do you want to start a new business? What if you don't? What if you don't have the capital uh, to start the business? You know, uh, what if you don't have the licensing or the, the ability to license it uh, or manage? And, you know, crypto, have an ATM machine, it's pretty easy. You, pu you plug it in, you bring it up online. You have your, your uh, exchange account. It's in your name. It, it, Cryptomatic has nothing to do with your exchange. We just API it. And then, um, and, and that's pretty, and you have some cash. And then every time the machine gets full or needs, or, or, or it gets empty and you need to put cash in to give cash out, or you need to put, we have a bill recycler. So the actual, it recycles bills. So if someone buys 50 and sells 50, the bill just recycles. But let's say it gets full or gets empty and you need to to go to it and replace it so 
that's one of the things that you need to take in consideration. So we took that as, as in consideration at Cryptomatic and they came up with, the team came up with this amazing idea of actually sharing into uh, the profits or, or the actual uh, fees. And I have never seen, I've never even heard of an ATM company in the world or banking industry uh, or any of those guys sharing actually into to the fees. So we get requests, of course, every day uh, from people that don't uh, know the business, they don't have experience in it, they don't have the capital, or they don't even have the time. And so what we wanted to do is to, to share something with everyone that has the, the that don't have, that doesn't have the capital or simply just doesn't want the additional work, but would like to have a little passive income and share into this market. And so that's what we did. So what is ATM sharing? Uh, our sharing program, you can buy a package of an existing and working crypto ATM network. And our, our network par partners are, and you can buy this up to for like 36 months. So it's not a short term thing. It's a 36 month deal. Uh, purchase, you know, you can purchase Cryptomatic sharing packages for takes care of all the ins and outs. Cryptomatic will. Cryptomatic handles all the compliance. Cryptomatic completes ongoing maintenance, offers full control. You receive your money on a monthly payout of the profits. Contract duration is for 36 months and money back and minimum profit guarantee. Uh, that's pretty strong. You know, uh, they will actually put it in writing that you get. Uh, what you put in back, uh, offering to the clients anywhere from 5% to 10% transaction fee from sharing one, three, or 10 existing working ATMs for a period of 36 months. As we grow and our network grows of ATMs, of course, then this packages will grow. But as it is right now, Cryptomatic only offers these, the, they offer the four packages, but they're limited because they only have the networks right now that are, are participating, uh, Panama, Australia, US, and Eastern Europe. Uh, the, and we and US, we're offering two opportunities uh, in Miami and in New York at the moment. We're trying to open Texas now and Las Vegas just ordered a hundred machines. So uh, there are four packages and, and this deck, if you guys wanna you know, get into this a little heavier and wanna see, we, the, the, it, it has a really good breakdown to show you uh, payback and what, you know, how long it'll take and all that stuff. Um, today, we don't have the time to, to, to go deep into this, but you can start with the 5% at 500, 10% at a thousand and so on and so forth. Uh, talk about the profits and the examples um, that you'll get from the opportunity. So if you want this deck, you can make sure you contact uh, Cryptomatic and ask them for it. Uh, it tells you, it, it gives you a really good breakdown of uh, everything here. Um, I, love the, I love what they've done. I hope you will too. And uh, you'll participate with Cryptomatic in the future. Uh, there's a, the website right there on the bottom of the screen, as you can see. And it's coming up. Got a little bit of a lag, I think. Yeah, we see okay. it. All right, great. Well, that's pretty much what all I have to say in a nutshell for today. I kind of packed it in pretty quickly. I, uh, it, I wanted to leave a little time for questions. So if anybody does have any questions that they would like to, to share or ask, I'm here for that. Cool. It looks like uh, Rhonda, you might have a question. You can uh, unmute yourself, I believe. If you do. She has her hand raised here. Yeah, I was trying to say that I didn't, um, couldn't see the screen, but the sharing program, um, it starts only in Miami and New York for United States people, right? No, you can actually share any, you can pick any country you want to share. And that's the beauty of it. Uh, you, you don't have to be in the United States. You can say, hey, I want to share in Panama. I want a part of the shares of the ATMs over there in Australia. Uh, so no, no, uh, Ron, a great question, but yeah, you can, you can share wherever you want. Even if you own and you buy an ATM machine, you can share, even participate in the sharing program. So yep. you can have a network of, of five, 10 machines around the world. Yeah, I have friends in Hawaii that want to do it, but I don't think Hawaii's an option right now, right? For you. The, the logistic part of it, that, that's the Josh Lawler part, I think, or the, the, the legal team would have to answer that question. And Patrick has those guys to do all the logistics. 
um, I can I can make sure you get Patrick's number and um, okay. Uh, and if you go to cryptomaticatm.com, you can go right to the bottom of the screen, and they're very fast about uh, getting back to people. We have a, a, an entire marketing team. And uh, Patrick Dolphner is the actual director, and you can actually tell him you spoke with me on uh, on this amazing uh, event with Coin Genius uh, and the virtual uh, summit. And let Patrick know that we, you know, you saw me here and that you you want to talk to him personally. Okay, thank you. Sounds good. I've heard from uh, several people, including people that uh, are in my own family that have just overheard some of the things that we've been speaking about, that they're very interested in uh, crypto ATMs. I mean, a lot of people see this as a future. I mean, that's all I really talk about. They're kind of sick of it, to be honest with you. But, um, you know, they really understand the power of, um, you know, mailbox money, as they call it, like I said with Patrick yesterday, right? It's out of sight, out of mind. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, the most successful people in the world uh, have multiple revenue streams and income streams that they have coming in. They don't rely on just one thing. So uh, I think that this is a great way to be able to get the average person there. So thank you for uh, kind of creating this and giving people the opportunity to make some money on Bitcoin in a different way. Very welcome. And, you know, one, one of my sayings, and I want everyone to, to hear is that, you know, education will make you smart, going to school, getting those degrees, but self-education can make you rich. And, you know, that's that's exactly what you were saying, Jeremy, is people need to educate themselves and understand the system. Uh, if you don't want to get deep, deep involved, in it, but you still want to have some sort of passive income, this is a great way of doing it. You know, I asked the question the other day, if you had 100,000 or 100 million in the bank uh, in cash, would you actually sit on it right now? What, what would you do with that amount of cash, really? JP, I have a quick clarification question. From a data standpoint and kind of what Rhonda was asking, if you picture a heat map with the entire like globe there, is is in terms of all of your ATMs are all applicable, are they green across the entire globe or are there like regional situations we have to worry about here? Well, you know, with the, the um, I want to call it pandemic, but with the what's going on right now, uh, there are some, of course, businesses that the ATMs are in like casinos. And some of the casinos in different countries where the ATMs are, are not working because the casinos are shut down. Uh, so, and, and the same thing, you know, we're the very fortunate guys that are still operating right now. And we have quite a few operators that are still going, but those are the ones that put them in the grocery stores, the mailbox places, the cell phone places that are open, some aren't. And then of course the, the, the little convenience stores that are open. Um, so th those are the guys that are actually uh, profiting. Uh, I know we have 27 units in uh, Panama, and right now I, I believe that only nine are operating, uh, but those nine are actually in the network. So people are having having good deals with that. And then people are using them. Uh, I've seen, it's it, people ask me all the time, well, you know, why would, why would you sell an ATM that's cashless? Why would you guys have an ATM that has no cash whatsoever? What doesn't, can I just do that on my phone? And the, of course the answer is yes, you could just do it on your phone, but a lot of people don't have that convenience. They don't have that education. So we offer a small little tabletop unit for $649 that you get a profit of every month. And you don't want, you, you plug it in, you put it on the internet and it's done. All the rest of the maintenance is ready. It's mm -hmm. done, you know, and you get a commission every month. So, Joff, unfortunately, we have to end this. Um, we have our next uh, person coming up, uh, Elizabeth Dodge. So thank you so much. Thank you, Cryptomatic ATM, once again, for being one of our sponsors. Please go check them out. Great company doing great things. Joff, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. I look forward to it, Jeremy. You guys have a great, great rest of the event. I'm, I'm watching on the big screen over here. So take care. All Sounds good. Ciao. Well, coming up next, uh, here we go. We're talking about crypto and taxes and how to maintain your wealth with uh, Computus and Elizabeth Dodge. And I don't know why, Elizabeth, you're going to get this more and more as you get more into the crypto space. I know you've been in a little while. Uh, I'm going to do something a little fun now because when I see your name, because of the crypto uh, industry, I think of Elizabeth Doge and I think of Dogecoin. And this is why I like to use the background sometimes. You get the little doge uh, doggy in the background. Anyway, just a little fun joke. No relation. Lighten, lighten the mood a little bit. But uh, Elizabeth Dodge, 
thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you for also being a sponsor here in Computus. You guys are doing some great things. So if anybody is a crypto trader and needs to get their taxes in order, this is the lady you want to speak to. So with that said, I'm going to pass it over to you. All right. Well, thanks, Jeremy. I appreciate it. Hello, everybody. Hope you don't mind the office atmosphere. Um, I'm going to share my screen and um, pull up my um, PowerPoint. It's great to be here. Thanks, Jeremy and Christina. I appreciate it. And I'm just going to go over a few things with uh, cryptocurrency taxes that um, just an overview so people can have an idea of, 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 you know, how to take care of your taxes. Okay, so first of all, let's go over a couple of things that we want to go over. We want to be able to understand a couple of things. Understanding the tax law is most important. When you make decisions about your taxes, you want that to be based on tax law, not what you've read on the internet, not what you've heard from your best friend, but what actually is tax law, which is what the IRS is going to use. We're going to go over a few key definitions. Um, we're going to go over some tax treatment of some basic virtual currency transactions. And we're going to talk about how to minimize your tax liability. And that's where we get into, you know, maintaining your wealth is making uh, educated decisions about how you trade your cryptocurrency and how you decide to calculate capital gains and losses. Uh, and then we're also going to talk about a couple of ways that you can actually have tax-free virtual currency income. All right, I have a little caveat here. I am a certified public accountant, um, but really this presentation is a, um, it's an overview of cryptocurrency tax, but cryptocurrency taxation is very complicated. Um, this is just a brief overview, and I highly recommend that you consult a tax professional so they can help meet your unique individual needs. Um, and then past that, let's just go into this. Um, what I wanted to go over first is tax law. Um, there are several major um, notices from the IRS. The first one I think everyone remembers was in 2014, and basically they define cryptocurrency as convertible virtual currency. So you'll hear me using virtual currency during this presentation. And the reason why I do that is that's how the IRS defines it. Um, basically, the IRS defines it as a digital representation of value. It's not really real currency, but it can be exchanged like real currency. Um, most recently, back in, uh, I think it was October last year, the IRS also came out with some revenue rulings about um, hard forks. And basically what they ruled was that if there's a hard fork and you receive a new cryptocurrency, then that cryptocurrency is taxable as income. And you will um, value that at the fair market value at the time you receive it. If it's a soft fork and you don't receive any cryptocurrency at the time of the transaction, then they're there is no taxable income. And then finally, I want to uh, point out, and um, we'll make sure we, you get the link, but the IRS has a FAQ um, section on their website now that is very, very helpful. It gives lots of definitions, gives uh, a, a lot of detailed information on specific topics, especially about basis, fair market value, et cetera. I know this is all boring, but this is all really important because it can make a huge difference. And the IRS is making an effort to audit people who they know have had cryptocurrency transactions. They're using Chainlink to follow transactions on the blockchain. Um, they're actually asking for uh, accountants that have experience with uh, cryptocurrency to help them with their audits. Um, so it really is important that you start keeping your record straight and be able to, you know, have the information in case you ever are audited. So you know, what are the elements of a virtual currency transaction? The first thing is basis. Um, basis is basically how much you have invested in a in property for tax purposes. So let's take Bitcoin. If you paid $5,000 cash for this Bitcoin, then that's your basis. 
that's what it's worth to you. And if you sell it, whether you sell it for more or for less will be how you calculate your capital gain and loss. Um, so it's the purchase price, but it also includes all the other um, expenses that go along with it, including purchase expenses. And in this case, the transaction fees. So whenever you're calculating the basis, the transactions fee fees are part of the cost. And although sometimes those can be a nominal amount, there are times when that can be even a larger amount. Um, and finally, let's say that you didn't purchase this Bitcoin with cash. You actually traded it. You traded some Ethereum for your Bitcoin. Well, then the basis of your Bitcoin is your exchange price. So it's the fair market value in USD at the time that you received it. So if you, you know, traded it on uh, Gemini and you know what their fair market value of the Bitcoin was at the time, then that's what you would use as your basis. So fair market value, let's just talk about this because this is another key element. I really think that you should have an idea of. Um, fair market value is basically what the property would be worth between a buyer and seller who both have a reasonable knowledge of the market and neither one of them have to buy or sell. And what that means is somebody's not under duress, they need money fast, and so they're willing to sell it for a cheaper amount than it's actually worth. So this would be just a fair handshake transaction on exchanging the value of the property. Um, it kind of surprises people to know that the taxpayer is actually required to, turn, to determine what the fair market value of their cryptocurrencies are. Um, how, do you get, how are you going to figure that out? Well, as I just stated, you could use what you buy and sell it for, like on Gemini or Coinbase, KuCoin, any of the others um, in doing that. So you can use exchanges, you can use CoinDesk, CoinMarketCap, and there are some volume-weighted average price um, companies out there that will help give you a volume-weighted average. But whatever you use, the most important thing is that you determine what the fair market value is in a reasonable manner and that you consistently apply it. So what does that mean? Well, let's just take a quick look at coin market cap here. And um, you can see this would be, this was Bitcoin a little while ago today, listed at $9,000. So at that particular moment in time, you could say, well, I use coin market caps. Um, pricing and it was worth $9,159. Um, now let's say you have to go back and look up the fair market value from prior years or prior weeks or months. Uh, if you go down here, they'll give you some historical data and you could use that. Um, but what I mean that by applying it in a consistent manner is that you would not wanna show that you purchased Bitcoin at the high price and then turned around and sold it at the low price because that's going to skew the results. So basically what you wanna be able to do is choose either the opening price, the high price, the low price, or the closing price, and use that consistently for buys and sells and for trading. So what is the date of receipt? This is another very important factor when calculating your capital gains and losses. And basically uh, it's the date that you have dominion and control over your cryptocurrency. So once it's been deposited into your wallet or into your exchange account, and you are able to transfer it, sell it, exchange it, or otherwise dispose of the cryptocurrency, that will be the date and time that it is your, in your receipt. And that would be when you calculate the fair market value. I know I'm probably coming up with some questions here, but I'm gonna try and save a few minutes at the end for anyone who has questions. So we'll get to those. All right. So what are some virtual currency transaction types? Well, first of all, let me go over this. In the 2019 tax return, for the first time, the IRS asked a specific question. At any time during 2019, did you receive, sell, send, exchange, or otherwise acquire any financial interest in any virtual currency? And by law, you have to answer this tax return question in order for the tax return to be complete. So the IRS is truly getting serious about following 
these transactions. So when you receive airdrops for promotional purposes, that's considered ordinary income. If you get a new currency from a hard fork, um, that's ordinary income. That means it's taxed at your regular tax rate. Um, on other ordinary income is mining, payments received for products and services. And there are actually people who have been getting paid wages in cryptocurrency. And then capital gains and losses are occur when you sell it, spend it, or trade it. So once again, ordinary income would be come from mining, um, come from airdrops for promotional cryptocurrency that you receive. Um, if you receive it, like for instance, if you accept Bitcoin as payment, then that's regular income. And then if you receive wages, that's also regular ordinary income. And what that means is it's, it's taxed at your regular tax rate. Um, I think we've kind of gone over the hard fork, so I'm not gonna elaborate that on anymore, but mostly if it's a hard fork, you receive a new cryptocurrency, you're gonna have to pay um, ordinary income on that. All right, so how um, capital gains are realized when property is sold or exchanged. So if you sell your Bitcoin or you exchange it for another cryptocurrency, or let's say you buy a sofa on overstock.com or you buy a cup of coffee at Starbucks, um, that actually is a taxable transaction because you are taking a cryptocurrency that you purchased or received at a one fair market value. And then when you use it, it's at a different fair market value and you have actually have to calculate the capital gain on that. Now, if you've had the cryptocurrency for less than a year, um, that's considered short term and you're gonna be taxed at your regular tax rate. But if you've held it for more than a year, you do get a um, better tax rate at 15%. So it's better to hold on to your cryptocurrency for at least a year so that you're paying a lower tax rate when you do have to do that. So again, capital gains and losses occur when you sell your cryptocurrency for a fiat, when you exchange your cryptocurrency from one to another, or when you use it to pay for any kind of goods and services. So a lot of the questions out there for how to calculate your capital gains and losses is based on which method of cost basis, basis you use. There's a, a lot of argument about using first in or first out. Um, that means you, the first Bitcoin you bought is the first one you sell. Last in, first out. The last Bitcoin you bought is the first one you sell. There's other uh, ways of costing using the highest cost first or the lowest cost first or average. And this gets really confusing. And so everyone's like, oh, you know, which one am I gonna use? What method is legal? What, what's gonna keep me from being in trouble? Well, the fact of the matter is it's your choice. Virtual currency is personal property. It's just like a car or your home or the money that you have or jewelry. So it's your right and your privilege to sell it whenever you feel like. Um, so you can use whichever method you want. Uh, first in, first out, and last in, first out are easier. Um, but really, specific identification is the better way to go. And we'll talk about that right now. Um, also, you need to keep in mind that capital uh, losses are limited to $3,000 per tax year. So you don't want to build up a bunch of losses that are gonna take you years to be able to write off on your taxes. So I've done a small sample of a Bitcoin sale for you so you can get an idea of how this works. And I know this is complicated, but if you look at it, it's pretty straightforward. Let's say you have four Bitcoin and these are the purchase dates that you purchased them. And these are the purchase prices. Well, if you use first in, first out, and you sold it on July 1st, 2019 at $10,089, then your gain's 9520. You get the 15% tax break, um, tax rate because it's long-term. And so you're gonna end up paying $1,428 on that gain. If you use last in first out, you do actually have a lower gain, but you have to pay the higher tax price 
tax rate. And so you actually pay a little bit more in taxes. Let's say, well, okay, I don't wanna have to pay any taxes. Let's just pick the highest one. Well, if you pick the highest one, you actually do create a pretty large loss, $9,208. But the problem is that's gonna take you three plus years to write off because you're only allowed to deduct $3,000 a year on your tax return. So you'd have to carry over the $6,208 to the next two plus years. So finally, if you use specific identification and you say, all right, I'm going to choose the Bitcoin that's closest to the price that I selling it for, you get the lowest capital gain calculation. And even though it's still short term, you see that the tax liability is only $467.52. So this is just an example of how, how you decide to cost your Bitcoin can make a big difference in your tax liability. Certainly, you'd rather pay $467 rather than $1,555 or $1,428. And who would like to spend three years writing off the other one when you might want to use that at the end of the year to, or at another year to go against other capital losses? Okay, so... Again, what you wanna to do to maintain your wealth is you need to keep really, really good records. Your records need to indicate the date and the time that you purchased each of your cryptocurrencies and the cost of when you purchased it at that time, whether it was a direct purchase of cash or if it was an exchange with another cryptocurrency. You want to carefully match your short-term and long-term capital gains and losses and to remember that there are limitations to some of the online services that are available. Um, it's easy not to, to enter all of your information and for the calculations not to be accurate. And as you can tell from our last, from this calculation that it'd be really easy to overpay your taxes unless you're really looking at it pragmatically. So Let's talk about a couple of ways that you can get tax-free virt virtual currency income. There are many methods, but I'm going to go over three of them. You can actually purchase cryptocurrency in your IRA. You can't do it with a regular traditional IRA. You have to use what is called a self-directed IRA, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, you can also use it in a health savings account, and you can give it away as a gift or in charitable contributions. When you give cryptocurrency away as a gift or as in charitable contribution, then the value of the gift is your fair market value. So if you paid $5,000 and you decided to give that to your son as a gift, then you would show that it was given away at $5,000 and there is no taxable trans I mean, income on this. And then your son would have that Bitcoin and it would be worth 5,000 to him. Um, with the, what is a self-directed IRA? An IRA that is self-directed is where you turn your retirement account over to a custodian and then you decide what's invested in it. Like right now, if you have a Charles Schwab account, they basically will make decisions for you based on whatever type of account you have. But when you give, a self, give it to a self-directed custodian, then you can say, look, I want to invest it in cryptocurrency or real estate. And what this allows you to do is to invest in markets and in investment assets that are not the norm that you would do in a traditional IRA. You can control your risk and you can control the volatility in it. It's the same with the health savings account. Um, a health savings account is one where you take a portion of your premiums and it's, you, instead of doing a traditional low or no deductible health insurance plan, you get a high deductible one. And with the premium that you save, you put that in a health savings account and that money is actually taken out pre-tax and any money that you earn on that while it's in there is tax free. And so then once you do pay any of your health care, it's with tax free money. And that's can be, that can add up to quite a bit of money. Um, so what can you invest in if you decide to do this with a self-directed IRA or with a health savings account? Any investment that's allowed by the tax law, which can be real estate, LLCs, private companies, 
precious metals, cryptocurrencies, nothing illegal. So, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't, you know, invest in a marijuana company. <laughs> anyway, um, basically our key takeaways, I hope that you got from this was number one, make sure that when you were making your decisions that you're relying on tax authority for making those decisions. Remember that there are some key definitions and you can go to the FAQs with the IRS and look all of that up. Um, the tax treatment of virtual currencies is varied. There's you know, ordinary income, there's long-term, short-term capital gains and losses. And so the objective is to minimize your tax liability and when possible, um, try and do some tax-free virtual currency income. So that's the end of my presentation here. And I wanted to give us a few minutes, not a whole lot, got about eight minutes here that I can take some questions. And I see what we lost a lot of people. <laughs> no, no, this is great. Um, you know, plenty of people here. Rhonda, it looks like you have your hand raised. So if you want to unmute yourself and ask away, please. Elizabeth, so to get the tax-free income, that must be a Roth IRA, not a traditional IRA that you're putting your assets in. Yes, it's a self-directed IRA, and you can transfer that to a custodian. Um, you have to get certain custodians that will do self-directed IRAs, but you can do that. You can right. actually transfer. You can actually transfer from any and all IRAs. No, but what I'm saying is, once it goes over to like it, I did Bitcoin IRA, but I used traditional um, IRA. I didn't use my Roth money. So technically I haven't paid the taxes on that. So when I take that IRA out, the whole thing is gonna be taxable. But if I would have put it in a Roth self-directed, then it wouldn't have been. That's, that's true. But the yeah. point is, is that what the self-directed IRA allows you to do is to control the amount of risk and basically the return on that investment. So if you're investing it in cryptocurrencies or even real estate or, you know, personal uh, or small companies, then you might be able to get a better return on that than you would with a Roth IRA that's in a traditional type of investment company. So that's so the here, benefit. So here's the question. Okay. You know, the mining contracts back in 2017, I lost some money in the crypto. Is it really worth it to go back and do an amended tax return from 2017? I'm not Sometimes sure. it can. You would have to take a look at how much that, that was lost. I will tell you this again: the capital gains or the capital losses are limited to three thousand dollars per year. Okay. So if it's more than that, you know, you could carry those losses forward and be able to write off some in 2018, 2019. You know, depending on how much of a loss it was, you can take advantage of it not just to 2017, but in tax years after that as well. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome, Rhonda. All right. Well, um, this was really great. Um, there's a lot of things that I learned, Elizabeth. Um, you know, obviously, as a crypto trader, you think you know a lot of things, but as it relates to tax, uh, that is not my uh, cup of tea, per se. So, yeah, there's a lot of intricacies with trading. Um, it's really good to educate yourself. Um, how can people find you if they want to learn more? Do you guys put out any research or anything else that anybody can take a look at? Um, yes, you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, my uh, email is on the presentation. It's elizabeth at computus.io. And um, please feel free to call. Um, you know, the tax law as far as cryptocurrency can get really, you know, really detailed, especially when you're trying to keep up with transactions that are being transferred from one exchange to another, keeping up with original purchase price, original purchase date you know, being exchanged for another cryptocurrency and what the fair market values are. And as you could tell from that calculation, um, it can make a really big difference in your tax liability. And that's part of um, maintaining your wealth. There is one other thing I didn't go over um, in my presentation that I want to bring up. Um, it was called tax loss harvesting. So if you keep up with your cryptocurrency transactions during the year and you're coming up in November, December, and you've got $20,000 in cryptocurrency gains, and you're looking at having to pay taxes on that, then you can look at your portfolio of cryptocurrencies and make some strategic trades that would create what I call a book loss, because you're not actually losing cash. Um, but based on what the prices have been historically, you know, you could create a loss that you could then net against that income 
um, of $20,000 and reduce your taxable income. And also let's say, let's talk, go back to Rhonda's question. You lost a significant amount of money during the year for mining or uh, you know ICO that went belly up and you're sitting on $6,000 in loss and you're like, gosh, I don't, I don't wanna write off 3,000 this year and 3,000 next year. Well, then you might make some trades and create a capital gain for 6,000. And then you're, you're netting the gain and the loss and you have zero taxable income. So that would be a time to take advantage of selling a cryptocurrency that had a, that would, that would cause a really large capital gain and then you can zero it out. So it's really important when you're doing investments like this, whether it's cryptocurrency or stocks and bonds, whatever, that at the end of the year, you kept track of it and you know what's happening and you can make some of these decisions to save yourself some money. Yeah, so to my understanding, like you're saying, um, and, and I've done this before as well, which is there's no tax implication necessarily unless you sell, right? So Say that again. There's no tax implications until you sell specifically, right? That's correct. You tax well, if you hold it, right? So if I held, if you hold it, right? There's a tax implication though if you trade it for another cryptocurrency that's considered a sale. Correct. So let's just okay. say I got in at two in 2010 and I've been holding Bitcoin and I've never sold it. There's, there's nothing taxable at that point, correct? Nothing taxable. Let's just say you there, get in in 2017, like you said, right? And it goes down tremendously. Let's just say uh, gets down to 3250, which it did at some point, right? If I know inherently it's going to go up, if I sold at that moment and then rebought at a dollar higher, as an example, or at the same exact cost, right? I got the basically the benefit of being able to claim all those losses specifically. But then obviously, like you said, if it goes up the following year, uh, by 50% on that investment, then that's going to, you know, basically cover all of those losses to your point. So then there's a zero liability in terms of your tax. Is that fair to say? Yeah. And I need to double check on all the nuances of that, but a lot of times it's easier too, if you go ahead and trade it for another, like trade your Bitcoin for Ethereum and then turn around and trade it back um, later on, you can do that. Yes. Okay. Elizabeth, my, my question is about buying or selling to Bitcoin to get USDT, you know, because you want a stable coin, because some people believe in holding opinion about that, because it would still be a taxable, because it'd be just like any other. Ethereum. Yeah, it would still be a taxable event because the, you know, it's a virtual currency, whether it's a token or a stable coin, they're all, all fall under that definition of a convertible virtual currency. And so once you trade it for one to the other, whether it's USDT, Ethereum, you know, BNB, Monero, whatever, once you do that transaction, beginning January 1st, 2018, the IRS said that that was an actual sell and buy. You sold your Bitcoin to buy Ethereum and you have to calculate a capital gain at that time. Cool. Sounds good. Well, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Elizabeth uh, from Computer. Welcome. Thank you. I really appreciated being invited to do yeah. this. It's been awesome. Absolutely. Uh, and then did you share with everybody, I think, um, your information just so they could learn more? Yes, again, it's Elizabeth at Computus.io. That's C-O-M-P-U-T-I-S dot I-O. I'm also on LinkedIn. So uh, you can find me there as well. And I'll be happy to help. It'd be awesome. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Thank you. You guys have a great weekend. Thanks. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Lauren, what do we have in store next? So yeah, we have um, a very special guest. Uh, and I'm going to add him right now as a panelist. So uh, this was last minute. I know we were going to have uh, somebody else on a different topic, um, but Kyle Rea, uh, also known as Crypto Kyle, is a cryptocurrency trader that is really focused on cryptocurrency education, knows a lot about technical analysis and really has a great way to be able to break it down so that the average person can understand uh, what the nuances are and you know how to be able to take advantage of some of these moves in crypto and some of the key metrics that you should be looking at. So with that said, really excited to introduce uh, Crypto Kyle, Kyle Rea. Uh, if you'd like to, sir, you can go ahead and share your screen and uh, kick this thing off. Thanks for joining us. Jeremy, you've got a feedback loop going on. Oh, Kyle's got it on his side. Kyle, are you able to share a video? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give yeah, me just yeah, a moment. Just, just, there we go. There we go. Get some uh, crazy feedback. If everybody could go on mute, if you're not, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay, great. So Kyle, thank you again. I know this was last minute. Really appreciate you uh, coming in here. Uh, All good. A, a really great Telegram channel I'm a part of. Um, you share a lot of great knowledge about crypto and where things are going, and you have a lot of indicators that you follow. So love to learn a little bit more. And uh, you know, for the layman, you know how you look at this and how you see the markets playing out over the next couple months here. Absolutely. Um, I'd like to share my screen later, but to kickstart it right now with crypto, I think. Um, we're in a phase where it's like the middle haircut. You see right here, same kind of thing. We couldn't get a haircut. So for months, our barbers were shut down. We all, like so many of us, just shaved our hairs. And then that's kind of what happened with crypto with the pandemic sell-off. And now we're at a point now where we're starting to see some recovery, but we're still hitting the major resistance point of like Bitcoin 10,000, Ethereum 250, Link at $5. Some of these big coins that are just like stuck. Right. Every time we hit a resistance point, and I wish I could share my screen, but um, very last minute. So I'm still trying to figure that out. But if anybody who's watching pulls open their screen right now and pulls open Bitcoin, you could probably see that and not stare at my ugly mug right now. Um, but what we're seeing with a lot of Bitcoin now is we're just seeing like choppy waters. But if we look at the fundamentals over the technicals, which is kind of how I gauge my perspective, um, there was an announcement this week. Maybe it was a rumor, maybe it's not. But PayPal and Venmo said they were going to start accepting buy and sell of crypto. Um, they're probably following suit of Jack Dorsey, who owns Twitter, but also Cash App. And he's making more money through the buy and sell of Bitcoin, only Bitcoin, than he is from Twitter itself which is kind of crazy. So when you're seeing stuff like that, I think that we're gearing up. I mean, that's just one little aspect, but that's major. It's like 750 million users, something like that. Um, we're seeing government coins starting to use crypto and starting to build as a backup plan. And they say backup plan, but you know, when you print so much money, um, there's no way to log it all. And then what was it about some, I think CIA or somebody like that lost like some ridiculous amount of money off the books. Um, don't quote me on exactly what government agency it was, but there's been a lot of missing money this year alone with all this printing out. Every time this happens, it just makes me think the dollar is not as strong. So that's just another reason why crypto is getting stronger and stronger. Um, hey Kyle, I got confirmation you should be able to share. Um, just try oh yeah? to the green screen there. Oh, share screen? Okay, gotcha. I'm hitting a desktop. Is that right? Share desktop. Should Open system there. preferences. Yeah, either desktop or a specific window that you're looking to share. Okay. Let's see if I can do that. Um, I wish I could do that. I think it's my Brave browser. See if I can if I can pull this thing open on a. I'm sorry, guys. It's like so last minute for me that I didn't have all this ready. Um, I'm gonna try to pull it open in a Chrome and see if that works for us instead. Then I already have a window pulled open. Sorry guys, I'll just keep talking in the meantime. Um, I know that it's one-sided for me to talk, but if anybody has questions, that's probably something cool that we could do at this moment. Cause, um, yeah, sure. So, you know, as you're looking at the markets, I mean, you know, I, I think, you know, as a trader, you know, there's two different ways to look at it. And some people do a hybrid approach, you know, some people do full technical analysis, some people do fundamental and some do kind of a hybrid approach. I mean, like what is your overall approach uh, as you're trading crypto and how has that evolved over the years? Um, 
2017, when I got into crypto, I didn't know anything really about it. I didn't, I've never traded stocks in my life still up to this day. I've never traded stocks. Um, my uncle kind of got me into it. I didn't know where to start. So I started with YouTube and then on YouTube, there's a lot of smart people and there's a lot of opinionated people and there's just a lot of naive people. So trying to get information in general is great, but every little one small piece of information that's not accurate is going to tank your overall sentiment. So let's say, I'll mention XRP because XRP has been a coin that since 2017 has not seen a lower high point. It's constantly just like that. You might see little spikes up, sure you can make money, but there's so many people holding and holding and hoping and waiting that if they just would have picked something like Ethereum or Bitcoin in general, they would have already made their money. So it's like something like that when you get so much opinion saying xrp is the coin to hold because all the banks are working with it what's to stop any bank from making their own coin or you know disassembling the whole ideals of what X xrp was about back in 2017 the space has already evolved since then and there might be people out there that love xrp and i got nothing against anybody that has their reasons I'm just saying from my perspective, I'm going for percentage points. That's the only thing I care about in crypto trading. I'm only in it to make money. As far as like the blockchain projects, I will support blockchain projects if they help make the world a better place or add value. But there's just so many different cryptos out there. that It's like, how do you pick and choose which one? I'm just looking for swing trading. And right now it's been kind of hard to swing trade because you're seeing a lot of choppy um, charts and stuff like that. So when I got into it, I didn't really know what I was doing. I just like took some money. And I was playing the long-term game, spot trading, where you're not doing leverage or anything. You just put money into a position and then you say, well, I'll cash out when it reaches this point, unless you don't have a game plan at all. And you're just like, I'll just hold it for a year. Well, anything can happen in a year. So that's probably not a very good strategy. So as I started making more mistakes and I started watching people that seemed to be making money, I would just like dial out different bits of information over time and adjust my strategy over and over and over and over and over. Um, so to this point, now it's like, there's so many coins out there, Binance is listing so many projects. There's so many different platforms, but I've traded on probably over a dozen platforms and they've all got their issues. Even Binance has their issues. But in the end of the day, I'm just looking to swing trade for percentage points. So with stocks, I've noticed that, you know, there's a lot of volatility this year, but prior to this year, you'd be lucky to make like one to 10% a day. In crypto, you can make one to 10% in like a matter of like 10, 15 minutes or an hour, depending on which coin. So I was like, hmm, if I can just do this all day, every day, like I'm obsessed with games. I play Tetris, I play chess, I play video games. Weaned off of that, got into crypto. If you put in the time and you can find a pattern, all you need is one pattern that works for you. If you can stick to that pattern and have a really good risk management system, I'm pretty sure that anybody who's trading, if you put in enough time, you could probably make this a full-time job because you can compound your money. Say you start with $1,000, you get 10% today. Now you got $1,100 tomorrow. What's 10% of 1100 is $110. So as you do this over and over and over and over, you can quickly amplify, like, like I think it's like nine days. It takes to turn 1000 into $2,000 to double up at 10% a day. And if some of these coins are going up 30, 40, 50% a day, sometimes I'm not saying it's always like that, but if it does, then you can use that one pattern that works for you. Stick to a coin that you understand the charts, the chart each has a life flow of itself. So say like when it's snowing, each snowflake could be similar, but slightly different. They're never exactly 100% the same, but if you stick to a, a pattern that works for you and you just do that over and over and over and over on one coin and don't go look for a hundred different coins to invest in look for one or two and just stick with it so that you know the the flow so well of it that you can get in get out get in get out and start to time it almost like jump rope or like tetris in a way so that's how you can like 
like especially right now where people are trapped in their homes and they don't have a lot of income sources this could either be a second job or a main job and you can just start doing this over and over and over compound your money and over time you're gonna have a lot of money and there's ways you can start with zero money at all or with a little bit but i don't suggest doing any leverage or putting a lot of money in until you have some sort of system in place for yourself. So I just thought I'd just jump in here. I know you've had uh, screen issues. Um, so for the average person that wants to get in, right, and you're talking about these different strategies and approach, uh, what's the best way to start? Um, simple. So I would say the first thing is follow the rules of crypto. Number one, don't invest what you can't afford to lose. Number two, have a, treat it like a business. So it, every business is like, um, let's say you're doing drop shipping or e-commerce or whatever. You have $5,000 to start. I need to make this work. If I don't make it work, I can lose it, but I can't lose it. So what I would say is like, have a game plan in place and say, why am I entering? What time am I entering? Is the market ripe for, you know, my sentiment? So if you're, you're trading uh, futures, you could trade, make money if it goes down or if it goes up. Right now, I would say we're in a middle, medium ground where we don't know if it's going to go down, but I think it's going to break through. If it breaks through resistance, that's a good time to say, okay, I could um, enter. But I'd also say treat like a, a business plan, like write up a full entire business plan for yourself. The third thing is get rid of your emotions. No emotions whatsoever, because that's where you're going to lose your money. I guarantee it. If, if you look at it and... You comment, oh, I got to buy in now because all my friends are, or it's going up, I got to buy, then don't do it. Just wait till the next cycle because there's constant cycles happening. The fourth thing is just know how to protect your assets in the first place, like have a cold storage wallet. Um, yeah, not your keys, not your crypto. So don't store it on an exchange if you're not trading. If you're going to trade, put it on and then you can take it off. It only takes a couple of minutes to send it from here back to your main wallet every day if you're done. And then I would say the fourth thing is just like learn from other people that have already either made mistakes or they kind of know what they're doing. Those are the five things I would say to start with before you get into crypto. Once you get in, pick and choose like an exchange that you like, that you're comfortable with. Um, know your way in and out of the market. I would say use a VPN no matter what. It doesn't matter like if you're in USA or you're not in USA or whatever, use the VPN because there's hackers out there that will see something and they'll tap into your email or whatever and they'll take your crypto. I mean, it's very, very, very rare that that happens, but it's your money. So if you're going to be your own bank, you got to put up layers of protection. I'll say that that's probably a good start. And then from there, probably you know, go to a couple YouTube channels where, I mean, I follow a couple people too that are like spot on with their technical analysis, but I would say kind of keep an open mind to the fundamentals of what's going on in the global economy, how the world is shifting towards digital assets. I mean, if you want to use this example, Xbox and, and uh, PlayStation, the next generation are cutting out DVDs and CDs. So what does that tell you? That means we're going to be downloading more stuff. And if there's, I don't know how many billions of users using these two devices and they're becoming the main devices as an all encompassing like entertainment system. And if we're fading out of CDs, what does that tell you for everything else that we're probably going to go digital? So if we're going digital, that's probably a big step saying crypto is going to start moving up. Who's working with whom? And that's probably a good place to like find what projects that you want to invest in. Something like Chainlink doing big partnerships, Ethereum, everybody's building on Ethereum. They've been, they're like the OGs. They've been around forever. So that's probably a perspective that I would pick if I was first getting into crypto. No, that's really good. A really good advice there specifically around um, you know, like how to get in, don't spend what you can't afford, all those kinds of things. Do your own research. I mean, never listen to somebody on YouTube. Don't listen to me. Don't listen to Kyle. You have to formulate your own decisions and opinions based on looking at a lot of different types of research and listening to a lot of people speak in videos. Uh, this is a complex industry. This is not easy. Even I have, you know, mistakes that I make all the time as traders. And if there's a trader that always tells you that they're successful, they're, they're just lying. 
Um, we've all had issues, we've Art. all had wins and losses. And if you can't learn from the losses, then you're never going to grow. Um, and I think that's a really important thing. So Kyle, I don't know if you want to try to share your screen again, but it'd be really cool to see how you look from, uh, you know, look at this stuff from a technical perspective and just like looking at a few charts and seeing some of the things that you layer on, whether it's an RSI or an AMA or whatever it is, uh, it'd be kind of cool just to uh, dive into that a little bit so people can see what you're doing. No, I'm going to, I'm going to try to uh, use my iPhone and log in through my iPhone. Cause I know for sure it works on there and then I'll just, I'll just tap in that way. And then I can definitely show some stuff um, for advanced. Uh, Cause I know not everybody that's watching this is a beginner and, I, and I'm pretty sure there's some advanced people probably want to get like deeper information than the basic stuff. So um, let's say is like start Start looking like if you got a certain amount of money, um, let's say you've been trading for over a year in crypto or whatever, and you're looking to advance. I have people who I mentor that are like doctors that, you know, a doctor is probably some of the most exquisite type of mindset you can get because you have to be spot on. So I say like, if you can develop that kind of mindset when you're trading is like wake up every morning, set a pattern for yourself. Um, when you wake up, make your bed. If you don't do that already, sweep the floor every morning, do all your dishes right away. When you get to these little subtle mindset patterns, when you get into trading, you're not, you're going to make less mistakes because you're going to catch yourself. Be like, well, I got comfortable. If you don't log into your finance every second of every day, then you're probably giving a chance for some big sell off to happen in there. There you go. You lost your money. Um, so yeah, stuff like that kind of sucks. I'm logging in right now on my phone and then I can, oh, there I am. You're just gonna have to eat the phone there. Uh, yeah, let me see if, <laughs> let me see if I can go like this. Okay. Yeah, but uh, you must have seen that video. I can't remember who it was specifically. There was a video and maybe a keynote from a military leader that uh, talked about the importance of making your bed every single day. <laughs> ever yeah. since I saw that video, I started making my bed right away every single day. Um, and it just sets the tone for being regimented to your point. So I think there's definitely something to that. Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions or thoughts thus far while Kyle's hooking that up. Um, but what do you guys think? I mean, you guys are all you know trading hopefully in some capacity. If not, um, there's no dumb questions here. So any questions for Kyle, uh, somebody who's been in the industry quite a while, uh, that's gone through it all, the ups and downs all around. So now he's teaching and spreading the word about crypto trading to a lot of different people from very the very basic level all the way to very advanced. So if you have a question, you can type it in the Q&A or you can just raise your hand like Rhonda has done a few times or anybody from the Genius team if you guys want to hop in and uh, ask a question as well. Jeremy, can you share your screen for what you as a trader look at? Uh, Coin Genius hasn't uh, built yeah. all of the tools. Oh, and he's got it. There we go. There we go. Yeah, boy. Okay. Um, yeah. Any questions that you guys have? At all? I'm gonna log out of my phone one real quick. Any questions you have right now is cool. If not, I'm just gonna get into some basic TA and the five patterns that I use constantly. And these are the five that I always use. So we can go ahead and do it with Bitcoin while we're here. Um, my battery's gonna die. So give me one second. Uh, while he's doing that, I'll, let me just explain. This is a chart. No, I'm just kidding. I gotta get into it. I'll, I'll leave this for the experts. Um, but yeah, I mean, to Christina's point, she's going to ask me what I look at. I mean, I mean, I'm going to be really honest with you. I look at a lot of things. It's my job, obviously, to research the industry on behalf of Coin Genius as part of our market research team as well. We're looking at everything, right? So I wake up and I do the same kinds of things. I look at the charts. I look at, you know, even Twitter. I know that there's a lot of noise there, but there's a lot of gems there if you know where to look. There's a lot of trading groups. There's a lot of videos and news. Um, and then the macroeconomic factors that we look at as well. And then some of our own analytics, including our new Telegram channel, if you want to join it. It's called Coin Genius Stats, which gives you real-time updates as to what's going on. So with that said, Kyle, I'll pass it back over to you. But that's just some of the stuff that I look at. For sure. Yeah, um, I like to look at other people's sentiment. But over time, it's just like I just do it to see if they're 
on the same thought process as myself. Sometimes like I can, I see things myself, but sometimes I'm missing a lot of stuff. Like the thing about crypto is nobody's right or wrong until you're right. Um, what I mean by that is anything can happen in crypto and what Jeremy's always mentioned, and he's absolutely correct about this is think like a whale. They move the market exchanges and the people with the biggest amount of money always run the market. They, they control the sentiment of the entire space. So if they have made their profits after a pump up, they're going to take the profits as you see right here, pump up, take profits, sell off, take profits. Cause they're probably shorting at the same time. If you're an exchange, the exchange makes money by liquidating people. So they want you to keep trading. Well, Binance wants you to keep trading all the time. And at the same time, they also want you to lose. <laughs> so it sucks being a retail because retail is like three tiers below like any whale or exchange. So looking at some TA, here's the five things that I do. The biggest one out of everything is uh, support zones and support zones are how many times um, the candlesticks have tapped that certain scenario. If you use a fib retracement, um, we don't have time to get into that because that's just like hella technical. So I'm just gonna use my five basic ones. Um, up here would be a resistance because we've tapped this point. And if you, this is five minute chart. If you go back to the day chart, you can see how many times we've tapped like the $10,000 mark and we just cannot break through it. Um, yeah so coming here i would draw up wow i'm lagging i would draw up from the day candlestick a trend line from our previous all-time high bitcoin has ever been at and go like this and realize that we still have not broken out of the triangle no matter how bullish i am at some points until we break through and hold above this descending trend line we are not in a bullish market we're still in the bear market from years ago until we break through this thing is just not happening so this is one of the biggest indicators that you can use on any time frame it doesn't have to be day it could be week could be month could be minute it doesn't matter charts will always move up move down blah 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 so once you see something like this and if we had not seen where this descending wedge could have been at this point. So every data point, which is what I love about Coin Genius, is that they use data points. Um, so if we didn't have this data point right here, all we'd have is this, and we would not be able to gauge where to expect the market to head next. So because we got this and we dumped and we did not break it, we could have drawn that trend line right here and kept on going down if you didn't see any of this prior and we've drawn it to this point um when was that 2019 that was a year ago so we didn't break that so if we could have broken that we could have been bullish but we didn't break it yet and i think that we still have a ways to go because typically in other charts if you look at a bunch of these things you'll see that they'll play out all the way till you see like a tail and then the tail is usually the breakout point. So it looks like we probably have months to go before Bitcoin technically breaks out. And that also makes sense for adoption because I don't think the world is globally ready to just say, eh, screw fiat, we're done. So I think there's still, if you treat it like a business and this was like beta testing, because let's say you put together a business plan back here in this era for an actual business you would put together like your pitch deck and like have you build your your platform and do some testing and be like okay let's see what would happen if we allowed so many users to do it we saw what happened there was all kinds of glitches there were scams the exchanges would freeze up like you would be in a futures market and would freeze and then it would dump drastically everybody would lose their money because there's so many people buying and selling that the platforms couldn't handle it so it's like things like that technical issues that if we were to adopt and we were to get back to this level again, would these exchanges in the amount of volume of retail coming in, would they be able to handle it? Probably not. That means a lot of people are gonna lose their money and that's not good because that will tank an economy in itself. 
So if we're looking at TA here, we got to break this. If you want to come in, let's just leave it on this chart here. Okay, another indicator to look for is double bottoms or double tops. Okay, we don't really see a lot of double bottoms here, for instance. I would say this could be a good double bottom. Let's zoom in on that a little bit. After a double bottom is like after we're doing a correction, we found a support and this was a pretty strong support because we saw boom, boom, boom. All of this was sitting there and we'd already pumped up past that point like pretty aggressively. When we came back there, it's usually three steps forward, two steps back in a way. So I'd say that's about two steps from the point of this pump up right here. I wouldn't say that was, I would say right here would be the point of, you know, if we were going three steps forward, that would probably be that support zone because this is just clearly a low point. So we're putting at ourselves about two steps backwards from this pump up from the bottom, which also puts us equal with all very strong support over here, which we saw a bunch of times. We tapped it one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We saw a double bottom, one, two. We know we would pump up after a double bottom. This right here, I would not technically count this as a good technical indicator because that was the pandemic sell off and nobody expected that except for maybe one or 2% of the people in the crypto space and they probably made a killing and i heard actually of some whales who got some of their shorts cut off about like right here because they were making so much money so there was like a panic button for the exchanges so i'd say a double bottom and also a double top would also be something like this even though this is descending let's say we pump up when we hit our our trend line so i always draw my trend lines first and if you're going to do it in order, I'd say trend lines and then resistance and support zones would be the next indicator I would use after a trend line. Because if you break through a trend line, we could be bullish. If we stay under a trend line, at least we understand kind of, you know, that we have to break through it or we're going to sit at previous support zones. So with that being said, I'm drawing this guy up right here. Bam, you see that? How we've hit tapped it so many times. This is probably the strongest support that we can get. And this, I can't see over here to the right, but I think that's like, let's see if I can move that. Oh, there we go. Okay, that's about $6,000. When people are saying we're gonna dump down to zero or 4,000 or whatever again, it's not gonna happen. Okay, this is the strongest support that we can get. If we have like some other random pandemic sell off, we might, but from a technical and fundamental standpoint, I don't see us going below six ever again, um, unless, unless whatever government comes in or regulates and says no more crypto and then makes it hard for people. They'll just use a VPN and go to a foreign exchange. So let's see. Um, so we got this, this is our support. This would be our resistance. Sorry? We have to wrap up pretty quick. We've got another speaker coming on at 3.30. Oh, okay. Um, so the third indicator was a double bottom, double top. Uh, if it if we pump up and we, we can't get past our point, then we're going to sell off. And then a fourth one would be like these right here. These indicators, if you see a crossover and we're above it, we see a crossover right here, but we can't breach it, we're going to tank. Once it crosses again, we go above it, then we're gonna go up. So those would just be a couple indicators for you. Um, if there's any final questions, I didn't get to my fifth one, but that ought to do you for now. You Kyle, thank final you questions. so much for doing this last minute. You're amazing. Um, I'm gonna give you one shot, cause like you said, nobody's really right or wrong until they're right or wrong. Yeah. So with that said, where do you think it's going next? You got maybe like 10 seconds. And if it's right, uh, where do I think it's, if it's going? Wrong, it didn't I don't, I don't think we're going above 10,000 yet. I think okay. we could, but um, if we were, if we're going to do a, a coin flip, I would say that we still got a couple months before we can break that 10,000 for Bitcoin, but Ethereum needs to break 250. If it does look for a long, if link chain um, breaks $5, then look for a long. That's what I would say. I would Do tend to agree with pretty much all those statements. So thank you, Kyle, once again, really appreciate it. If they want to learn more about you, where do they go? 
Um, you could just hit me up on Telegram uh, at Crypto Kyle or check out my YouTube. There's all kinds of cool tutorials on there for beginners and advanced. Awesome. Thanks, Kyle. Have a good one. Thank you. All right. Well, up next, we have Mr. Warren Whitlock with What is Blockchain? All right. Am I here? You are here. How are you, sir? All right. Uh, getting warning messages. Uh, locked. I'm locked in a little room by myself. And hey, um, um, says it's 2 p.m. Wow. Um, <laughs> I lost an hour and a half, guys. <laughs> um, so... So, so I don't know if you're uh, actually yeah. in Vegas or not, but I am jealous of your background. Right? That, that's, uh, that's, you know, that's my little town out there. And uh, uh, today we're talking about what is blockchain. My, um, my assumption is I could spend a lot of time talking about what is blockchain to somebody that doesn't know, but we're in the, we're well into the second day here. I'm, I'm thinking that, uh, that probably somebody doesn't know what blockchain is. They've already left, um, so <laughs> and uh, and so what I what, in discussing what to do on this, I said that really what's important for our, our audience is here find out where they are and, and take care of them, um, which is a overall mission I have in life is when I can explain something in simple terms, I do. Uh, let's start with my my explanation of blockchain. Sure. I just say you take any old database spreadsheet or whatever it is and uh put the parts together uh you know take 10 10 rows and and uh, encrypt them and add them to the next 10 rows you got a chain of blocks it's as simple as that yeah it's usually distributed and some of the encryption gets a little bit more complicated than that and uh but the the great advantage is that this allows for the decentralization instead of having a central control so, um, and uh, if you don't get that, ask, let's, let's delve into it and talk about a few ways that uh, blockchain can be used outside of Uber. Um I'm a little bit lost. Jeremy, are you on here? Can you tell me if there's any questions that, uh, that uh, are, are coming in? Because I wanted to have a, you know, a lot of question and answer in this. Got it. Yeah, I think uh, maybe Christina uh, was going to join in and uh, kind of run that. Christina, can you join back? I, I can easily talk the whole time. That's not the, that's not the problem. But I always like to be reaching the audience, and I help having uh, having another voice on there really does that. Besides, I don't see that there's any question. Um, so. Sure. Well, I mean, Christina, I you're at the controls. I, I love it. I didn't realize that we were going to do this, but uh, you know what I would like to talk about is let's, let's assume that the audience is rather well educated and that we can go as fast as we want about the future of where we can go with blockchain, specifically with AI Good. and blockchain. Um, I would like to, there's a bunch of things to delve in there, including smart cities and all kinds of leading edge technology. Great. Can you talk a bit Great. about that? And Seriously, if you want to just take about 10 minutes to talk about the future and the road to mass adoption, that would be amazing. Okay, great. Yeah, it's something that we, I, I know we tried to cover that yesterday and the panel got very much hung up on uh, crypto and getting people to use crypto. I'd like to get outside of crypto and just say the advantage of having the blockchain, blockchain on everything. Um, I was very bullish about every getting blockchain everywhere. Uh, and then I read a book, the latest book by George Gilder. It's uh, Life After Google. It's, uh, it's probably about two years old now. Um, and when I, when I read that and I realized it, he's been right about several things before. Um, and it's not technically a question of whether or not every single database will be changed to, um, to blockchain, but count on that during this decade, Anything that's data, that means, you know, maybe not the spreadsheets, but uh, anything that's a database that's keeping a, a record, all the transactions are going to get switched to, to some kind of uh, blockchain encrypt transaction. I talked to a few tech experts on building this stuff and they'll tell me, well, 
maybe we'll uh, uh, maybe it isn't good in some places. It's not cost effective to record everything like that. But to me, it's the distributed nature of this that that works out. So every time I see anything that's uh, that's centralized, and let's start with Google. Google, even though they have data centers around the world and scrape the entire web to 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 uh, serve us up to advertisers. Um, they're a centralized uh, location. Facebook is centralized. Uh, there's one thing in control. Governments are centralized. Uh, <laughs> all of our institutions tend to be centralized. And in the 20th century, we spent a whole lot of time building up those institutions, making them great. And when we talk about corporate America, we're talking about, you know, Fortune 100, 1,000, 5,000, whatever the top companies are and ignoring that, you know, most of the new jobs and innovation come from the, the rest of the rest of business. And uh, talk about decentralized, you open up a shop and start doing what, what you're doing. You're serving just your local community and what they want, and then interconnecting it with, with global. So when I ran a brick and mortar business, the, the phrase, think global, act local, local came up all the time. And I, I like that. I'm not really sure what the, you know, whoever was pushing that, what they, what they wanted anymore. Uh, you know, and it's uh, the, the popularity of the phrase is gone, but that's it. Everything we do can be connected to anybody on earth, but we have to take care of whatever our community is. And that's no longer geographical. It can be anywhere on earth. So start applying that to everything that can happen. And Christina mentioned smart cities and that's, uh, uh, you know, now now we find out that a city can innovate and try to do things. Uh, read the news. The government doesn't do a really good job of dictating how to control a virus or, you know, take care of unemployment and things like that. It's got to be, you know, on a lot smaller scale. And the innovation, I've been following this trend for about 20 years now, the innovation that comes from cities where there's a mayor in charge and can take some action uh, is far faster than trying to say, you know, can we reform healthcare at a, at a uh, national level? And certainly the global things get very difficult because we have warring factions. And I don't mean warring countries. I mean, people who think we ought to have countries and other people who say, well, there's no limits. Um, and I tend to be the, tend to be the latter. I want to call myself a globalist, but the, the future is definitely going that way. Um, and these are not like attitudes or policies or things that I like. These are just like trends I'm watching. Frankly, I don't care who wins in a political contest or whether or not the social mores change. I, I want to find out what they are and I want to predict them and I want to make money off of them. Uh, and I think we can in any, in any situation. If, uh, you know, suddenly we all went under a totalitarian government, we'd have to figure out what to do. So start watching this, the things the smart cities are doing and Google smart cities and it's unbelievable. Uh, YouTube on smart cities, conferences, lots of smart people talking about this and very seldom are they talking about, you know, the hindrance of we need to everybody get along. It's sharing best practices. In a company, departments start having best practices and sharing it in, a, in you know, global, in the global village, it's cities. And so, uh, we, we start adding in um, AI and um, first of all, blockchain has got to make sure I set the foundation. Blockchain means you start recording every transaction. You no longer need to worry about auditing because auditing is done as soon as you record the transaction. One of the principal things about blockchains in a what is blockchain discussion is uh, what happens when uh, something gets recorded in a thousand different places. And this is what makes it so secure for cryptocurrency. It's a thousand or 10,000 different, different databases. You, you need to go back. And if you're going to change something, you have to change it on all of them. In a spreadsheet, you can pull it up and change a cell and that changes all the other cells. And everybody goes, okay, fine. In accounting, you can go if double entry accounting, you can go and make adjusting entries and things like that. But in, with blockchain, once the transaction is recorded, there's no changing it. Uh, you, you can make an adjustment. You can keep track of records like that, but you, you can't change, change it. So let's look at the supply chain example. One of my favorites comes if you're ordering something that comes from Frankfurt, 
Germany. They've you know sourced the the uh, the, the uh, materials to build it, build a finished product, and uh, now you ordered it. How are they going to get it? And I'll use Las Vegas since that's where I'm sitting. Um, how am I going to get that uh, that item? Uh, quite often, bulk of the, that kind of material moves by a truck to uh, to a, a port. It could be an airport, but you but usually still there's a lot of shipping. As a big ship, a lot of it lands in New York, gets on another train, and comes to a distribution center where in my in my metro area, and a truck brings it to my house. In the old days, that meant that every time it was changed, somebody had to sign over to say that they had taken receipt of it, and uh, there could be accounts could be off, and accounts could be off by human error, uh, entering a four instead of a nine. Uh, or, or, you know, just the paperwork, reading it was a big hassle. Carbon copies of, you know, going through, to, uh, maybe some people here don't know what a carbon copy is, but uh, multiple copies of a, of a document. And then even when they're entered into a computer, human error on that. Is the count off on something? And where did it go wrong? Blockchain eliminates that entirely. It's, uh, you know, it's a solid number that's entered in the beginning doesn't keep somebody from committing fraud. You can say there's 29 items on the pallet, and then in the middle of it, you rearrange things so there's only 14. Uh, you just, you know, you just see the ones on the outside and, uh, you know, in, um, or just lie about it, and that'll travel along. But the change, the, each, each time there's a, a change recorded, Somebody certifying that they've counted and take care of it. So you make a rule that's part of the smart contract and that's how things work. It's the same thing that gives us the ability to, I can pay you $1 and you get the dollar and it's gone from me without us being in the same room. Um, and th the beauty of the digital transaction, we well, get into that kind of an accounting and everything is just solid. You can't, there's no reason to, to uh, ever have to audit it or worry about it or correct it. Uh, There's a public record of what happened. Uh, okay, so you combine that with AI and uh, you've got data, once that database gets tied into an, uh, a machine learning algorithm, it's gonna plow through and give us insights that we, we, didn't, we didn't think were there. And that, that, uh, that includes IoT, which is where I really like, uh, that I, I were rambling about smart cities for a while that, you know, every stoplight changing could be recorded in a database. Um, you know, if it, and well, actually every light bulb in a, in a uh, traffic light uh, being tested for its, you know, life or whatever could be recorded. Every, um, everything gets, gets documented, recorded, and you can't, you can't go back and change it. Uh, embezzlement and, um, you know, a lot of other malfeasance in the world happens because people can, can ignore or change records. And so that's it. That's Warren, I have a quick follow-up question for you. Okay. If, if you could take all of the things that this community represents, if we were to get our way and we were able to leapfrog in 10 years and we got all the legislation put together and the world now runs on blockchain and AI, Mm -hmm. Let's pretend that the, the path is just completely steamrolled and we get everything we possibly want. Can you explain the level of Jetsons type world that we would live in <laughs> if all of that would happen? <laughs> well, I think, first of all, impossible that that's ever going to happen. It's going to be piecemeal. Right now we have more, um, you know, we have way more technology than we use. Um, I like to put things down on the real local level and say, what happens when I go and pick up my dry cleaning? First of all, why am I picking up my dry cleaning? Well, I, you know, I don't. This is this is dressy for me. Uh, but if you, <laughs> if you, if you need to get dry cleaning, um, to just use the metaphor, I got to get in my car, drive to the place, drop the stuff off, uh, remember where it is and where the ticket was, and then go back and get it. And then uh, all the processes there. Did they really have it done? Uh, and, uh, and just the delivery of it is such a, such a, a mess. Um, one of my, uh, favorite examples, trying to figure this out, what happens when I need a special, a special deal with, uh, with how I'm handing my dry cleaning, I've got to catch a plane and I want my favorite suit 
and it's 10 minutes till they close and I'm 15 minutes away. Who takes care of that? Because there's all the human effort of giving really good customer service. I've done this. I have arrived right at the, at the closing time at a dry cleaner and had somebody lock the door and laugh at me. Um, they, they were my former dry cleaner um, <laughs> for many reasons. And, uh, um, the, and what, there's so much more we can do. Uh, a, a, an ideal dry cleaner would be, first of all, you don't think about it. Somehow it's magically taken care of and in your closet. Um, and so if you can't get it in the closet, at least you can get it at your front door. Um, and I've seen so much adaptation happen in living in a, in the world of Amazon now that, um, that I live in, that, you know, I don't go out of the house, everything arrives on my doorstep. Um, and, uh, you know, first time I ordered food that way, I thought, well, I, can I really trust that it's left on a sack on my front porch? And I, I got to tell you 20 years ago, I wouldn't. And I think in the future, everything you want to have automated can be automated. There's very little things that computers can't do, but the, uh, the, the artificial intelligence can't, uh, you know, love you. It can, it can feign that, but it can't create a human experience. And so I think the future really more than, you know, will it, will I get in a flying car or not? The future is all about, will I be able to spend time helping the people in my family, friends, and the people I serve in business. Um, and I think so. I think, you know, a doctor who has an AI figure diagnosing the patient, uh, or at least helping diagnose, and uh, laser robots doing the surgery um, that, you know, are much more precise than, than a human can be, uh, still has, has to worry about things like the bedside manner stuff. Uh, there's one study that shows that a doctor touching a patient, um, which let's get away from the Me Too stuff and think, I'm talking about positive, reinforcing touching the patients, uh, t taking their temperature, listening with the stethoscope, whatever um, that that they do, or just putting their hand on the on the elbow and saying it's all going to be all right. Uh, the the recovery rate uh, and healing. Uh, I'm not really sure how, what statistic they were measuring, but 30% is the number I remember. Uh, you know, people get better, faster, uh, and, you know, and more complete. You, you lose less patients who just give up and die. Uh, other complications go down just because the doctor took the time to go with the patient. Well, that's not the typical surgeon. Um, I think of the TV image, because that's where I've seen the most surgeons, is the guy thinks he's cutting meat and doesn't want to talk to patients. That's going to change. All those kind of things are going to change. So imagine a world of the future where you are able to, to be in touch with real people and have conversations. And even if it's conversations like this, where we can't all be in the same room, uh, we'll be able to interact with the humans, knowing that the technology is taking care of everything else. What a wonderful example of where we're sitting, you know? It's not long ago, we wouldn't dream of getting on a call like this and having it actually work. Um, that, uh, you know, we could, we could have a conversation. And well, I know I do several Zoom calls a day, and most of the time I forget that the, you know, whether or not I talk to the person on the phone on Zoom or whatever. I had a long phone conversation yesterday, and it felt so weird because I couldn't get the guy to turn on his camera. Uh, you know, it's, I don't need to look at the guy, but uh, it's so much more real to see people's faces. So that's the kind of future that I'm looking for. Do we have other questions? I was just going to say that speaking of seeing people's faces and knowing the next few panels that are coming up, uh, I really would love to see some folks uh, jump online and, and show uh, and participate. Um, Gary, especially, like we haven't heard much from you. You've been behind the scenes, Steph. You've been behind the scenes. Big shout out to Carl and Michael. Michael, who's manning the green room. Most of you guys met met him and got to chat with him. So a uh, big shout out to Team Genius. So if you guys would like to participate, uh, Warren is is one of the OGs, man. Like he's uh, tell us a little bit about your work with uh, with Bit Angels and uh, in that side of the house. I'd love to. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, because if 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 they don't want to know anything about what it is, is Warren. How many times did you mention Bit Angels? 
<laughs> uh, I work with Michael Turpin putting on conferences. He started Bid Angels with a man named David Johnson back in 2013. They were looking ways to invest in in, Bit, in things around Bitcoin. There were no ICOs. There were no altcoins. Uh, and they started a group of investors that met on Google groups, a uh, private Google group. And there was a few hundred of them. Uh, one of the th early things they did was invest in Ethereum. They saw a presentation from a young guy with a new idea uh, who said, this is where we're going to fix what's, what's wrong with cryptocurrency. And he came out with, you know, Ethereum. That's Vitalik. And, uh, you know, and it's, it's really cool. They've been doing it for that long. In 2014, they decided they wanted to get together. And uh, Michael Turpin, being the kind of empresario that he is, came up with the idea that they'd all meet next to, uh, I think it was Money 2020 conference. And have an extra day and see some pitches. And so that became this now, I think 12 or 13 coin agendas have happened. Um, last year, we revived Bid Angels and started open up city chapters around the world. Um, and that's had a little bit of problem in 2020. Uh, where <laughs> Those meetings are all being held virtually. In fact, I was scheduled to speak at one in Los Angeles, uh, uh, just, oh gosh, I believe our lockdown happened about the same day, but they ended up, they had canceled it a week before. Uh, and so, you know, it's like, okay, great. We finally got this going. I've got a company to pitch and uh, it all fell apart. And, but the resilience I see of people very interested in things, uh, you know, and, and able to get together wherever they can is just fantastic. So in the future, I think uh, this kind of network is important just was approached by somebody today that was pitching their network as there's no reason to go out and have to spend a lot of time and money researching what to invest in. There's groups of investors that network together. Uh, I don't know. I can't say much for the concept beyond that, but that's what bid angels has always been. And it's going to become even more. You can become a member, uh, you know, some paltry fee to become a member. Once you are there, you're able to see these presentations, and they're all videoed, even when they're local and, um, uh, you know, not, you know, you can't be there live. Uh, and so, but it's great to be able to hang out with local people. There's quite a community in New York City, which I believe was our first one, that or San Francisco, uh, where there's, you know, a lot of people who know each other uh, and network through the, through the actual meetings. Los Angeles has been up and down. Right now, it's got a very strong, strong leadership. Uh, and we are, you know, gosh, we did one in Belgium last week and Singapore coming up and Toronto and Miami, uh, Columbus, Ohio. Um, you guys are all over the place. Let's do a shout out for the LA chapter. I'd like to uh, give a shout out to Bill Inman and Michael uh, Turpin and, and Warren and, um, oh my gosh, is it Emily? Nope. Oh, Erica. Erica. Erica, Erica, yeah. Erica is the best. Yeah, she was uh, the one that was asking me earlier today is how many times I mentioned Bit Angels. Well, you know what? Let's mention Bit Angels just a few more times because it's bigger than Bit Angels, and Bit Angels is global, and Bit Angels is definitely part of the Genius Investor Network, and we exactly. are we are starting to connect that fabric digitally and make it easier for investors to understand these projects and what is blockchain. Right. Um, and we're also- And we had you speak at the LA. Um, I, was, I was there, yeah. And yeah. I made some great connections there. Um, that's actually how I met uh, Jean Kudar from Artiste Pro and still a big fan of their project. They're gonna be on the, on the next one. I think, it, I think for the next one, I'd love to have Bill Inman and um, Dr. Ben Gertzel from uh, Singularity Net um, right. potentially do like a round table with the Genius Network because I think a lot oh, that's, of yeah. interesting. Well, if you can get, yeah, if you've, got, if you've got a chance to see Ben Gertzel, you definitely should. He's it's the uh, Singularity Net, is singularitynet.io, uh, where Bill's now the CEO. But uh, yeah, but, but uh, Ben is the uh, Dr. Ben. Um, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to call him by his first name. Dr. Gertzel is the um, uh, one of the guys that did the Sophia robot. And that's owned by Singularity.org. But they've got just an outstanding. If you're looking for AI to hook up to your enterprise without having to go out and reinvent machine learning for your own data, that's the place to go find that. That's, that's a network marketplace right by itself. 
Yeah, and... I think we'll uh, I think we'll invite uh, Daniela Monteleone, who also worked on the Sophia project, and bring that together. I think we'll have a little AI panel and just see who from the Genius Network wants to show up for that. There's a there, yeah. AI is just so so exciting, and so much more than you know. Thank you very much. You're the first time I've I've been talking to somebody that didn't ask. Well, is the robots going to take over? Who uh, cares? Well, they might have rights one day, but that's a completely yeah. other thing. But <laughs> when the robots get ready to take over, we don't need to discuss it. We don't need to plan for it. Here's if the thing: I want to at least dead. have drones. Here's the thing: like I want, I I don't want Skynet, but I do want a drone to show up with my pizza. Like you know what I mean? Like there's certain things that we should work towards. I think sure. in smart cities and having traffic coordination because you can't build the roads fast enough to you know like the, the the level of infrastructure that needs to exist like overnight yeah um, what, what really like, there's a lot to deal with what really got me was um when when uber and lyft were fighting for control of uh las vegas um they had some problems shut down and opened up again and so 2017 was the year i happened to blow up the engine in my very old car and decided that i didn't want to drive anymore and we we're going to go to automated car since so let me try all that next thing i know i'm getting rides anywhere in the valley for three dollars it was a wonderful time um and i got used to going around in the back seat like i had a limo driver um and uh you know and i'm sitting there watching the traffic and watch what's going on and how much less of a hassle it is for me and we get to a busy intersection and have to stop and i realize the math involved which I couldn't do, but the math involved is somebody like Dr. Gertzel could do uh, to be able to have those cars communicate with each other. And, and, and it's, let's say the speed limit's 40 and have some of the cars slow down to 38 and another one go 42. And we'd all go through the intersection without stop. Um, you know, that sounds stopping. so efficient. That, yeah. What a and concept. I've started applying that to just everything that happens. Right. Um, and of course, we haven't talked about the, the my real favorite future technology is We're nanotechnology. Gonna, oh, we'll have to do that have a on a different whole thing on nano for sure. Yeah, we're, we're talking running, about we're buildings kinda... being built without you know just because you had the idea of building the building, you tell your AI and you've got a you know forty story tower up. So here's here's the trouble with that, Warren. So I grew up reading um, Michael Crichton, and so like I I definitely like I'm aware <laughs> how far we could go with science. Yeah. So we're, well, we're we well, have to question wrap is, up we, here. What are your we, um I'd like to we, get kind of your final thoughts. Um, yeah, just we, we will go that far because we because the technology is now on its own. There are bad people that are going to use AI to attack us. Um, and they're, you know, they're building things in the dark web on blockchain. And, you know, they, they have other plans to either rob us or control us or whatever. So if we don't pursue technology as fast as we can uh, to keep up with it and, you know, and, and invent the, uh, the bot that goes out to, to kill the other bots or, or at least moderate, I, I prefer to use peaceful terms, uh, we have to, we have to pursue it. The good people have to pursue technology as fast as they can, or we will be overtaken by the by the bad people who pursue technology. I love Simple it. Was that? Way to put Thank it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Warren. I really appreciate Jeremy's it. Jeremy's back. I'm getting the boot. Yeah. <laughs> well, really appreciate it. I know you uh, uh, partook in uh, yesterday's part of the conference on the panels as well. So thank you for your participation. Love hearing from you, and uh, glad you're a part of the Genius Network. Officially. Great. Good. Thank you. Cool. Thanks. Okay, Christina, let's uh, tell everybody what's up next. We have uh, two left of the day. So for those of you who have been with us the entire time, wow, congrats. Um, there's a few attendees here, but we are streaming everywhere. Uh, I think we had well over 2,000 people viewing yesterday. Um, so yeah, a lot of eyeballs on this, as Christina always says. She uses <laughs> eyeballs, and now I guess- I like uh, metrics, I man. Now. Um, <laughs> But really excited to have Chris Wise here. Uh, Christina, I know you and Chris are pretty close, so I'm going to go ahead and let you do the intro. I probably can't even do it justice. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so we are going to change things up a little bit. Uh, Chris Wise is a, a mentor of mine. Uh, I've learned so much from him, um, but also uh, he's been through a lot and has a really interesting take on 
everything. So I'd like to introduce uh, the Genius Network to Chris Wise with Generate Better Results by Raising Your LQ. And he's here to tell you what LQ is and why you can generate better results by uh, living by those principles. Mr. Chris Wise. Well, hey, it's, uh, it is great to be here. Um, yeah, today we're going to be in Christina. Thank you. And Jeremy, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm going to be talking about how love and raising your LQ or love quotient can actually enable you to generate better results. So if you're somebody that's looking to create better results and you want to do it in a way that actually feels good, then you're going to want to pay attention. So um, let's jump into it. So I'll share with you a little bit about my background. I've been an entrepreneur for 30 years. I've sold two of my own businesses. I've coached and consulted with hundreds of CEOs and organizations around the world. And I discovered LQ and the power of love when I spent 19 months in federal prison. And if you're interested in hearing the full story, because there's quite an interesting story behind that, uh, you can uh, go on to lovequotient.org. Uh, and also, if you want to learn more about LQ, as I'm, after I talk about today, uh, that full story is on uh, the lovequotient.org. You know, I like, I like learning from people who, um, I get inspired by people who have been successful and um, have a lot of wealth. And, and Jack Ma is the billionaire founder of Alibaba. And this is what Jack Ma says. He goes, if a person wants to be successful, you should have a high EQ. If you don't want to lose quickly, you should have a high IQ. But if you want to be respected, you should have a high LQ. So what is LQ? LQ is your ability to be kind and loving towards yourself and others. So let's talk about how LQ came about in this new intelligence paradigms. Uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with IQ, mental intelligence, uh, EQ, Emotional intelligence that came out in 1990, or at least the coin uh, em, uh, emotional intelligence was coined in 1990 and became popular in 1995 with Daniel Goldman's book uh, on emotional intelligence. And LQ has really just become popular and started to get uh, known here in the last couple of years. And so let's take a look at what the difference is between EQ and LQ, because if you're familiar with EQ, it's helpful to understand the distinctions between EQ and LQ. So one, EQ is a function of the mind and body being both physical and intellectual. LQ is a function of the heart. EQ allows you to recognize your emotions. LQ allows you to be with your emotions. EQ teaches you self-management so that you can, you know, in essence, be in control of your emotions. LQ allows you to feel, release, and surrender into your emotions. LQ may encourage us to mask or hide our feelings. EQ brings about internal love and safety in our bodies because when we feel safe in our bodies, we're able to deal with negative emotions as they come up and move more quickly through them as opposed to avoiding them or escaping them or state changing out of them using positive love techniques. Here's another quote from Jack, that access to open mind is vulnerability. Vulnerability is accessed through an open heart and open heart is accessed, is accessed through raising your LQ. You know, this was a, a study that came out recently uh, in Science News where they imaged the heart and they found that through how the, the, uh, the uh, not the neurons, but the, the makeup of the heart, there was actually a little brain within the heart. You know, I also, there's also studies and I didn't include in the slide, but I just, I don't know if you've heard them where people had heart transplanted into other people and then they had like similar taste or similar memories some very interesting things that have already been proven in science around the makeup of the heart. So let's get practical, right? So a lot of times people are like, what does love have to do 
with business? What does love have to do with making money? Well, one, just on a very fundamental level, we're human beings uh, and we need love. If you're not, if you're a baby, you don't have love, you die. Physical touch is a form of love. Um, and I also think one of the reasons I love this community, Coin Genius, is because blockchain and crypto, I think, is actually inherently a reflection of a greater amount of love that is emerging in our society uh, through decentralization, through greater freedom, through um, uh, better value creation. Those are principles of love. Love and consciousness um, expand. And I see that blockchain and crypto are expansions of our consciousness as human beings to create infrastructures that will allow for more effective commerce, business, and value creation and transaction, which is the very nature of love. So I think just inherently love is very fundamental to why we're all here. But let's actually get practical to how can love help us on a daily basis in raising your LQ. One of those ways is that it can help you improve your inner dialogue and overcoming negative inner dialogue. Did you know that, and this was a study that was done in 2019 around uh, uh, the imposter syndrome, 82% uh, of entrepreneurs, both men and women, struggle with imposter syndrome on a regular or daily basis. So let's break that down. There's actually four Ps of imposter syndrome. The first one is perfectionism. Perfectionism, beating yourself up for not finishing things fast enough, not being where you want to be, not being good enough, some things of perfectionism. Uh, the other P is procrastination. Uh, a worrying 70% of entrepreneurs in this research admitted that this is their go-to stress response when imposter syndrome strikes. I think procrastination is perhaps the biggest trasher of brilliant business ideas. There's two other Ps. One is paralysis. 53% of entrepreneurs, entrepreneur respondents in the research said that they regularly freeze on a project if it's triggering imposter syndrome. They avoid it completely until just before the deadline when the adrenaline of the last minute rush pushes them through their fears, but pushing on through those fears affects our performance and can actually make things worse. The other P is people pleasing. This is 50, actually, 57% said they lacked clear boundaries with clients. 68% said they discounted their prices without being asked, which actually is a makeup of not charging what you're worth. You know, the four, the four Ps make it hard for your business to succeed. No matter how magnificent your marketing plan might be, because they get in the way of you taking great, big, scary, inspired actions that create breakthroughs instead of leaving you stuck with the overwhelming, with, with the overwhelm that triggers burnout. Raising your LQ can also improve your relationship with data and metrics. I know there's a lot of investors on this call, uh, people who are regular trading crypto, or maybe perhaps even in the stock market. Overcoming, so fear and anxiety can come up, especially when things aren't going the way that you want them to be. So when raising your LQ or, or loving yourself more deeply uh, helps you overcome the fear and anxiety that comes when things are not going the way you want them to by helping you to be in reality with your business or investments. And here's what I mean by being in reality with. Seeing and engaging and not turning away. And this is enabled because there's internal safety and courage to actually feel through these emotions that are coming up that love actually enables. So, uh, and just to give you guys a, a direction where we're headed with all this, uh, I'm giving you an overview of the territory and the different areas that raising your LQ and love can help with. And then at the end, I'm gonna give you guys an actual experience of this through one of the most powerful uh, uh, LQ practices uh, that I've ever discovered. It's something that I do on a daily basis. Another thing that raising your LQ helps solve is prioritizing your physical well-being. Uh, the um, you know just being in front of a uh, 
a computer screen for long hours, uh, the sitting that comes up from not prioritizing your physical self-care and bodily needs, not taking time to eat, drink enough water, stretch, stand, get up for a long walk. When you actually love yourself more, you actually begin to make these a priority. Uh, at all of this, you'll as we're, as we're talking through this, you'll see that you may know a lot of these things, but having access to them can be challenging. And so when you love yourself more, you actually are like, oh, I, now I'm gonna do that. It's, it's really powerful. Uh, here's a stat um, as part of improving your physical well-being. Uh, people who work three or more hours longer than a normal seven hour day have a 60% higher risk of heart-related problems such as death due to heart disease, non-fatal heart attacks, and angina. This was a study that was done in 2010. Raising your LQ helps you improve your mental well-being. Uh, the, this is related to the mental exhaustion and stress that comes from applying your intellect for long periods of time without breaks and from pushing yourself to keep going. Uh, in essence, workaholism. Raising your LQ, uh, LQ helps you with your mental, improves your mental well-being. Uh, there's a statistic uh, that also came from this 2009 study that employees working nine to 12 hour shifts compared with a traditional eight hour shift um, show deterioration in cognitive performance, reasoning, and alertness. When we look at all of these, all of these add up um, to challenges to be effective at taking action and making decisions through raising your LQ and learning how to love yourself. Uh, it increases your clarity in decision-making, uh, your, the inability and ineffectiveness or slowness to take action, which could be caused by all of the above reasons. So that's the, the, the challenge of this. Jack Ma says, if you have a different mindset, you will have a different outcome. So an interesting, what I, one of the things I like that, um, this approach is different than perhaps, I mean, there's a million different things out there about how to make better decisions, how to be more effective at taking actions, how to create organizations that are effective at action, uh, decision-making and taking actions. And generally speaking, most of the books and the thoughts to the workshops or whatever you might do is really it's centered in the mind and a, in a very linear process, step-by-step -step A to B. Um, and what I'm gonna suggest to you is to actually, um, to think about uh, love and the, that it actually creates a, a better environment for your ability to take action. So love impacts the environment of your decisions and actions. And I'm gonna give you two examples that I think that you may be familiar with that help you kind of see the impact that love can actually have on your decisions and actions. So one feng shui, have you ever, been in an environment that's been feng shui versus one that's not, you feel different, right? And is it because that chair is positioned this way or that thing is there? It's like, what is it? Why? Why? But you just feel different in, a, in an environment and impacts how you feel. Another, I think a great example is being in nature, right? When you're in nature, at least I do, I feel different. I feel more at peace. I feel more grounded. Right? Well, is it because of that rock is there or that water there? Is it the tree plus the rock plus the water? It's no, it's the environment. It's the totality of the environment. And that's really what I want, how I want you to see what we're talking about here. How love, it's not like one thing uh, that, that shifts it. It's the environment that love creates, the consistency of loving yourself that actually changes the, your environment that actually enables you to take more effective actions and decisions. I like this quote. Uh, by Jack Ma that says, raising our LQ gives us access to a whole new paradigm rooted in love where things that may seemingly be at odds with our own objectives can actually help us grow and evolve. So what is your environment for decision and actions? Uh, love impacts the environment of your decisions and actions. By default, most people are operating in an environment of fear and unresolved subconscious pain for their decisions and actions. And so they got to create a powerful mindset. They got to go to the next, uh, hey, we need to do mindset work. Oh man, like I, we're going to talk about that in a moment, but 
lot of people's way that they try to do things is through their mind. This is not about the mind. This is beyond the mind. Raising your LQ creates a healthy and inspiring environment for your decisions and actions. And I think this is a great analogy for what I think a lot of the, look, again, you got to have a powerful mindset, no doubt. But this is like the evolution, just like how uh, uh, crypto is the evolution of currency. LQ is the evolution of how we make decisions and actions. And are you, you know, so if you're just in a, trying to improve your mindset, that's like trying to pave over a swamp, right? If you ever wonder like, man, I keep working on this. I keep trying to have this powerful mindset, but this thing keeps happening. I'm sure every one of you on this call could have something like that in your life that it keeps coming up, right? Well, there's stuff underneath it. There's, there's stuff that's unresolved underneath it and just keep trying to pave a mindset doesn't create it. And so then that's problems can happen. And so we're actually creating a better environment so that when we do have a powerful mindset, we're actually creating it from a solid foundation. So I'm now I'm gonna give you the principles for what this environment looks like, and then we're gonna put it into action. So building the environment for powerful action and decisions through raising your love quotient. The first one, the first principle, is that in order to love others, it is essential to love yourself first. You cannot give effectively, or at least in a healthy way, to others what you have not given to yourself. I think, uh, you know, there's in one uh, LQ type, there are people that will that they, they're so committed to loving others or serving others or helping others, but they don't take care of themselves first. And so I don't see that as a healthy way. You wanna start with loving yourself first, that your cup is full first, and then give from others from that place. Loving yourself is not a selfish act. Rather, it shows self-care. Loving all the parts of you, especially the dark parts, is critical. And that's the parts of shame. That's the parts, the dirty parts. That's the part that you don't want other people to know. That's the time you got arrested for whatever and you, whatever. That's the post that somebody did about you because they got pissed off online and you try to push it down with SEO. Like if there's stuff that is there underneath that you have shame about, those are parts of yourself that need more love. Loving yourself allows you to feel safe in your own body. Raising your LQ allows you to be fully present with and experience your emotions. The safer you feel in your body, the safer you feel to be with difficult emotions such as fear and sadness. Here's why so much of that personal development stuff, the mindset stuff, the state change is so people like it so much because it's not, it doesn't feel, when you don't feel safe in your body, it's hard to be with fear and sadness and loneliness and boredom. It's like, no, these emotions are getting in the way from me going out and to accomplish, from me getting this done, from me closing the next deal, from me effectively making this trade. And so I got to push it down, shift my mindset and keep moving on. Well, that leads to burnout. That leads to heart attacks. It leads to all the stuff that we had talked about before. You're paving over a swamp. EQ allows you to recognize your emotions. You got to be able to recognize them. LQ allows you to actually be with your emotions. And when you're able to be with your emotions, you'd be like, ah, oh, fuck, I'm feeling fear. Like this doesn't feel good. I don't like it. I'm feeling it. Okay. Now I'm taking action. The heart of LQ is your relationship with your basic self, also known as your inner child. Now these are psychological terms, like terms from psychology. And it, it, I have found it helpful to use these terms in recognizing these different parts of self um, so that I really know what part of myself I'm loving. Because a lot of times when I talk about raising your LQ and loving yourself more, people are like, oh, I already love myself, right? If that's your response when I talk about loving yourself more, that's not the part of self I'm talking about. That part of yourself is your ego. Most people's ego don't need more love, right? Most people, like, they're like, I feel good about myself. I like myself. When I look in the mirror, that's why I like, no, no, no. That's not the part of self that we're talking about here. There's a part of ourselves that's underneath 
all of that is our inner child. And all of you have an inner child. And it's that the innocence within. It's the part of ourselves that we may have lost touch with as we were growing up. It's the part of ourselves that had wounding and pain from our parents or lack thereof, from you know, not being successful with girls in high school and getting turned down and uh, whatever. That was my, that was for me. Uh, we all have stuff from our past that are, that we just have wounding around and that wounding can actually be healed. And so I want to give you guys an experience of that right now. I'm going to stop my screen sharing. Button. be right here with you guys. And uh, I welcome, if anybody is listening and has the ability to turn on your video, if you want to turn on your video, it makes me feel like there's people here with me. Um, and I also welcome your guys' comments and, and thoughts as we go through this. And so the, the first really key in this is being able to get in touch with this part of ourselves. Um, and that can be hard, right? Getting access to this inner child. So if, if you're not able to do it, uh, first off, if you're like, this is crazy, that's okay, right? You don't have to get it. Uh, if you're interested in perhaps exploring something new that you may never have, come on this journey with me. Um, as we go through this, if you're not able to connect with this part of yourself, uh, that's okay, it takes time. Um, if you've had distinctions in the past, or you've done some personal growth or development, or if you've done some inner child work and you already understand this or done this, awesome, then you will be able to do this more easily. So wherever you're at, it's, it's perfectly okay. One of the ways in actually getting in touch with this part of ourselves is to, if you were to imagine holding yourself as a little baby, and you see yourself there in your arms, and you're looking down, just imagine that. And you may feel, you may feel something emerge in this area, right? When I when typically this heart related work or the inner child work is typically felt in this part of the body. Another way to do it, and this is what I did. I did a, started doing inner child work in my mid twenties. Uh, I got a picture of myself as a, that's me as a five-year-old boy got a picture like that did this workshop. And you're like, get a picture of yourself as a kid to help connect with that part of myself. And so I did, and I keep this on my desk, right? So I, get, I keep my little boy in front of me. Um, you know, what we're doing here actually is we're creating a relationship with our inner child. Just like if you have kids, you create a relationship with your kids. If you don't have kids, you create relationships with people. Um, this is something, it's not a one-time thing. It's not a quick fix. Like you deserve more love, not less. You deserve more love, not less. And this is a way to give it to yourself in a healthy way that actually begins to open up so many doors and heal things inside of you. And so it's a relationship. It's a relationship that gets developed over time. It gets stronger and stronger. And eventually you can get to the place where like, oh, I'm so connected with this part of me, right? So we're at the, we're at the, the, the we're just opening the door here. So I just guys all I wanna just take a moment. <clears throat> if you wanna put your hand on your heart, that might help. You can close your eyes. I think closing your eyes will help. Uh, I may have my eyes open just so I can see here. I may not, but I'd reckon, encourage you to close your eyes, hand on heart, and just really feel in to you. And if you want to imagine holding yourself as a little baby, Imagine yourself at uh, you know, five to 10 years old. Let's take, let's take a couple deep breaths together just to kind of center in. We've been all day in front of a computer. Let's breathe in. Ah. And I'm going to invite you to repeat after me. And we're going to, I'm going to love on my inner child. 
and you can love on your inner child. And I, rec I encourage you to say it out loud if you'd like, or you can say it silently if you want. You can just repeat after me, I love you. I love you. And what we're doing right now, we're just, this is not affirmations. We're actually telling our inner child that we love them, just like you would your own child. I love you. I love you so much. I love you. And then here's a question that you can ask yourself. What do you need from me right now? And whether you got an answer on that or you didn't, it's okay. Ultimately, what our inner child wants is just our own loving attention. So the very fact that you took some time to connect with that aspect of self, to give it some love, that's really all we want. So I don't know how tight we are with time today, um, but um, let me I'll give you a few things and then we can have questions or I'm not sure if there's yep, other you comments. Have, uh, three minutes left and then uh, we have the next Okay, question. so uh, I will give you guys a, um, if you wanna learn more about LQ and raising your LQ, by the way, what we just did here, I encourage you to do it every day. It's just part of exercising or meditation or whatever you do, you can build it in. You can do it anytime, anywhere. Give yourself my love yous. If you wanna learn more, you can go to the lovequotient.org or if you just Google LQ, uh, you'll, it'll, it'll come up in Google, Google results. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, okay. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. You know, it's cool. So, you know, I, I try to take a line out of your book in terms of just getting in touch with your emotions. And like you say, right, this applies to a lot of different things, whether it's business or trading. Uh, you know, Kyle Rea hit on this a little bit earlier, which is, you know, being in touch with your emotions helps you to almost take the emotion out of things like trading, right? Because uh, in my worst trades that I've ever made in crypto, it's because my emotions got the best of me. Right. So these exercises are helpful to be able to help control to an extent your emotions. Um, you know, everybody's different. Some people wear their heart on their sleeves. Some people, uh, you know, are a little bit more reserved and hold it back, put it into a little box and, you know, shelve it for a little while. I'm not that person. Um, so, you know, sometimes just, you know, in crypto, there's so much volatility in the space that it's very easy that even if you have a plan going into it to really uh, just, abandon that plan because you see something on a chart just shooting up over, you know, the course of a minute and it just gets you to second guess uh, your original decision. And that's the hardest thing as a trader. Um, and that's why we try to automate as much as we can here at Coin Genius, and why I have uh, an army of people in our team um, that are much smarter than I am to help uh, navigate those rough waters. And this is definitely helpful as well from an emotional and psychological standpoint. So thank you so much. Really important stuff and really appreciate you joining us today. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Chris. Mr. Jeremy Bourne, we have yes. Brittany Kaiser here to wrap up the day. Yes, to wrap we up sure do. Look at this two-day conference. Look at this uh, Collective Intelligence Summit that uh, that we just put together. I yep. got to say, uh, this has been pretty pretty epic. It's been great. And the fact that we got Brittany again, uh, she joined us yesterday um, and that was great. We were talking about um, a lot of different things yesterday in state-backed digital currencies. Um, and it was just great to hear her perspective. She's been around for quite a while, uh, even a part of Cambridge Analytica. Um, so, I mean, she is a wealth of knowledge um, and own your data and all the things she's doing there is great, especially around the educational side of things. Um, so if we can get Brittany in here and uh, share some video, that would be great. I'm certainly a big fan of everything that she does and, and her network. Um, got to speak with uh, uh, with Ben, that was amazing. Um, yeah, own your data is kind of a big deal these days. Uh, it's really something that should be discussed. I'm glad that we have she is. You know, 
the expert here to uh, tell us all about it. So, Brittany, I don't know if you heard uh, the, the brief intro, but singing your praises as of yesterday. Um, thank you again for joining that panel. That was great. Uh, all the things you're doing are really great, especially around the education side of things, owning your data and empowering people with knowledge so they really understand how to take their not only financial future um, into their own control, but also take control of your data, right? It's a big deal and it's all about education. So really happy to hear you on day two. You're closing it out for the Collective Intelligence Summit. Now, unfortunately, you're so good. We're going to invite you back to everyone. So hopefully we get a resounding <laughs> yes. Um, so with that said, we're going to pass it over to you and really looking forward to what you have to say. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you guys so much for, for having me back again. It's a pleasure to be here. I heard that you guys had a really great day with a lot of beautiful speakers, a lot of my favorite people that uh, all of you guys got to hear from. So it, it's a pleasure to, to be able to close out today for you guys. <laughs> um, so uh, really, really glad to be here. Um, as you guys may know, my name is Brittany Kaiser. I am the founder of the Own Your Data campaign and the Own Your Data uh, Foundation. And I'm here to talk to you guys a little bit more about uh, some of the work that I have been doing specifically in data ownership with some really incredible people, uh, not just from the blockchain industry, but also from data protection and privacy. Uh, and uh, I, I really, it's so nice to be able to talk about this at a blockchain conference because it's really blockchain technology and the people in the industry that first inspired me to look at the data industry in a totally different way. I mean, what 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 you guys probably know is that um, you know I, I've been yeah, at the intersection of technology and politics for a very long time. I got my my start in tech. Uh, by joining the Obama campaign uh, headquarters in 2007 and was part of the team that helped invent uh, social media strategy. And I spent about a decade after that uh, helping organizations around the world learn how you can use data in order to produce sci scientifically valid communications results. How can you achieve your goals? And I was mostly working with human rights organizations and progressive politicians environmental groups, human rights groups. Um, so how do you achieve your goals using data? And from the very beginning, it was, uh, you know, the knowledge that the more you can find out about somebody, the better you can communicate with them. So that sounds like a, uh, a concept that at first is inherently good. You know, you can, you can talk to people in a way that they engage with, the way that they understand. But once I spent uh, quite a few years in the data science industry, so really the buying and selling and trading of personal data in order to build very accurate predictions about what people are most interested in, what they care about, uh, that's really when I started to realize that you know the data industry has been built in a way that is well, what I like to call kleptocratic. Uh, technologies over the past many decades have been built in order to take as much of our personal information from us without us fully understanding what that means. We don't really understand what's being taken, where it's going, by whom, who's holding it, what are they gonna use it for? And what we've seen over the past many years is that it can fall into the hands of anybody. Anyone around the world can get access to your personal data, your most personal information uh, without you really being aware of it. And then you can't protect yourself or other people around you from how that, that data could be used either to your benefit or, or used against you, especially what we saw uh, in the 2016, both Brexit and, and, and Trump elections, the way that data was used uh, was to bring out uh, kind of the worst parts of humanity to drive our societies apart. So uh, while I was still working at Cambridge Analytica, I got very involved in the blockchain industry. And I started to see ethical technologists that yes, they had access to all of the same data sets as big advertisers always had, but the way that they were going about building their technology was to create systems of transparency, to create systems of empowerment, uh, building technologies that actually allowed us to have ownership over our most personal and valuable information. 
And it was in 2017 when I really got involved in the blockchain industry that data was first valued as uh, the most valuable asset on planet Earth. In 2017, The Economist told us all that data had surpassed oil and gas. So somehow we are producers of the world's most valuable asset, but legally around the world at that time, we didn't have any rights to our data anywhere. We had no rights of producing the world's most valuable asset, an asset class made up of just our personal information, but it has driven the building of most technologies around the world and every organization, whether public or private, is using data to make decisions, or at least they should be um, if they know what's good for them. Data drives internal decision-making, external communication, strategy building, and is the, the back end of really what drives everything that we do these days, especially in a time of coronavirus where we are now producing exponentially more data than we ever have before because we're leading completely virtual lives. So that means we're producing so much more of the world's most valuable asset. And over the past few years has been the first time where countries around the world are starting to think about how do we legislate and regulate data in a more ethical way? Because what we've seen is that if you give uh, some technology executives free reign to choose how their technologies affect humanity. They don't make the ethical and moral choice by themselves, uh, which is very unfortunate. So uh, we, we've now had to do quite a lot of work on legislating and regulating how our personal information should be used. And what, what I believe and what everyone that I've ever spoken to in the blockchain industry believes is that we should have full ownership over that information. We should own our data. And what, what I really want to describe to you guys uh, today is a little bit more about what that means and what are the fundamental components of data ownership and, and data rights so that you can fully grasp why uh, transparent technologies, uh, new forms of encryption, smart contracting, blockchains, and just more ethical ways of data management make sense and are going to be so important for our future. So I, I think the first concept that we should really talk about is what, what ownership means. You know, you've probably heard or you know that in, in a human rights legal framework, we all have the rights to privacy. We have the right to keep certain information to ourselves as a human right, as a value. But in terms of what are we keeping private, the information about us, we do not have uh, rights to most of that information. So how do we actually practically secure our privacy if perhaps millions of companies around the world own our personal information and we don't have the right to see what they have, to ask them to delete it, to ask them to not use it for certain purposes. Uh, what, what does that actually mean? So the most fundamental concept of data ownership is that you have full control over your data. You own it just like any other property. In fact, uh, in the state of Wyoming right now, you own your data as, uh, you own your digital assets as your intangible personal property. And what that means is that just like your house or your car, you have the rights to your personal information and who that's used by, where that goes. And it, it really the, the legal concept of that, the, the easiest way to really land the plane for everyone is for me to say that I, I'm a big fan of the Airbnb model uh, as, as a model that we could use for the future of data ownership. So if someone wants access to my data, just like they ask me on Airbnb for access to my house, they would tell me who they are, what they want to use it for, how long they're going to be there, <laughs> and we're going to agree on a price and I'll get paid before I hand away the keys. So that is a data ownership model where I am actually leasing my property to someone for a period of time and I still retain full control over that. And if I've pre-agreed to certain terms and conditions, and that is what is going to be uh, followed. It, you know, the, the most important part of 
distributed ledger technology in this conversation is smart contracting, um, which as many of you probably know is a digital contract. So the terms and conditions that you set forth in Airbnb could be encoded into a smart contract, meaning that if someone is accessing your data through a platform like that, you would say, for instance, I agree for my data to be used for the next 12 months. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, have my data sold to advertisers that want to sell me a new car or a new brand of toothpaste, but I don't want my data to go to any politicians, political organizations, law enforcement, for instance, and that should be your fundamental right. So when you hand away uh, the temporary cryptographic access to your personal data, those those keys will just allow access to your data for that period of time and for those purposes and use cases that, that you agreed to. So the next fundamental concept that is so important, important is that transparency and your opt-in. So transparency is knowing fully exactly what is being collected about you uh, are you collecting my personally identifiable information, my first name, my last name, my, my physical address, my social security number? Do you need that type of information? Are you collecting my location data, data from other apps? Are you getting access to my photos, videos, access to my microphone and my camera? Because you know what? Probably most of the apps on your phone right now where you've never read the terms and conditions, you have given people access to all of that data. I mean, do me a favor. And after you listen to this talk, it doesn't have to be tonight, it's Friday night, but go and uh, plug, uh, go and actually open up one of the apps on your phone and read the terms and conditions. You've probably never done it, <laughs> but go and do it and see what you have actually agreed to you will find that you will be shocked if you fully understand everything that they've even asked you for. And that's the big problem. Uh, terms and conditions are usually 46 pages long and they're written by very expensive lawyers in legalese to make you uh, not understand what you are giving away. And most people just click them very quickly and then you have entered into a digital contract where you've actually agreed to something very specific and if you look all the way through, you're almost giving away your firstborn to some of these people. I mean, really access to everything. And you don't know who these people are, where the developers are located, what their intentions are, or what data contracts they have with other companies. Sometimes hundreds or thousands of companies are going to get access to this data too, not just for you to be able to, to use the app. So once you understand transparently what is being asked of you, that's when you can start um, looking at uh, opt-in infrastructure. So what are you going to agree to? How complex can that get? I think that you guys um, probably noticed that since the passing of GDPR and the California Consumer Privacy Act, CCPA, which went into enactment January 1st, uh, the only real comprehensive privacy legislation in the United States in the state of California, that sometimes now when you go to websites, uh, you will, instead of just see a big annoying box that says, we're going to collect your cookies and your only choice is really to say, okay. Now you have another option, which is let me see my settings or let me look at my options. And that will start to tell you more in detail what they're going to take from you and who they're going to share it with. If you scroll all the way down and actually open up all of the menus, you'll sometimes see hundreds or thousands of companies that they're planning on sharing your data with. And now you have the option to opt out of that mm -hmm. and to say, yes, I still want to access this website. And whether or not you allow cookies, you are, uh, if you do decide to allow them, you can decide perhaps that you don't want your data to be shared onwards with other companies besides the site that you're actually trying to visit. And I think that's fundamentally so important to really not only understand fully what you're agreeing to, but have that, that option to, to opt in or opt out. So um, permission structures and traceability um, is really the, the next most important part uh, of these concepts. And um, I just noticed my, my battery is a little low on my computer. So just give me one quick second while I plug that in. My apologies. Should have done that before we started. <laughs> one moment, guys. And we are back in business. <laughs> so permission structures and traceability. 
So what are you going to give people access to? And do you have the right to track and trace where it's going? You know, this was the entire fundamental problem uh, that led to the Facebook Cambridge Analytica scandal. Uh, if you guys don't remember exactly how that happened, the original, I suppose, straw that broke the camel's back in terms of uh, the news media and the general public being really freaked out at what Facebook was doing and what Cambridge Analytica was doing with your data was when everybody found out that Facebook had had a developer program um, where developers from around the world could pay Facebook for uh, the ability to access everybody's data through something called the Friends API. And in order to get people to consent to giving you their data, uh, you, they had to take a quiz or take um, uh, uh, join an, a an application or a game, something like, uh, you know, Farmville or Candy Crush. And as soon as you opted in and agreed for your data to be taken, the Friends API also took the data from everybody else in your Friends network. Your mom, your grandma, your friend next door, everybody in your Friends network. And so there, there's no legal structure <laughs> anywhere in the world that allows me to consent on behalf of another able-bodied adult. Nobody else, nobody else can give away my data. I have to consent um, on, on my own. So the Friends API fundamentally uh, was, was flawed in terms of its, uh, its compliance with uh, any data protection laws that really existed at that period of time. And therefore, over 40,000 companies had access to this API. And then those data sets were given to access to companies around the world, like Cambridge Analytica, where that data was used uh, specifically in elections. And so when everyone found out that their data had been taken without their knowledge and shared with anyone and everyone for whatever purposes they deemed fit, that's kind of when the news completely blew up. Um, and that is why it's so important to have permission structures and traceability in the back end of technology. Where are you gonna allow your data to go? And who is it going to go to? And can I for sure confirm that that data has definitely been transferred to that individual? Can I confirm that they have or have not transferred it somewhere else? I mean, right now in order to even tell that a company or organization is data protection compliant, you really have to do a forensic analysis of someone's database because you don't know where data has gone, what is still there, what has been deleted, what has not, and it, that's what is very exciting about you know public ledgers to me, immutable ledgers. So if there has been a transaction of digital assets, you can see that, that is permanent. Nobody can come in and delete that. So I know if a digital asset transfer has taken place and I can tell uh, where else it has gone as well. So this is a fundamental concept that is going to help us actually secure our data rights, what, where we have agreed for our data to go and what it's going to be used for, we can confirm that that has happened or not happened. And that's, that's really important. Now, I, I would say the most exciting part of data ownership and data rights to me is that I really believe that data uh, can and will be the great equalizer in society and in the world. You know, we all are producers of the world's most valuable asset, yet there are some people around the world that wake up in the morning and don't have uh, a store of value that they can exchange for food to feed their families, right? They don't have enough money access to that value that they are creating for companies and governments around the world who are monetizing that data and they don't have uh, enough money to feed themselves. Uh, so a lot of people, when I talk about the monetization of your personal data, have, have a lot of questions about that and, and, I, and I really want to address that. You know, when, when I say you have the rights to monetize your own data, it means you own it. So just like your house on Airbnb, you have the right to a, uh, at least at minimum, a dividend off of the monetizing that is happening with your personal information. So uh, say for instance, that's my, my favorite topic, let's talk about Facebook again. <laughs> um, so for instance, if I am producing data within Facebook, uh, I perhaps 
might own 20 or 30% of the value of that data and have rights to what I've produced in the platform because it's my information. But because it is Mark Zuckerberg's platform and Facebook puts in the time and money to upkeep this platform and produce those data sets while I'm using Facebook, they would uh, retain the other parts of the monetary value of that. So every time an advertiser pays Facebook, if I own 30%, and Mark owns 70%, then yes, he still makes plenty of money off of my data. And I get a dividend that recognizes that that is my data, that I have rights to it. And then I am able to use that value to empower myself. Uh, you know, when people ask me about what, uh, what is the value of our data, you know, why should we care about our data rights if our our, our personal data is only worth, you know, cents on the dollar. You know, how many cents do we need to collect before this even makes sense uh, to go through this whole process? Well, you know, Mark Zuckerberg likes to lie to us and tell us that our data is only worth $17 a quarter. So that, that sounds uninteresting. Well, I mean, first of all, that's not true, Mark. Our data is worth an exponential amount. It just depends where we decide to become data inputs to. Where is that data being monetized? How is it being monetized? But let's say for instance, he's right. Our data that we produce in Facebook is worth $17 a quarter. Well, you know, there's over 2 billion people around the world that are living on less than $2 a day. So $17 will completely change the lives of billions of people around the world just off of the data that they produce in Facebook, let alone the data that is plugged in and an input and produced in all these other platforms and ways around the world. You know, I, I, I talk about this so often and I spend all of my time trying to secure our data rights because of this possibility. You know, if, if we're only earning um, a couple dollars a week out of the data we make in Facebook, what if we become an input into our city for smart cities purposes. So I'm creating data in my car, I'm creating data with how I use public transportation, and I'm making sure that there is less traffic. I'm making sure that there are no more car accidents. I decide to share my location data with law enforcement so that they can help prevent the, ma the next mass shooting from ever happening or prevent terrorism or violence. I could decide to share my medical data with medical researchers around the world so that they can cure diabetes and cancer and prevent coronavirus uh, from continuing to spread and save lives all around the world. You know, uh, I, I, I have a, a friend who is specifically working on the monetization of healthcare data. And I was recently told that in one diabetes study, because uh, most, most data that healthcare researchers have access to are just the people who go to healthcare trials. These are usually 18 to 35 year old young white males in college who are doing it for, for extra beer money, really. And those data sets mean that the way that we cure diseases um, and the way that we invent medicines is based off of a data set that is not applicable to most of the population. So women, minorities, medicines just don't work as well on us. It's so hard to get a diverse group of people to actually go to medical trials and complete the process. So this group of diabetes researchers said, if we can get somebody that qualifies for our study to come in for six to eight weeks and produce medical data in our facility, that's actually worth $28,000 to us. Yeah, $28,000, exactly. So when Mark says your data is only worth $17 a quarter, he's you know not talking about the bigger picture. And unfortunately, too many people just hear the words coming out of his mouth and think, hey, um, I, this whole fight, the whole data rights movement is, you know, it's, it's gonna be too hard. It's not worth that $17 every few months, but think about it in the more exponential way and what that can look like. Um, there's a lot of interesting blockchain projects that are specifically helping us to secure our digital identity. So we can say, this is us, here's my data that I am producing, and we can become a data input into marketplaces where we can choose where we want to uh, start monetizing our data, what we feel comfortable with, and we can be earning money every single day in the way that um, 
Chris Hughes, the, the ethical co-founder of Facebook talks about and the way that Andrew Yang talks about, they're two of the world's biggest proponents um, of universal basic income and two of the only people who have uh, donated a lot of their own wealth in order to run UBI programs to see what it looks like if people are actually have access to money every single day. And that that is, that is something that works. They've proven so far in terms of productivity, quality of life. And I, I don't even like to call it universal basic income because it sounds like a handout. What, what, I, what I say when I'm talking about in terms of data rights and monetizing your own digital assets, that any, that's a universal earned income. Everybody has universal value for being a human being and being alive. And the amount of value that we produce every day in terms of data sets, in terms of the world's most valuable asset, uh, is so incredibly important and valuable that we are earning an income just for our time, our attention, our data. And that is the most exciting and world-changing concept in data rights. And that's why everyone should be fighting so hard for this. I mean, it, it, it's really just, it's so important to think about the revolution that this can bring about in equality and access to justice around the world. And so uh, I'll talk with you just for a second about uh, a few other things that, that I think are important in, in this debate. Um, now, uh, there, I, I, I guess I'm a big part of the privacy community, right? So it'll probably surprise you that I don't consider myself a privacy campaigner. Yes, I work to secure your right to privacy, but I'm actually not that interested in people keeping their data to themselves. That's everybody's own choice. If you want to keep your data private, you should have the rights and the technology and the education and tools in order to do that. But right now, right now we don't. Uh, so, the the types of work that uh, that are really going on are to say it, we would like you to secure your rights to privacy but really we would like to enable you to share as much of your data as you could possibly feel comfortable with so that we can solve a lot of the world's biggest problems i mean i'm not a privacy campaigner because i'm into radical transparency if if no one's noticed that but i i am really into artificial intelligence ai and data science i think will solve a lot of the world's biggest problems that, that I was just discussing. Uh, we, we really have an opportunity to change the future with our data and the algorithms that we put our data into to build a better life are why I want to encourage people to feel comfortable and secure in what it means to really own your data. You know, Once you have that transparency and consent mechanisms, and control and the technology in order to do it, then you can empower yourself, your family, your community with that value that you receive in return. Um, so I suppose uh, I'll, I'll quickly go over a few of the um, most basic concepts and some of the new, um, the new laws that are securing our data rights. And, and that really is, you know, kind of both in GDPR and CCPA, the right to knowing where your data is being held, the right to erase, to correct false data, the right to correct the record, um, uh, objection to your data being automatically processed by any organizations, uh, the right to notifications of a data breach, so you know if you need to protect yourself with fraud prevention insurance or change all of your passwords yet again, which hopefully you all do on a very regular basis. Uh, you have the right to full disclosure over what's been collected about you in the past and objection to certain parts of it being used. You get to say who it's provided to and you actually have legal recourse. So if you decide that your data has been damaged, then you can get that value back, um, you know, monetarily. Uh, and so I think one of the most important new uh, developments in data protection laws really coming out because of coronavirus. So uh, since we have um, all been trying as much as we can, whether we are, um, you know, quarantining ourselves at home or whether we're building technology for coronavirus contact tracing apps or working on immunity passports, uh, there's a lot of 
uh, developments in AI, data science, blockchain technology, digital identity, tracking and traceability that will hopefully be able to stop and stem the spread uh, of coronavirus. But what has happened is that the contact tracing apps were being built before any laws were passed about how that data could be used. So I helped write uh, one of the first bills in the world to manage uh, and regulate how this data is being used. It's Senate Bill number 8448 in, in the state of New York. And we were the first bill uh, to drop, which basically regulates how that data is collected, how it's held, how long it's stored, what it can be used for. And most importantly, with the rise of uh, mass protest movements around the world, and I completely support the right to peacefully assemble, but because in some places some of the uh, riots became violent, law enforcement started using contact tracing in order to track protesters. Now, we have seen in many places around the world, specifically if you guys can remember what happened in Hong Kong last year, that the way that some peaceful protesters are tracked actually, uh, actually gets in the way of them being able to exercise their, their human rights, their right to peacefully assemble. And so in our law, we banned the sharing of contact tracing data with law enforcement. And we also put anti-discrimination clauses in there to make sure that no, no one that is trying to fight for their rights uh, could have their rights uh, contravened and be targeted uh, by organizations that are, I suppose, supposed to be keeping the peace, but sometimes are actually creating the opposite. So I know that's all the, the time we have for today, but I'm so glad that I was able to be here with you guys. Thank you so much for listening to this. Thank you for your support. Uh, if you want to know more about uh, the work that we're doing at the Own Your Data Foundation, please go to ownyourdata.foundation and check us out. If you want to donate to our work, we would love that. Uh, you can even uh, get one of these cool Own Your Data necklaces. We even have ones that uh, hold a YubiKey. You can use them as two-factor authenticators uh, to support our work. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at ownyourdatanow. Uh, and uh, please watch The Great Hack on Netflix if you haven't had the opportunity to do that yet. And also uh, my book came out uh, last year. It's now out in 13 languages around the world. Uh, it's called Targeted, the Cambridge Analytica whistleblowers inside story of how big data, Trump and Facebook broke democracy. So it's not a light read for the beach, but I really hope that you guys all have the opportunity to pick it up sometime. Uh, thank you again for having me and enjoy your Friday night. Thank, Thank you so you much, Brittany. Brittany. Appreciate it. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, guys. The next one. Of your time. All right, everybody. Well, that's a wrap. That is the end of uh, day two of Collective Intelligence. We had so many incredible speakers today. Um, just so delighted to have you know Brittany close us out. What an incredible uh, discussion and topic that she's covering, and really empowering people with uh, understanding their rights. So I've made everybody. Uh, a panelist who's left who wants to share their screen. Uh, let's all get on if we want, uh, if you want to share, and we can all say goodbye to the world. Uh, we're streaming all over the place right now. I know we had over 2,000 people yesterday uh, from around the world listening in to all these incredible discussions. We have people like Emilio that are and Rhonda that are consistently here at our events that are you know up into the wee hours of the night at our networking parties as well. We couldn't do this without you guys and our supporters and the people that really are proponents of everything that Coin Genius is doing. We're trying to democratize data and we're trying to bring the tools necessary to help traders around the world to become smarter and more effective. Take the emotion out, like Chris Wise said, and control those emotions using people on the genius network that we've worked really hard over the last two and a half, three years in building this incredible network of people. And now I think all you guys see. Um, you know, the power of the network is, is really the secret sauce behind Coin Genius. We can't do it ourselves. There's incredibly smart people in this world, and we're just trying to connect all of us together in one place. Christina, any final thoughts? I'm just blown away by everything that we have seen in the last two days. Um, I guess my final thoughts are please come join us. Please come see what Coin Genius is doing at coingenius.ai. Uh, see our analytics uh, develop uh, in, uh, in coingenius.pro. 
join our Discord for real-time updates and you can ask questions to our team. Uh, also follow the new Telegram channel that has uh, trading uh, insights. Hi. Uh, that has uh, trading insights and, and whale alerts. Uh, we're doing some amazing things and so are many of the other folks that are in the space in the Genius Network. And I can't wait to share all of this with, with all of you. Uh, as always, if you guys want to get a hold of me, it's Christina at coingenius.ai. And uh, we look forward to hearing from everyone. Yeah, if anybody has any questions, reach out to info at coingenius.ai. Always happy to have a conversation. You can follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, wherever is most comfortable for you. We're having our next conference. Uh, we do this on a quarterly basis, right? Because we want to get access to the most relevant information possible so we can make more effective decisions. So the next one's at the end of September. That is going to be a big one. That's our crypto state of the union where we're bringing together the top companies in the space, the top exchanges to say why we deserve to be here in the top and what are we doing to collectively move this industry forward together. So that's going to be one that you don't want to miss. Thank you again to the Coin Genius team. I have the most incredible team in the entire world, bar none. Anybody can go head to head. You're not going to win. We have Thomas Barrett right here, our CFO. Um, we just have so much support and it's really you know, a testament to what we're trying to do here. It's needed. It's the connectivity, it's the data, and it's the trust. And if you look on our website, that's why we say we're the most trusted source of information in the crypto space because uh, nobody else was really doing it. So we wanted to be the first and hopefully you guys enjoyed. We'll see you at the next one. Thanks so much. Thanks everyone. Bye geniuses. Thank you guys. What a wonderful two days. Thank you everybody. Thank you.